Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Koku. Just wanted to jump on real quick before we begin the show. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, those of you who are here tonight. Uh, we should have a decent little show tonight, man. The pro-black perspective is in the chat saying peace, peace. Peace, peace to you, too. Uh, by the way, speaking of the pro-black perspective, make sure you guys uh, who follow the Bitter Medicine Podcast and uh, the ongoings of uh, KWAZ, radio uh the pro black perspective is now at 901 subscriptions on youtube make sure you guys go over if you haven't already subscribe to that channel let's get him to a thousand let's see what youtube has to say about that <clears throat> once he hits a, th- a thousand subs and qualifies for monetization uh tonight should be a good show as usual saturday night shoot the breeze we're going to be talking about uh RIP to the chairman. You guys know who that is. We're going to talk about the parents who were charged in the case of a boy who killed a, a few fellow students in school. We're going to talk about a plumber discovering money in Joel Osteen's church. We're going to talk about LeVar Ball. We're going to talk about uh, putting the cart before the horse, how uh, there's talk about building this nation in Africa, and we're not even discussing how we're funding it. Uh, We're going to talk about a black guy who's adopting white kids. We're going to talk about turkey thugs. Uh, We're going to talk about a fake college in Atlanta. We're going to discuss our thoughts on African, uh, on the African Union and its utility uh, for Africans. And we're going to lastly discuss um, a song that has crazy views uh, that's very uh, emasculating to black males. So those are the things that are coming up tonight. Uh, glad you could be here. We're going to start the show on the other side of the intro. I'll drop the link then for those of you who want to join the panel. Um, we'll do that when we return in just a minute. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people and strategies that uplift, empower and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Just want to remind you guys before we get the show rolling that this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. The other shows on the network you are invited to tune into. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni. Inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the Revolutionary Matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I, uh, well, you know who I am. I'm Koku, damn it. Uh, we're here doing the Shoot the Breeze. Uh, Saturday night, Shoot the Breeze. Glad for you guys who are here in the chat room. I see we have Daily Affirmations by Pauline. We got Joe Nell. We got Tito District saying peace to me in the chat. We got the Learning Curve. That's the Revolutionary Matron. And of course, earlier we had the Pro Black Perspective joining us. Let me drop the um, link. 
anyone who wants to join the panel um, should do so. Well, first, let me drop the first prompt. And uh, so the first prompt, it's an RIP to the chairman. And uh, let me drop the StreamYard link. So with the StreamYard link, just for those who are not sure, with the StreamYard link, um, <clears throat> you don't need any additional software. You click the link. Um, it's kind of browser-based type thing. You click the link, and you'll see where you can join the panel. And you join the panel. I'll, um, I'll let you in when I see you come up on my side when you enter the studio and that's it you don't need any additional software uh, that's kind of for me anyway that's kind of the draw for this it's all browser based i could be in china right now i could be in africa right now and i could be uh you know with minimal equipment right in fact i could actually run this show from my phone if i want to so you know that's the deal um you guys might notice and tell me if you do um the stream is being simulcasted to um, to Twitter. So if you're on my Twitter uh, account, you should be able to see the stream is there. And also, we're simulcasting, or we're supposed to be simulcasting, to KWAZ Radio's YouTube channel, which is a test tonight to make sure that this works so that in the new roman year in the roman new year um my plan is to uh cut down on the number of shows i do on this platform per week i mean it's still going to be the same number of shows a week but one night a week i'm going to do an exclusive show just for the kwaz radio youtube channel right you won't come here you'll go over there for one episode, one live stream per week. So you guys keep that in mind going forward. Let me know if you guys see the stream uh, going through the KWAZ Radio YouTube channel, as well as let me know if you see the stream <clears throat> on Twitter. Uh, let me welcome in Oni Tase from the Pro Black Perspective. Oni, what's going on? How are you doing? Yeah, I everything's good. good. I see it on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to see if the simulcast is working. Yeah, okay. uh, KWZ Radio as well. So. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Um, I see you crossed the 900 subscription sub sub subscribers threshold today. You got to do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to do it. We have to do it. We have to see. We have... See, the thing is, a lot of people will sit back and say, oh, YouTube ain't going to do it. Well, let's test it and see. Let's get there, and let's see what what's going to happen, you know? Exactly. YouTube is like, these N-words are not going to be able to do this. They're not going to pull it off. And right. Let's show them, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Let's welcome in the matron. <laughs> the matron is with us tonight. How are you doing, matron? I'm doing great. How are you gentlemen doing tonight? I'm doing good. Jumbo, Jumbo, I'm so glad to be here. And yes, indeed, we are going to defeat the algorithm. We're going to have some um, algorithm defeating strategies up here in the new Roman year. Ain't that right, y'all? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's um, that's coming. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys that, that preview to the change that I'm going to make at least personally, um, with my show in the upcoming year, two shows a week, Saturday night, shoot the breeze, a Tuesday night, um, show where I'm going to try to interview someone. And if not interview, I'll do a show that might probably not be a paper reading, but something that I put together. And then one night a week, I think it's going to be Thursday nights. So I'm going to do exclusive content for the KWAZ Radio uh, YouTube channel. We got to get those subs up on that channel. So if you guys haven't, if you guys out there haven't subscribed to that channel, make sure you do so that you can be notified when there's new content up there. Um, our first prompt tonight 
as you can see on the screen, R.I.P. Chairman, the real Black Messiah and the Judas who betrayed him. Let's share this screen with you guys. Let's share this. Um, it's weird. Hold on. I could be wrong here. I hate that. That's not it. Um... I'm going to share this video with you guys once I can find it. Um, once I can find it, I'll share this video with you guys. All right, there it is. So let's watch this video, and uh, then we'll have a discussion. And the politics is nothing but war without bloodshed, and war is nothing but politics with bloodshed. On November, on November 19th, 19th FBI, FBI agent Roy Mitchell, Mitchell drew a floor plan of Hampton's apartment based on information supplied by informant O'Neill. On December 4th, at 4.45 in the morning, 14 policemen, 9... Uh, there's an echo? Yeah, there's an echo. All right, let me, um, let me mute my mic then. There's always this issue here. Let me see if this works better. With war without bloodshed and war is nothing but politics with bloodshed. On November 19th, FBI agent Roy Mitchell drew a floor plan of Hampton's apartment based on information supplied by informant O'Neill. On December 4th, at 4.45 in the morning, 14 policemen, nine white and five black, raided the apartment. Deborah Johnson, eight months pregnant, was asleep in the back bedroom next to Fred Hampton. The first thing I remember after Fred and I had went to sleep was being awakened by somebody shaking Fred while we were laying in bed saying, Chairman, Chairman, wake up. The pigs are vamping. The pigs are vamping. Uh, this person that was in the room with me kept shouting out, we have a pregnant sister in here. Stop shooting. Eventually the shooting stopped and they said we could come out. I remember crossing over Fred and telling myself over and over, be real careful, don't stumble, they'll try to shoot you. Just be real calm, watch how you walk. Keep your hands up, don't reach for anything, don't even try to close your robe. When I was in the kitchen, I heard a voice, an unfamiliar voice say, he's barely alive or he'll barely make it. Then the shooting started back again. Then I heard the same unfamiliar voice say, he's good and dead now. And I, I knew in my mind, they were, I assumed they were talking about Fred. And I knew when I left out of there, I couldn't look towards the room. Party leaders Mark Clark and Fred Hampton were killed in the raid. Four of the seven surviving occupants of the apartment were wounded. All were charged with assault and attempted murder. When they locked me up at the police station, I kept begging them for a call to make one call. I called, I think, the office, the Black Panther office, and I spoke to Bobby Rush, and he told me that Fred was dead. Fred had been killed. And I remember... Uh walking out of the office and uh, and looking through a little clearing over on the, ne the next block, which was right in front of uh, the Monroe Street address and seeing a lot of <clears throat> police cars over there. And um, at that time, Barbara Rush came to the office. Uh, he had just come from over there, or maybe the coroner's office. In any case, we walked back over there and uh, we both were speechless. We just walked through the house and and saw where, what had taken place and where he died. And it was, it was shocking. And then I was, you know, I just began to realize that the information that I supplied leading up to that moment had facilitated that raid. I knew that indirectly uh, I had contributed and I felt it and I felt bad about it. And then I got mad, you know, I had, uh, And then I had to conceal those feelings, which made it worse. I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. I just had to continue to play the role. 
FBI headquarters authorized payment of a $300 bonus to informant William O'Neill for, quote, uniquely valuable services which he rendered over the past several months, unquote. Yeah, that guy at the end is the guy who set up, who gave them the floor plan and set up Fred Hampton. By the way, Fred Hampton was murdered on this day in 1969. So RIP to that young brother. He was only 21 years old, by the way. And the guy at the end there was a guy who set him up, <clears throat> uh, gave out the floor plans. And he's here talking about, well, in some way, I felt like I was responsible. I mean, come on. Only what says you to this uh to the whole concept of R.I.P. Chairman Fred. You have to unmute your mic. Oh, yeah. So I'm saying like 300 bucks. You yeah. Know? Uh, you know, like, like, you know, if, if he said like, like, I mean, there's like, you got to have, like, if you have a price and it's just 300 bucks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, uh from watching the movie, you know, I understand that he was uh like a career criminal and he was trying to avoid prison. Mm -hmm. uh, prison's no joke. So, you know, it's not like like I can't just say he did it for three hundred bucks. You know, obviously, you know obviously this white boy got a lot of leverage on us, right? But that in and of itself is really what's going on in america you know like mm -hmm. no matter how upstanding you are no matter how correct you are no matter how many people you surround yourself with who are upstanding and correct the reality is that because this white boy like like i think i i put it one way uh, a long time ago i said whoever controls the whoever controls the currency controls the commons right and the reality is that this white boy prints this money you know shout out to uh the major right but this white boy prints this money you know and if we all need this money the reality is that if he's printing what we need like if he could just go to the printer and supply us with our needs we will be bought you know yeah one brother i i, I remember a long time ago i had this like this dispute in my uh organization and this brother came through and like, i had to ask him i said Hey, uh, what do we do about this dispute? With? You know, they did X, Y, Z, and you know, we told my story, and he said, "You know, give me some wisdom, right?" So I wrote down his name. I actually like recorded him in like one of my earlier books. So I'm just gonna look him up real quick. Mm -hmm. He was uh, yeah. So he says a person who puts the interest of the individual before the interest of the group can be bought. Get rid of that. And the thing is, this this is an individual. Who, this is a person who put the interest of himself above the group, right? And he was bought. Mm -hmm. Period. And so, you know, that, like, like the, the, the guy, like I said, Rabbi Zeus, I think you're part of you and I am, but uh, like he was saying, he's telling you how to look at people. And there are people who will put themselves above the group, and there are people who will be bought. And the reality is this. You know, like you, the cameraman, and you know, this dude, he just told you that story. You can punch me in the damn face. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, like all words, but like the first thing you should have done was punch me in the face. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like the reality is that a lot of these people that do us harm, that do against our people, like, like I think it was I, I don't want to hold on the top, but I think it was uh, Claude Anderson who said he used to go to these functions where. Only with the sardine can, can of <laughs> anyway, He goes to go to uh, he goes to go to these functions where uh, where him and like a bunch of ethnic groups would talk, right? Him and you know the Chinese would talk to this group, and the and the, and the, and the Native Americans and the, and the Latinos and everybody would talk. And he would say at the end of the conversation, he would always try to say, uh, "Let's let's have a, let's talk about accountability." And everybody would ignore him and say, now, nah, you know, you know, and they just ignore him. And then finally, he, uh, one of the times Native American comes around and says, well, we've like, no, we're not going to talk about uh, accountability as a group because that's 
y'all people issue. No. He said that's y'all people issue. If 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 a if a Native American wants to hang out with white folk, want to be with white folk, we just cut them off and say go. But mm. tomorrow, you know, anybody can betray you, and they have to cook out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You know? And we know this because white folk get to cook out too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Damn so it's just like, you know, realistically speaking, we, 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 particularly, particularly I'll say in America, but we really got it bad in the sense that, you know, we just have these sellouts just doing whatever they want to do. Matron, Matron what could I do? Uh, uh, only, only, I'm going to have to mute your mic. There's a uh, feedback. Uh, Matron, what says you? We are not in a war um, just for like physical bodies. We're in a war for the consciousness of our people. There's this Egyptian relief, and I forget where it's at, and if I remember before the end of the show, I'll, I'll reference it. But it shows four different people groups. It shows one African on one side, right? And there's another African identical to the one on the other side, but he's in between like red people and yellow people or white people and red people. And that African is going in the same direction as those people, but these other Africans are on the other side. And whenever I hear these different things, I recognize more and more that we're not in a, in a war, you know, that, that people recognize and that we are willing to fight the right way. If we're in a war for the consciousness of our people, then we have to do the things to implant that consciousness in our people instead of letting it be supplanted and co-opted by other people groups. It pissed me off to see this because knowing who he is and what he did and things like that, he told you that he was guilty. And we continue to allow these people to commit petty acts of malignancy and malevolence towards our people and and we don't dole out consequences they die and confess they have deathbed confessions they are not dealt with by us and then we're not educating our children so i'm a i'm a uh Run with my ER Zuliism thing we taking this L because we don't decide to do something different so what the matron is saying too is, is crazy. No, and, and and Oni said it before. No one touched this dude. No one out here touched this dude for what he did, right? And I understand he was under witsec, you know, witness protection and all that stuff. But come on. Um, second of all, his conscience ate him up in the end. Well, he ran out into into street traffic and and basically got knocked down and killed some years later, because he knew what he did. He put himself above the group. Now, another thing, too, and this is my personal take on this, is um, this is one of the problems I've kind of always had with the NOI, to be very uh, to be very honest. And I, and, and I know it's a little inconsistent because Malcolm was a guy, was a hoodlum in the streets and all this kind of stuff. But, like, This guy who they brought in off the streets, this is why I have an issue with the streets. This guy who they brought off the streets had no allegiance but to himself. You know, I get it was I get it was jail that there was, you know, but from what I understand, it was like for like stealing a car or something like that. It wasn't like a gun charge or something like that. Man, go sit down, sit your ass down and go take that. That that was your that was your fault. That was your bad. And instead you went and gave them the plans and um that killed the chairman and the other guy. What's the other guy's name again? Mark. Um, do any of you guys here with me on the panel remember? Well, um, damn it. Yeah, Mark Clark. Mark Clark, right? Are you in the shower or something, guy? Oh, what's going on there, man? Um, gotta stay clean, bro. <laughs> it's like Kramer from Seinfeld making his dinner in the shower, man. God damn, I have to put you on mute because that noise is coming through. Mark Clark, thank you, Oni and Tito District. Um, in the chat, I see we have Azuliism saying, facts, facts, facts. If you are men before you are black, you can be bought. If you are a woman before you are black, you can be bought. If you are kidnapped before you are black, you can be bought. And that's the thing, man. We have to really... Um, hammer down 
who we are. Like uh, the, the, the identity thing is so important because people who are against us understand the identity thing. We don't understand what it means to have an identity and how to stand on it. And we allow others to confuse us with all these other sub identities, your, your sexual orientation, your, your job, your, the college you went to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to do better with that. Um, before we move on, I put the link in the chat again for, um, I put the link in the chat for, uh, those who might want to join the, uh, stream. Um, any last words from, from Oni or the matron on this topic of RIP to the, uh, to the chairman? We'll, we'll start with the matron. RIP to the chairman and much respect to the legacy that he's left. Although we are not where we want to be, we are not where we were. So just, you know, do your work. Yeah. Only anything from you? Uh, you're, you're muted, remember? So you have to unmute. Yeah, I know. I mean, like, I've, I've let his son, his son explain to, to us, you know, what his, uh, like his role in uh, Kanye West saying, uh, you know, George Bush don't care about black folks. And I was right. But outside of that, you know, like, like you know, Black Panther Party, it was uh, it was doing its thing, you know. <laughs> I I won't say anything about it on this day. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> I get you. Um, <laughs> uh Tito District says these revolutionary organizations need to have very thorough vetting processes for their members going forward. Too many lessons from the past not to learn from. I agree with that 100%. All right. I think we've covered that. We've given our, you know, our RIPs to the chairman. Let's go on to Shoot the Breeze topic number two. Shoot the Breeze topic number two is parents are Parents charged in case of boy who killed fellow students. They purchased him a gun and sent text saying, don't do it. Teacher also found gory drawings he had in his desk. Um, this prompt was accompanied by an article. Let me pull it up. But I'm sure by now you guys have learned about this story. I, I honestly just really learned about it last night listening to the Matron show. Cause I wasn't really sure what was going on out here. Um, so let's see what this article has to say. Three killed, eight injured in shooting at Oxford school in suburban Detroit. Make sure I'm sharing this. The suspect a 15 year old sophomore is in custody. The under sheriff said, so hold on. There's a, a little bit of a, Story here. Let's check it out. The community in morning coming, coming together, together to remember three teenagers, three teenagers shot, shot and killed in an attack on a school, on a school in suburban Detroit. Detroit. A 15-year-old 15 15 student, student who has not yet been publicly, publicly identified suspected of opening fire on his classmates at Oxford High School. Our teachers tell us to get down, hide, barricade the doors. Authorities releasing the identities of the three victims ranging in ages from 14 to 17 years old. Madison Baldwin was a senior set to graduate. 16-year-old Tate Meir and 14-year-old Hannah St. Juliana also died. New video shows students barricading themselves inside a classroom as someone in the hallway claiming to have a badge tries to enter. Sheriff's office. Safe to come out. Yeah, he said it's safe to come out. Now we're not willing to take that risk right now. I can't hear you. We're not taking that risk right now. Okay, well, come to the door and look at my bag, bro. Yeah, bro. He said bro. He said bro. Red flag. The students who believe it's the shooter making a desperate escape out of the window. Oh. The suspected gunman described by police as a 15-year-old sophomore armed with a semi-automatic pistol firing at least a dozen rounds. Authorities say they've received more than 100 911 calls and were able to apprehend the shooter with seven rounds left in his gun less than five minutes after the first emergency call. That, again, I believe, interrupted what potentially could have been seven more victims. 
Investigators say the gun was purchased by the boy's father days ago on Black Friday, and the teen has posted photos practicing with it. Now, late last night, authorities addressed rumors that they may have missed possible warning signs that there would be a school shooting here at Oxford High School. Investigators say they never received any threats. Now, as for the suspected teenage shooter, uh, while he may not be cooperating with investigators, prosecutors say they are ready to act quickly, even bringing charges as soon as today. Savannah? All right, Megan, thank you. Yeah, so this article... Uh, we're, we're praying for you. Joel Osteen. This article goes on to say three students were killed and eight others were injured in a shooting Tuesday at Oxford High School in suburban Detroit, authorities said. The suspect, a 15-year-old sophomore, is in custody. Uh, Oakland County Under Sheriff Michael McCabe said at a news conference a handgun was also found, he said. Hannah St. Juliana, 14, and Madison Ball, 17, were killed in the shooting. Sounds about white. Tate Meyer, 16, died in a patrol car as deputies were taking him to the hospital, the Oakland County Sheriff's Office said Tuesday. Eight others were seriously wounded, including a teacher, and taken to hospitals with various injuries, Sheriff Michael Bouchard said. Three of the wounded students were in critical condition late Tuesday night, including a 15-year-old boy with a gunshot wound to the head and a 14-year-old girl wounded in the neck and chest and who was on a ventilator, Bouchard said. Authorities received a 911 call about an active shooter at the school just before 1 p.m., McCabe said. More than 100 911 calls came into dispatch, he told reporters. The shooter fired at least a dozen shots before he was taken into custody. Deputies responded and within five minutes had the suspect in custody. He did not cause any problems. He gave the weapon up. He didn't have the weapon on him at the time. Authorities did not say what led to the shooting, and McCabe told reporters that the suspect invoked his right not to speak. Police briefly spoke to the suspect's parents, who McCabe said advised their son not to speak to police. He is not telling us anything at this point in time, he said. The suspect is being held at a juvenile facility, but he could be moved if he is charged as an adult. So I just see a bunch of white kids in this picture, right? I'll have the matron talk about this because she's in this general area. Multiple law enforcement agencies, ambulances, and SWAT team members responded to the school. Students were evacuated and taken to a nearby store to be reunited with their families. Oxford High School is about 45 miles north of Detroit. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer said that the deaths and the injuries were horrific and that it is time for the community to come together to help our children feel safe at school. <clears throat> She choked up at a news conference Tuesday evening, calling the shooting every parent's nightmare. This is a uniquely American problem that we need to address, Whitmer said. But at this juncture, I think we need to focus on the community, the families, supporting all the first responders, including incredible people at our hospitals that are working so hard to save the lives of those who are fighting for their lives. Speaking Tuesday, a technical school in Minnesota President Joe Biden said, my heart goes out to the families and during the unimaginable grief of losing a loved one, that whole community has to be just in a state of shock right now. <clears throat> uh, Matron, you live in this area, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep trying to share with you, Pete, with uh, everyone. De Michigan is not a black state. Detroit is used to be a predominantly black city. Right. And the thing that you have to understand about Michigan is that once you get outside of metropolitan areas, whether it's Detroit, everybody, first of all, says they're from Detroit. But once you get outside of Metro Detroit um, and once you're not in a college town area and even in some of the college town areas that are north of the southeast Michigan area, you don't see black people. We we down here. We we got a spot and they keep pushing us out. And then these people want to be the first Negro, but this isn't about the topic. And I'll go into the story because now it's up to four dead and there are a lot of others that were injured. And this kid has some really good aim because he got head shots and jaw shots and things like that. He was he was he was trying to make shield, uh, kill shots. He just wasn't at the range long enough, I believe. But anyway, mm -hmm. Michigan is not a black state and, and you really um, need to need to think about that. And there are a lot of little militias throughout the state. 
Like, remember, there was the guy who was an oath keeper who was also a sheriff, and the oath keepers were the one that wanted to kidnap the governor. Right. <laughs> okay, like, you got to contextualize these things, you know. So, um, but basically, uh, this kid uh, has been enabled and emboldened by his parents to be a gun advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the gun was a Christmas gift. They advertised on their social media accounts the fact that it was a Christmas gift. The mom sent him a text message because earlier in the week or sometime in recent history, the teacher was disturbed because he was, in fact, looking at ammunition while in class. Well, when the teacher told that to the mom, she's like, yo, don't worry about it. I'm not mad. I just got to teach you to not get caught. OK, hmm. so so you got to get into the mindset of these people, you know, and, and um, you know, he was drawing disturbing images, talking about the voices in his head and it can't stop. And, he, you know, he he was a a deranged child and there are some questions being presented because neighbors are reporting that there were some um police activity at the residence in the past i haven't been able to get any updates and confirmed information because if they don't take anybody and make an actual report then those reports aren't always public so it's just a lot of different things that go into it but what you need to know about oxford is that oxford is like mayberry Meaning that everybody knows everybody. They are they they are ninety eight point seven percent white. The black people that do exist there are either interracial or complete and totally foreign, and they are not a sig significant um, population there. And uh, the town goes to sleep at like six seven o'clock at night. You'd be hard pressed to find a McDonald's or gas station open past ten o'clock in this area. Everybody knows everybody. So like they're pissed because this has disrupted their life and their way of being. You know, these are Detroit problems as far as they're concerned. This is not something that's supposed to happen in their community. In the chat, Tito District says, this is the logical conclusion and consequence of the Rittenhouse verdict being what it is. She goes on to say, true, Michigan is a corn-fed Midwest after all. Let me just welcome in Mr. Untouchable to the panel. Mr. Untouchable, how are you tonight? Good night, good night. Respect, uh, Koku. Uh, respect to the chat, all the people who came in. Um, to my answer to, well, I don't know if you really wanted me to go into um, what I thought about this case. Yeah, speak on that. Um, okay. Um, me personally, you know, I am I'm pro gun. You know, I think yeah, one of the too. good I think one of the good things about the um United States Constitution is is really that second amendment, the right to defend yourself. Um it's unfortunate when you live in a country where you are awash with guns. I mean, I think there's more guns than American citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, and and what um what Matron was saying was exactly right. There are a lot of militias in these in these places. You know, Lansing, Michigan, all over all over um, um, Michigan, really. You know, you have some serious right wing uh, militias. So you should defend yourself. And also, the gun lobbies. The, the United States government really don't give a damn about the deaths of these kids. You know, no. because the gun lobbies they they own many congressmen. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They would never speak out against these kinds of mass killings and mass murders. But um, I don't know, man. I just, as far as the parent being irresponsible, you know, you have some criminal ne neglect there coming down, possibly. You know, but um, I don't know, man. This this issues it has so much different um pieces to the puzzle to try to rectify what's going on. So I don't I don't really have an answer for it if I if I was being honest. Is this something uh, before we go to Onita to say? Is this is this story something we should really care about as black folks, Mister Untouchable? <laughs> well, <laughs> you you know my position with these kinds of things. If it's if it's not really within our community, you know my my issue is you need to worry about what's going on within your community. But mm -hmm. these things sometimes spill out, and yeah. also. And also, I would also say, 
anything that happens in, in America, even tragedies like these are teachable moments. You learn from these experiences. You say, okay, okay, these kinds of, you watch what happens and you watch the responses. That's just important too, especially when we considering, you know, nation building and things of that nature. How, how are these guys responding? What do they get wrong? What do they get right? And how could be implemented within our own groups or communities? That's how I look at the situation. Yeah, one of the things, before we go to Oni, I'll say this. One of the things that you can't really protect against is the op that looks like you, right? So this little dweeb or whatever he was sitting in this classroom with these kids, you can't really protect yourself from the person who looks like you. You could be Second Amendment all you want. You could have your thing on you. If one of these ops walk up on you, sneak up on you, I mean, is it, right, Matron? Yeah, I mean, we we need to be concerned about this because we know that for the past nine years consistently that I can remember, there's been an avid push to um, take away guns from certain people groups, right? Because mm -hmm. cer certain people are always going to be able to get guns and they, they aren't just criminals, right? right? Rich rich people are always going to be able to get guns because that's not uh, a handgun, that's a hunting rifle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we need to look at being able to take up these gentlemanly sports, quote unquote, and equipping ourselves because personal gun rights for recreational use and for self-protection and self-determining agendas and ideas, that's really what's on the line with this case. And and this will rile them enough, right? Um, that they may limit things like the rights of militias. Like I'll give you an example of their attack on gun rights. Like you can own a gun, but you can also recreationally use marijuana. But if you have guns and drugs at the same time, then that is a federal charge. So you're smoking your little recreational marijuana, blah, blah, blah. You can be licensed to do that. You go get your CPL, you can do that, but you can't do those two things together, even if you're in business. So, so we just need to watch and look at how they're trying to push the needle and evolve the law and ensure that we can continue to protect ourselves. The, the one thing I'll say that is important for black folks to, to get from this story, by the way, if there's one thing to take from it, I've talked about this several times in the past. Whenever I go to Virginia, whenever I go, go to Maryland or the DMV area and I get a chance to go over to Virginia to, to where the gun ranges are, when I go there, I'm telling you, I see little girls. I see fathers with little, white fathers with little white girls who are seven, eight, nine years old, and they're holding the gun with them, and they have them firing, and they see me and my brethren and them walk in, right, and they they, they they look at us like, well, goddamn, we were here practicing for you, but apparently you're all here practicing for us, and they they're there with their little children. Black folks need to get stop being afraid of guns. Take your kids to the range. Let them get that experience because, you know, firing a gun on TV is way different than what it is in real life. Just the, just the sound of, 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 of the gun going off is something you need to get used to. Oni, what says you to this um, prompt? Yeah, so I'm just going to read off from, um, you know, one of those opinions that I, I have, which is, Robert's got a quick hand. He'll look around the room, but won't tell you his plan. <laughs> right. You guys know this song, but it's uh, all the other kids with the pumped up kick do better. I don't know if you know that song, but these white boys in uh, 2010 released a song called Pumped Up Kicks, and it's about school shooting. And it was like a hit, you know, among white people. Uh, and it's just like real, real talk. White folk, one thing I would say is this, that white people are telling you how vulnerable they are. You know, a lot of times we think, hey, these white folk are invulnerable, they're unbeatable, they're untouchable, right? But even a little punk boy could just go and, and body four people, you know, in five minutes, you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that they have a lot of weaknesses, they are very vulnerable, and and you should you should understand that. Uh, another thing is that, you know, if there was a white person 
who was crying over the death of black people. And I, I'm not going to cry. I can see that uh, a couple of times. And it's weird. So <laughs> for me, it's like, it's like, why that like i don't care like as soon as you saw as like when i see these shootings i'm like okay was there a black person you yeah, know because yeah. like that's that's my concern but as soon as you show these three white folk i mean sucks to be them but you know yeah. we'll talk you done like your ancestors took over this country and and took my people from my country you know what i mean like i could have my feet up on a table in africa but i don't because your ancestors were a bunch of uh, Bruce, and now you're just, you know, it's, it's as Malcolm X said, chickens are coming home to Bruce. Mm -hmm. Well said. In the chat, uh, in the chat, Daily Affirmations by Pauline says, students from the diaspora were shown visibly upset by the incident. So we should be concerned, in my opinion. Yeah, students of, from the diaspora would be upset because a lot of our children haven't been taught what to what to what to care for and what not to care for. All right, a lot of our kids are out here caring for everything. Uh, Palestinians, uh, the desert, you know, uh, you know, Indians, Native Americans, Amerindians, all this old shit. Uh, that's the problem. That's why they're showing that visible concern. Only with what says you. Yeah, I should also say this though. Like real talk. Like, I mean, if you if it was your classmate. Right, you gotta act like you care. They, you know they didn't like? have no black classmates. Only. <laughs> well, I don't know. You said, uh, Daily Affirmation said students from the diaspora, so I'm guessing the students there who were black were visibly upset. No, 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 there were no black people. No, I'm, I'm telling you that there are. Just, I think she's talking about in general because they did interview like some kids from other neighboring districts, and you know uh, they they have like these little reaction things that they do I to check that this is. But that's propaganda, right? I want us to understand because right. this, this we the grown folks here. That's propaganda because what they're doing is they're checking the temperature to see if the programming is working. Mm -hmm. So recognize that I'm I'm t I live here. I have been to that school doing academic games and programs with kids. There are no black kids. Yeah. So yeah, what I would say is this then, like, yeah, if it's a random black kid, like, you know, white boy, like, like occasionally you'll see a, a black student, uh, you know, you'll see a black person being interviewed by white folk, and they just sit in like an I S it. You know what I mean? Uh, but like most of the times, you gotta like, like, you don't know what's going on. You know what I mean? Like, you don't know, like, you know, if it's going to be broadcast, like, sometimes, I mean, that's the unfortunate thing about black folk. A lot of times we do, like, cowardly stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's, it, a part of it is that you really don't know what's going on. Like, like, you know, you randomly, hey, you know, there was a school where these kids were shot. And it's like, oh, yeah, I feel bad, you know? Like, like, what's, <laughs> what's, like let me go, let me go get my, uh, let me go get my, uh, you know, my soft drink or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, why are you telling me this? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I feel like those kids were upset because they were, they knew they were on camera. They were probably, look, you know, and like, and like, and like Major just said, like, it's possible they just selected the ones that were upset, you know, because some of them might be like, them white kids deserved it or the white kids, you know, were bullies or the white, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But like, yeah. you know, you're not going to play those. You'll be like, yeah, these Negroes still, you know, like they're going to, they're going to know that we're not vulnerable. They're going to know not to fight us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Tito District says, facts, matron, uh, or the learning curve. She says they're always trying to check the temperature with these incidents. They did it. In fact, is it one of the topics tonight? It might not have made the cut tonight. But um, we talked about it last week, about that gentleman who was hammed up uh, wrongfully in the rape of um, um, what's that woman's name again? Uh, we, we talked about Kevin Strick. Was it Kevin Strickland? No, we talked about Anthony Broadwater, who was hemmed up in the rape of that author Alice Siebold. And it didn't make the cut this week for Shoot the Breeze, but this Negro was out here like, I, I forgive you, she was a victim too. I'm like, yo, that's this is what they do. They find a way to to test your gangster in a sense. Let's see what you're gonna do. Let's see what you're gonna say. 
Let's welcome in Kevin Carre, 42, to the to the podium. Kevin Carre, what says you today? Greetings. Uh, sorry, I'm late for class. Uh, long day of track and field today, the armory. Oh, okay. Uh, do, do, we're talking about the shooting that occurred in Michigan with them white folks, with the white kid. Uh, do you do, Did you have anything you want to say about it? Uh, that's their problem. That's their, I, 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 as long as they, they kill each other, that's on them. They always complain about us, so about black and black crime. They never complain about that white and white crime crap. Well said. Well said. Uh, Mr. Untouchable, any last words on this prompt? Yeah, something you said earlier. Um, you mentioned when you go to the gun range uh -huh. and how people look at you crazy. <laughs> you know? and I remember I remember when I was in, in Florida as well. And I, when I would go to the gun range, you see a lot of older, older men, especially older white guys and some young white guys. But they do look at you because I'm the only one. Usually I'm the only black guy in there for some strange reason. Yep. So they look at me like, why the hell is he in there? <laughs> what is he planning? That kind mm -hmm. of look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just thought it was funny. Your mm -hmm. experience with it is the same because it's like the idea of us trying to um, use means and defending ourselves just like they do is absurd. They yeah. believe that it's like, well, it seemed, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it seemed like what it's like. Your, you guys believe that we completely rely on you all for our protection, but that's mm -hmm. not how every every black male person thinks. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just it's just jokey to, to watch. You know, it's like, what are you doing in here? Don't you have a felony? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add. I just want to add to what Mister Untouchable was talking about, and the fact that you know they they passed laws that were in effect for a very, very, very long time that prohibited us from protecting ourselves. And then after they finished passing those laws and realized they could no longer pass those laws because they had to extend the rights of citizenship to us, they then put out a war on poverty and a war on crime and then a war on drugs. And they flooded our neighborhoods with drugs. They committed crimes, right? And they kept us poor to continue to criminalize our existence so that we would still by operation of their laws be prohibited from protecting ourselves. Uh, I know Mr. Untouchable just touched on it. I said it earlier. I to the rest of the panel, are you guys pro or anti Second Amendment right? I am pro Second Amendment. Remember, we spoke about that case in the Supreme Court right now. They're they're trying to um, strike down the New York State ban on you know, especially New York All City. Right. Mm -hmm. And I hope that becomes successful. I hope so too. I'll be first in line. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, what, what about Oni Tasse? You're muted, by the way. Yeah, I was looking for this uh, quote from uh, Martin Lane, so come back to me. All right, I'll come back. Uh, Matron, are you a Second Amendment? Uh, are you pro or or, or against? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Look, I am um, I am an advocate, gun advocate. Okay. I run camps and different things uh, to try to get younger people involved in learning how to use all types of weapons. So I am definitely pro Second Amendment rights. For those in the audience, if you haven't done so before, I um, if you go back in the archives here on YouTube, you'll see I had this interview with this black guy named Maj Toure, who is, I want to say, our, our most identifiable Second Amendment rights advocate. Um, there's some things he does that's kind of weird sometimes, but you should go check out that 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 episode. If you still have a hang up about having your your machinery in your home or on your person in states where you can have those things, go listen to that episode and get off of that foolishness that you're on. Uh, who's that making noise? Oni, what's say you? Oh, no, I wasn't making any noise, but. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> But uh, what was it? Uh, I wish I could find this thing. But basically, Martin Delaney explains it. He says right after the Civil War, there were 200,000 uh, Africans who 
for all right, 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 you got it right here. Okay, right here. So it says, I'll tell the government, I'll tell you, enslavement is over and shall never return again. We have now 200,000 of our men well drilled in arms and used to warfare. And I tell you, it, it is with you and them that your enslavement shall not come back again. If you are determined, it will not return again. I can't remember what case it was. Some brother, I mean, I mean, you know, I used to be in this organization where Chairman would tell us, uh, you know, there was this case that was against, you know, black people having arms, you know? But the reality is that the protection that you had, the protection that you have is going to be the protection that you give yourself. You know, mm -hmm. I don't personally call it the Second Amendment right because I feel like it says that the U.S. Constitution is what endows you with the right to protect yourself. But yeah, you have to you have to be about your self protection, but as well as your group protection. You know, right. uh, white folk are trying to take away your ability to protect yourself. Um, but you just don't let them, you know, and that's one thing that I'm going to say that white folk, like white folk get that kind of credit, well, not credit, but like they, they do something right in protecting their own communities, you know, like one time I was, uh, you know, my, uh, my, my ex-wife was practicing driving and I guess I was, you know, there with her. And so she's practicing parking in this white area and these white folk all come out and watch. They just watch and like hit my car. I dare you. You know what I mean? Uh, but it's like that's the kind of community policing that you know. It like for what it's worth, it's respectable. You know, we don't. You know, like you don't need to learn from white folk these kind of things. But there are some things that we forgot. You know, there's some things that were taken from us that we need to bring back. And and yeah, you know, part of that is is being able to protect yourself. You know. Uh, I, I do want to continue with this thing in the sense of there's this uh, thing, uh, Boko Haram recently attacked this, like bombed a city in Nigeria. Like, but no, not a city, but like a whole village in Nigeria. Like, bombed it, right? And I, I put it up in my Discord where I was like, it reminds me of this story called uh, The 13 Samurai, something like that, uh, from the Japanese, where they talk about, you know, arming the peasants to deal with the bandits. You know, because you're going to have bandits no matter what you're doing. You're going to have bandits and you're going to need to defend yourself. Because if you do not defend yourself, some other people are going to take your stuff. Some mm -hmm. other people are going to kill you. Some other people are going to offend you. This is a part of the human experience. This is a part of the living experience. Lions uh, attack hyenas. This is the part of science. This is science. Well said. Lions attack a larger animal, hyenas, right? Um, um, just want to remind you guys that uh, we simulcasting tonight. You can catch this episode on Twitter. Uh, so if you're on Twitter, make sure to share it or, or retweet it uh, to your timeline. Uh, you can also watch this show on the KWAZ Radio YouTube channel. Um, tonight is a test for this uh, upcoming uh, Roman New Year. Um, I'm going to be doing an exclusive show one night a week on KWAZ Radio, on KWAZ Radio's YouTube channel. So you guys should make sure to um, go over there and subscribe so that you can be notified when new content is up over there. Um, any last word from anyone? I think Kevin right. Coward wants to say something. Any, yeah, any last word? Yeah, like tonight you're talking about, you know, defending yourself. Did you see the tweet I sent you tonight? There, it was kind of real funny of that white supremacist going trying to attack oh, yeah, that yeah, guy, yeah. and yeah. he got punched. That's what that's that spirit we need to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they uh, it's, uh, you know this 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 opponent that we have is is a funny is a funny creature man this proponent will play big and bad in the press conference right you know that press conference before the fight where you have to face each other he'll play big and bad but then when it comes to the ring he'll tie your two hands behind your back and expect you to knock him out um that's what we go up against these guys they take away your guns they take away your men and they just leave your communities just open for them to to to, to just decimate and then they pretend like they're the biggest, baddest, smartest thing on the planet. No, you cold the game. 
you code the game. Uh, any last words from anyone else about this? I want to add to that too. I want to yeah. add to that. Go ahead. Ah, uh, you're breaking up. Can you hear me now? I got you, you now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Your, your opponents don't believe in a so-called fair fight. Mm -hmm. They are trying to win by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. So I say that instead of you having this idea of fighting fair, you should fight like the person who is your opponent mm -hmm. and get that in your head and get it in your head very quickly because you will always be at the losing end when you're trying to play against a person who does not fight fairly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I, can I add to that too, what Mr. Untouchable just said, right? In high school, when I, I was on the soccer team, we weren't, we, weren't, we weren't the best, but we came up on against these white boys. They were like a lot better than us because they played club. But our model against them was like, if you're not cheating, you ain't trying. I mean, they, they, they beat us, but at the end of the game, they were, and they, they were bruised and, 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 and beaten. We beat right. them down. <laughs> you know, just to go back to the first prompt real quick before I let the matron speak. When we talked about Fred Hampton, one of the things that you pick up in that story is they had a sellout Negro, of course, who gave them the floor plan. So they knew exactly where to go, where to shoot through, like what walls to shoot through. And you know what's another part of that story that's been said too? I don't know how true it is, but it's been said that it seems like the chairman was drugged as well, right? So these guys... Not only did they come in with in mass with you know police uh, force with guns and all this you know a bunch of guns and just riddling this this apartment, but they also potentially drugged this this fella. So there was no chance for this guy to come out of that you know this the, the chairman Fred Hampton to come out of that situation. These guys called the game. So if you want to sit up here and and act like um, you want to be gentlemanly, you will lose every time. Matron, what say you? We have, you know, um, one of the reasons I really believe the ancients decided to venerate the process of death so much is so that you could understand this is a natural process. This is a part of life. And they are not afraid to die. We are dealing with an opponent, a projector of reality that will sacrifice any of the people, right? So that their people can be or stay on top. And we have to get beyond the mindset that whatever we can experience in this transitory physical experience is, is not as important as what we can achieve if we go ahead and just stare this problem down and deal with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good point you said too. We our ancestors told us not to worry about this stuff in, in, in terms of not to worry about dying, right? That to live, you'll be okay in the afterlife. And so that's our, that should be our mission. Our mission is supposed to be able to make sure that we're good in this existence. But instead, they flipped the, they flipped the script in, our, in many of our people's minds to worry about the next life, the next world. I'm not too concerned with it, to be honest. Any last words from anyone else here on this prompt? All right, so I will post prompt number three tonight. Uh, the show's going real smooth tonight. I appreciate everyone who's here. Make sure you guys drop a like to show that you were here. And don't be afraid to drop a like over on the KWAZ radio side, too, to show that you uh, acknowledge that there was a, a simultaneous um, streaming going on tonight, a simulcast going on tonight. So prompt number three is up. Prompt number three says, mana, a.k.a. money, falling from heaven, a.k.a. walls. What are your thoughts? That's a funny way that prompt was put, but here is the story. Let me just paste it so you guys can see the screen. Um, so here we go. So a plumber discovers money in the wall of Joel Osteen's, uh, I guess it's Austin. Is it Austin or Olstein? I thought it was Olstein. Joel it's Osteen. Olstein. It's Olstein, it's right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Joel Olstein's church, years after 600K burglary, 
report says. So Plummer discovers money and wall of Joel Olstein's church years after 600K burglary. Report says, the subtitle says, 500 envelopes reportedly found behind a loose toilet as workers move insulation out of the wall. So I guess this, this is what the church looks like. Uh, back in 2014, a big headline in Texas involved hundreds of thousands of dollars stolen from a safe of Joel Osteen's mega church, Lakewood Church in Houston. Now, seven years later, another bombshell has dropped. A plumber says he found money in a wall in envelopes, cash, and checks while he was doing work at the church on November 10th of this year. The news came to light during the radio morning show at 100.3 The Bull, according to our sister station, whatever, whatever. Uh, it was just unbelievable, the things he was telling us that they found in the walls. Radio host George Lindsay said, uh, adding that one caller really took the segment over the edge. There was a loose toilet in the wall, and we removed the tile, the caller said. We went to go remove the toilet, and I moved some insulation away, and about 500 envelopes fell out of the wall. And I was like, oh, wow. I went ahead and contacted the maintenance supervisor that was there, and I turned it all in, he added. Lindsay couldn't believe what he had just heard. We were like, what are you talking about? Lindsay said. So then he relayed to us that in 2014, there was a big story about money being stolen from Lakewood Church that they never recovered. The Houston Police Department is still investigating the seven-year-old case involving the disappearance of 600000 It is unclear how much money the plumber discovered, but the case raises a lot of questions. A representative from Lakewood Church acknowledged cash and checks were found at the facility during repairs years after a burglary of $600,000 in 2014. So that's the story. Um, the prompt is, a, is what are our thoughts? So I will start with Kevin Carey, 42. What are your thoughts in hearing this story? What a goddamn fool. I would, I would have taken that damn money and never reported it. Yeah, I kind of feel you on that. Mr. Untouchable, what says you? I I, I second um, Kevin. I second uh, I second Goku. <laughs> <laughs> what what see okay. I understand we're dealing with, with religious minded people, and this plumber may be a religious minded person. Yeah. And he won't, he may have found six hundred thousand dollars and said, Well, let me do the what would Jesus do? But I don't I Jesus don't would have kept the money. <laughs> He probably would have shared it up with his 12 disciples. Yeah, all people. To, 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 for me, the story seems inc incredulous. I um, I have some issues with it because if I was to just put just a reasonable person in that situation and say, what would a reasonable person do if they found $600? Just a, a reasonable plumber. 600000 Yeah, on a plumber's salary. What would a reasonable plumber do? If he found that money, would he report it to the police? Would he report it to his supervisor? I don't know. I, I can't say that I've met so many, so many uh, right, well, uh, plumbers who would report six hundred thousand dollars with don't have a name on it. I I don't I don't see that happening. So I think that is more to the story. I think that you know maybe you know as, as time goes progresses, you you probably hear some more facts on this story, but it sounds very fishy to me. He might have been afraid of uh, Joel Osteen r riding up on him, like, yo, where the fuck is my money I stashed in the wall? I know you took the shit. So, uh, he got to prove I find that. He got to prove exactly. I find that. He has to prove it. <laughs> Only to say, what says you? Yeah, the story for me, dog. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nah, but like, uh, yeah, you got to normalize stealing from thieves, you know? But uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I mean, like, it's another church story. The church stealing from, uh, the church just collecting money, just stacking bread is nothing new. You know, they've been doing this from the time the church first started. So, you know, like, as they say, no pity for the religious, you know. Um, if, if you were that silly to have put your money here, you know, that's what it is. Now, as far as I can tell, I, I could just imagine this plumber's black. I don't, I don't know any white person to show up, find something valuable and not pocket it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm kind of like, I feel like I'm ashamed, like like low-key ashamed that this white, that this black man, I'm pretty sure, uh, 
was like, yeah, I'm going to do, I can't steal from my church, you know? Uh, dumb call, and hopefully hopefully the contract was more than minimum wage, which it probably wasn't. So good job for you, bro. Yeah, I, I immediately felt like that's a black fella there who went there and gave that shit up, and I was ashamed immediately. Matron, what says you? At KWAZ Radio, we are collecting for our building fund. Make sure that you go to Bitter, M-E-D-Z, Cash App, and send us whatever you can to donate and build something. Now, I specifically picked the building fund because building funds in churches never get actualized in their goal and projected uh, mm -hmm. targeted areas. But I mean, overall, I was ashamed. Would I have kept the money? Yep. They would have had to come to me and told me that on the cameras that's watching the bathroom, <laughs> they saw me walking out and they'd have had to justify and substantiate it. And I'd have started crying immediately with my black mama tears and I'd have been like I thought Jesus was blessing me you gonna take this blessing from me and my children I'd have, I don't know I'd have just, you know what I'm saying like I'd have had a whole nother thing I mean like you guys are men and I ex I don't expect you to operate that way because like that's but if you had done that though right because in the system you can't be a self-affirming man so if you had kept the money and then quote unquote been stopped in regards to, you know, whatever bulge they saw or whatever they thought should have been there or whatever, whatever, like, you know, it's a test of your moral turpitude. Um, then, you know, if you had done that and said, you know, I thought, you know, God is just so transformative and he can make something out of nothing. And I know in a place where shit goes that this money being there must have been from him. So, you know, I'd have had like those types of uh, rationales and ideations about the situation. That would have been my money. I'd have been $600,000 richer. I agree with you. I When I grew up, I grew up in church, right? When I grew up in church, there was a popular sermon about a man stranded at sea who, um, someone's, someone's had some feet. Yeah, okay. So I grew up in church and there was a popular sermon about a man stranded at sea who waved off different people from helping him because he said he prayed to God for help and a helicopter came. He said, nah, God say you don't save me. A man on a boat come, he said, nah, you go ahead, God. That fucker drowned. So I would have gone right back to Joel Osteen and give them that same sermon like, listen, I asked God for a way. I moved that toilet out of the way and there was 600K. God gave me a way. And that's it. Um, I think uh, someone wanted to say something. Who else wanted to add something to this? God, Kevin Carey, was that you? Uh, damn, I'm, I'm going to come right back. I, I forgot. I, I'm a, when I find it, I'll come back. All right. Uh, in the chat, Daily Affirmation by Pauline says there was a crew, so he may have felt comfortable. He may have felt, I guess, uncomfortable keeping it with onlookers there. Right? That's where you break them off a piece of bread, too. Um. Daily Affirmations by Pauline goes on to say there were checks, too. Yeah, well, the checks you can't do nothing with. Tito District says great commercial to the revolutionary matron, right? We're trying to build a building here so you guys donate to the cash app that you see uh, scrolling past your screen. Um, is there any last thoughts from anyone here on this prompt? All right. Yeah. All right. So a long time ago. This got to be in the late 90s. I, I was being mentored by this photojournalism. I, I think he's dead now. But he said he used to ride along with these. He's, he's a white guy, Irish white guy that lives in Long Island. He used to work for Newsday. He said he used to ride along with these cops. They're like undercover cops. And they used to always bring him on drug bus. So they're like, hey, man, Um, one time they got like, like this, they caught this stash, like a lot of money. They're like, hey, hey, um, so and so, leave the room for a second. We, we got to talk. He said when he came back, like half that money was gone. Yeah. And I don't blame them. Real talk. I don't blame them, man. Uh, where if you find a way, you found a way, and that's just it. Um, I think that's the last word everyone has on this prompt, oh, right? Actually, that Negro probably wanted a pat on the head from, from Joel's old old. Thief. Yes, yes, yes. That's the problem. That's what I envisioned when I saw this. Because at first I asked the question, what does that have to do with black folks? But then when I read it and I heard it was a plumber, I said, oh, that's probably a black guy. And he gave the money back 
And I said, yeah, he probably was trying to get patted on the head, too. Matron, is there something you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, first of all, he probably donated his time because, you know, a lot of people donate their time <laughs> telling abilities to do, you know, while you can't feed your family at home and your shack oh. falling in, you donating your time telling an ability to this institution. Again, Bitter Meds Cash App, M-E-D-Z. OK. Um, and then the second thing that I wanted to say is, you know, they have like these little plaques and walls and bricks that they give to people talking about you are going to be the key for you're going to be the foundational stone of this institution. You are going to be the one upon which I build my church. You are going to be the one that is the basis of a nation in the future for God and country and our people or whatever. And so this thing probably. Pastor. <laughs> well, this Negro probably is going, you know, like you said, get a pat on the head. Maybe he get his picture somewhere on the church wall. He might even get a whole brick with a, you know, with his name on it somewhere in the building, talking about he's a foundational person while he's sitting there and his family is impoverished without resources. And they should bust him upside his head with that brick too for being yeah. stupid. Something. And then Joel was thinking to take that money to buy some crack and a prostitute. Probably <laughs> 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 use, use some cocaine line off her ass. What? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. God but damn, we gotta do better. It, Go it, it, bring, it brings me to a story. It's like a cat and a dog, right? A dog will, will, will be loyal to his owner and wants a pat on the head. But then I came across a, a, a t-shirt. I wish I had bought it. it it's a t-shirt said, who's a good kitty? Not me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, this guy just enriched Joel Alstein, 600K. What an idiot. Uh, I think we've exhausted that topic enough. Uh, let's go on to Shoot the Breeze topic number four tonight. A little bit of a better story, I think. Uh, Shoot the Breeze topic number four is about LeVar Ball's parents-in-law. Initially didn't like him. Because he was black. Well, okay. Um, let's uh, let's read that story here. This is this Negro Lavar Ball here <clears throat> with his white woman there. Uh, Lavar Ball, as many of you probably know, Lavar Ball is the father of two right now, two NBA uh, playing sons. He has a third one in the minor leagues of the NBA. So he might come through and have three. But let's read the story. LeVar Ball is the proud father of the Ball brothers in the NBA. While they have a happy union right now, LeVar had to overcome some challenges early on. Being as outspoken as he is, it is easy to make people like him, like him and that trait work. Wait, hold on. It is easy to make people like him and that trait worked wonders on Tina's parents who were not entirely sure how to handle the news of their daughter falling in love with an African-American. In a video that surfaced online of the family in kicks, with every member wearing a big baller brand merch, Tina's parents, Robert and Catherine uh, Slatinsky, spoke on the first time they heard about LeVar and how they responded, according to Robert. Um, my daughter said that she had a boyfriend and being I'm white and he's black, I didn't know how to take that at first. I probably didn't take it well. That's the father. The, the mother added, I will give Levi a great deal of credit because he didn't push. He was very willing to wait until Tina's parents who were acting, who were acting a little bullheaded at the time were ready to accept him. In the end, they accepted him which resulted in a blissful union and three exceptional kids, all of who could grow into superstars in the NBA. LeVar recently made it clear that he is trying to unite his three sons in, Chica in, the, in Chicago Bulls to create a super team. While that is a big task, LeVar is known to pursue whatever he wants wholeheartedly, and sometimes he gets results. Of the three ball brothers, LiAngelo is the only one yet to make his NBA debut. He's currently playing in the NBA G League for the Greensboro Swarm after he was waived by the Charlotte Hornets post-summer league. Lonzo's having the best campaign of his career with the Bulls. He joined them in the 2021 offseason and has created one of the most exciting teams in the league alongside Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan, Alex Caruso, and Nikola uh, 
Vujovic. The last of the Ball brothers is currently playing for the Charlotte Hornets. LaMelo won the 2021 NBA Rookie of the Year Award for his impressive overall performance. He understands the game well and is a bit of a showboat. The last time we saw such a brand of basketball played was during the Lakers Showtime era in the 1980s, led by Magic Johnson. So, uh, again, this is Slovan on the left, and there's him with the white lady there on the right. Um, first of all, how many of you on the panel here were familiar with Lavar Ball to begin with? Just want to make sure that we're talking about something that you guys know. Kevin Curry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I I heard about him. You know, his son. I think one of his son played the first one played for the Lakers, right? Yeah. He was like a bust or something. But he's a buster for sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, I respected him as a father that get to to push his son to get to, to that level. Mm-hmm. But he could have chose a black woman, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, but here's the fact though. You know, he was like he he played for the Jets, but he never really played a, a down of football. He was right. more like a practice squad. Right. He was a sports person too. He's like a six nine guy, six seven guy. Sorry, not six nine. He's like a six seven guy. He was athletic. He claims he could beat he could have beat Michael Jordan in a in a game of one on one. He played for the uh, the Jets, like you said. So he was a sports guy himself. The, the white woman he married to was, I believe, a volleyball player, like a big time volleyball player in college or something like that. Oh, um, um, he was misquoted, actually. He, he said the other half of the quote was he can beat Michael Jordan in a game of football. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Untouchable, what says you to this story? So so this this guy, he was a professional athlete. Uh, LeVar Ball? Yeah, the dad. He, 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 yeah, you could say he made it to the league, but not really. Okay. Because I'm trying to read between the lines. You know, um, why would they have softened their view on on this particular person, this Negro? Mm. And I'm thinking that maybe some of the professional checks that, that was getting cut for him may have softened their heart towards him. Or or I don't know what kind of Stephen from Django routine he was he he pr- probably tried to sell to to the parents of these white folks to get him to to allow their daughter to marry this guy. But you know he did a lot of dancing. He still mm-hmm. does a lot of dancing if you really because I watched some of his clips before. So he's he's a notorious dancer. But I, I'm not surprised, you know, you know, some of these folks don't like you for whatever reason, but they call it this article says that they was bullheaded. They don't go into the detail of saying, well, they didn't like this Negro just because he was a big ball head black Negro trying exactly. to mess with my daughter. But that's that's interesting. Mm-hmm. But I, like I say, you know, it's that's on him, man. You know, he, if he want to date a white girl, that's that's on him. I said, I don't know. That's on him, man. Only time to say, what say you? You're on mute. Yeah, it goes back to uh, uh, it goes back to what I said about Claude Anderson saying what he did. You know, like the reality is, you gotta write these people off. I, it, we, like we say, we don't like the one drop rule, right? I mean, I'm not even going to, you know, go into whether this dude himself is like one job. I don't know. But uh, I won't say that per se. But the fact that his kids are, right, means that, like, he's, he's written himself off. And it should not be for, uh, like, we should just be like, you know what, I don't even care what goes on. I, I, I said the Native Americans, you, you're as a Native American, you go into the white community, they just say, whatever, he's no longer Native American. We don't care about it, right? <laughs> this guy goes to the black, the white community. He's, you know, oh my gosh, these people won't accept me. And then we accept him. Mm-hmm. Like, they don't even accept him. He, they're, He's with their daughter. They're like, you know what? I don't know if I can accept him or not. He, he got not, he's not with any of our daughters. You know what I'm saying? His kids, his, his money, the kids that, the money that his kids are making are going to this woman. And yep. his and her family. Mm-hmm. Not going to no black families, you know. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so it's like, and 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 and, 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 if, and if you are saying, hey, you know what, we're not going by the one drop rule, right? Then you you got to just write them up. You saying, hey, you know, I don't like these mixed folk, you know. And and, and I mean, I mean, sure, you want to make if you want to make exceptions for mixed folk that go for for for, for black folk, that's fine, but. The kids got no indication, so what would you care? You know what I mean? Like, like, 
I stopped caring about this dude the moment I found out he had a white woman. And the reality is this. I found out he had a white woman the moment I found out about him. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think he's mixed, by the way. I think he has two black parents. But, yeah, um, it says a lot that when you find out about him, you also find out about his white woman, too. Right? It says a lot. Matron, what says you? Yeah, y'all know how I feel. This is why I make the statement that who you lay up with is who your interests are with, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the day, her parents didn't accept him until they saw the economy of him. This whole article is about him a brand that he's building yeah. and an idea that he has that could be another economic powerhouse because if a league came up that that recruited players that that competed with the NBA or even played in the NBA's off season the economic powerhouse that that would be would be incredible so her her parents right? Didn't even give him the time of day until they recognized that he carried an economy with him. Now, I don't care what he thinks he experienced, what dark skin, big booty girl wouldn't give him no play back in the day. At the end of the day, he went to who he could lay up with, whether it was his preference or not. And then that became his preference and his choice. I feel just like Oni, write him off. He for the streets and so are his kids. And we need to worry about what our two and a half percent are going to do. And we need to build and produce and birth out the economies and the nations that are inside of us. Um, Umar Johnson was on Fox Soul some time back and he was talking about this type of stuff, too. One of the things I like what Umar said, and I agree with it wholeheartedly, he's like, what? These Negroes don't understand, and I'm talking about all Negroes who do this type of stuff. These folks, your opponent knows how to identify um, your ambition, knows how to identify if you're going to do something with yourself. And so what happened with him here, LaVar, in the beginning, they weren't certain about his ambitions and what he would do. And when that became clear, that's when they accepted him. So they'll accept, they will accept, and they do this all the time, especially with their white daughters. They'll, a white daughter will get with a black guy once they understand early on that she picked this dude too because she recognized he's going to do some things. You know what I mean? He's going to do some things economically and she'll be fine. And that's when they get on board and they start to accept. They know how to look for that stuff we don't know how to look for that stuff amongst our folks. Um, it's untouchable. Any last words on this prompt? Yes, yes. I, I do have one quick thing to say about it. Um, I remember there was a secret recording of Hulk Hogan. Yes. Hulk Hogan got into uh, you, you, you read my mind. I was just about to say that. Yes, he got into a big controversy about using that nigga, the N word, yes. the nigga word. I don't, I don't want to shadow mind this. Thing. Anyways, and what he said was interesting because you got to get into the mind of some of these people. And he didn't mind if his daughter was dating some N-word person who was making $100 million. Mm -hmm. So the, how they, how they like, like Matron was saying, if the, if the, that no, if that N-word has an economy behind him, they weigh and measure even their own progeny in a in a completely different way, as if it was uh, rather than if it was just some regular N word coming up and saying, "Well, can I date your daughter?" They measure things very, very different. Yes, and I, I find that to be in very interesting. But Hulk, Hulk, if 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 you guys have time, I want you guys to listen to that um that secret recording. Let's, yeah, I heard it. Go, go over it again. Yes, yes, but that's yes. what I have to add to that. Um, that um, that that recording about Hulk Hogan's daughter—that's the daughter. That's the woman who Tariq Nasheed said he'll raise the flag of Europe for. By the way, it was Hulk Hogan's daughter. Daughter he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, Mr. Untouchable, you're correct. That they look at that stuff and they weigh that stuff out. You see what I'm saying? And we, our people, don't have the sense to see. It seems that these folks weigh that stuff out. They don't. 
the, we talk about we talk all this foolishness about well your love who love you and and it was love and no nah, they they they're not on that stuff they're looking at the the economics behind that and one thing that they know too they know that at the end of the day they're going to control the narrative if there's children involved they know they're going to control that narrative and those children are going to be white minded so to speak at the end of the day so they know they're going to have your money and they're going to have your kids afterwards major anything you want to say something you know, children usually love their primary nurturer, like whatever their primary nurturer looks like, that's who the children will go and, and gravitate towards. So like you said, these these kids are not going to go and marry black women. Right. No. They're not going to go and build a black community. They're not going to enrich us in any way. A and what we have to start doing is is making that delineation because it's relationships and situations like this that allow people to have things like blue vein societies and we want to get into the blue vein society. That's not even a, that's not even a black person, but we looking for their blue veins. We sitting here talking about paper bag tests. It need to be a paper bag test to say, if you ain't as dark as this paper bag, you can't come in the dough. Okay. And they do stuff like this all the time and they continue to steal from us because we won't fight for the consciousness of the mass of our people. Can I, can I absolutely something? yeah kevin go ahead you, you see how they, they're dragging mr williams over the cold right uh the, the, the williams sisters uh father right what make you think let's say something happened in the future which with where stuff goes south with him and his wife they can say oh you know they can jump the, those sons can jump on their mother's side yeah he abused us you know all them years you know yeah we got an nba but he abused us man i didn't have a child you know they, they, they're gonna try and pull it just watch i predict that that, that, that can happen yeah uh, they already said all types of stuff about him as far as the other family and the kids that he left behind and the fact that he didn't do shit for nobody but Serena and this it like and it, uh, they have already tried to castigate him and, and say all types of stuff. And they're going to continue to do that. Right. And at the end of the day, that speaks to us as black women, not liking to be pushed. Right. Because didn't both of the Williams girls wind up marrying non, non-African men. Right. No, 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 actually, uh, mention I was talking about, you know, if if stuff goes south with with Ball and his wife, oh, oh, the, the oh, boys can jump on their mother's side and say, yeah, you know, there's there's me, who knows? Maybe they don't like him at all. You see how he talks? You know, he pushes. Maybe maybe they, they don't like him. Wait, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The, the, the other both, the both uh, the both uh, uh, the Williams sisters married white men. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. Well, wow. not 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 Venus. Serena did, I think. Wow. But Venus is. is I thought Venus. Man. No, Venus, Venus has a white they, boy too. I thought I mean, yeah. I don't think she married him though. I think Serena. Oh, they're just dating. Oh, my bad. They're just dating. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. But they he, they not with black they not with black men. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're not with black men. <laughs> and that's really my larger point. And, and uh but about the ball situation, they may even resent their father, low key, because think about how you would feel being raised in a household by a uh, a cuck hold, a cuckly held man mm -hmm. that can't even actualize his masculinity because he's sitting there trying to kowtow to his step, to his in-laws that don't look like him and to his wife that doesn't look like him. So what type of resentment, what type of psychological warfare is happening in those children as he's sitting there being patient and tolerating this behavior? Like there are, there are impacts to everything that we do. And he's, this is an issue of him not being accountable. I don't care what he, you think he didn't did. He's not being wholesale accountable to his manhood because he took things that he probably shouldn't have took to be in this relationship to produce children that are going to have echoing effects throughout our society. Yeah. I mean, it's clear, you know, I, I heard it elsewhere as well. Like you love, you, you, you love what you prioritize and clearly he didn't prioritize his own folks until he had a brand that he wanted our, his folks, as well as others too, of course, but he, he wanted us to get behind his brand. You know what I mean? And and that's the thing that we got to start, like Oni said earlier, we got to start writing these fellas off early and, and just don't pay them no mind again after. 
Yeah. I want to add one. I want to add yeah. one quick thing. One quick thing to this. Yeah, you no. notice how this story talks about how Lavar Ball was trying to be accepted by her parents, but it never indicates whether if this Karen would be acceptable to Lavar Ball's parents. Mm. It's almost like it's almost like she was just or she would because who she is, who she is, she it's would automatically be accepted. You know what I mean? Why wouldn't she be accepted? She uh -huh. has the <laughs> she is she she has the token image of the token look. So of course she would be accepted. So since we ain't on equal planes, the struggle is him being accepted by her white family, not her being accepted by his black one. It's just it's just it's interesting. Yeah, there's just no question that she's accepted by the black folks, but of course. There was some hesitancy about him being accepted by the white folks. It is wild. Um, any last um, any last words on this uh, topic? All right. Yeah. Last night when I when I was covering basketball last night, I was having a conversation with this. He's a Trinidadian guy, and he gave me a quote. He said, "In Trinidad, they have a quote that says, cockroach don't don't go to a foul party. Cockroach have no business at a foul party.' Right." Well, all right. Okay. So, yeah, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end that there. Okay. Only go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say for that, you know, th that's another thing, too. It's like, you know who controls the media, you know, mm -hmm. because they're letting you know it doesn't even matter if, right. uh, if the black parents accepted this white woman or not. You know, like, who cares what they thought? The important thing is, what did the white parents think? What did mm -hmm. the white parents do? You know, like if the black parents had like like it's not even a story, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not like if the black parents were like, yeah, we don't like them white folks, you know, nobody cares. Who cares what you think? You're not white. And 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 it tells you who the audience for this story is already. It's the white people trying to uh, see what other white people are thinking, what other white people are doing, what the important people are doing, you know, uh, like you're not going to tell a story from the perspective of of the animals, you know. Like, well, what does the bird think? You know, nobody cares what the bird thinks. You know, they only care about what the humans think. And right. in the case for white folk, it's only what the white people think. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you don't even hear about his parents. Like, in fact, for this entire like, I don't think I've ever heard of this guy's parents. Like, you just told me that his parents were black. You know, mm -hmm. but that's about all I know about it. KW Don Seven is here. KW Don Sevens in the chat, he says, this is one of the myriad reasons why miscegenation is a no-no for African-centered people. KW Don Seven goes on to say, how do we marry, how do you marry into a group of people that hate your guts ancestrally? And, and I picked up on something here too. This woman, her family is some kind of Polish or something like that, right? Uh, definitely some kind of European, yes, yeah, Slatinsky, right? I mean, these. Anyway, uh, I wonder if those were the good whites. <laughs> uh, those were the uh, Uish too. Right, right, right. And you have to be a special type of stupid to prioritize these folks over your own people, and we have to be a special type of stupid to want to cling to these folks who de who who have shown us their neglect. We have to be stupid to uphold uh, Alonzo Ball. Okay, as a man, as a as a father, cool, he did some stuff, great. But we are, we, you know, we're so desperate to, to hold on to people who have some success because we kind of do this thing where this one dude's success represents us, like the whole group of us across, you know, the whole diaspora or whatever. And it's just not the case. And we have to get off of that, too, by the way. Oni. I want to take issue with that, you know, with the whole thing of, well, as a father, he did. Like, the reality is this. If you, as a father, do not produce a black child, then you are not a good father. You know what <laughs> That's I mean? Good point. Like, good point. Like, like, good like, point, you yes. not produce a black child, you are not a good father, period. That's a good point. Like, like, like because because whatever, because, like, like, let's say if I adopted a white kid, Right. And I give this white kid, you know, like 50 grand. Like, I, I save up my money, even 50 grand. You know, 
And, you know, you might say, hey, you know what? As a father, you did the right thing. You got your kid 50 grand, right? Yeah. It's a white boy. <laughs> 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 it's, not, it's not even like, you know, like, 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 and it's like, you know, you, again, like I said, you know, the thing with us is that we see any, you know, mixed person and we're like, that's a brother, that's a black, you know, like, like, you know, the Obama effect, you know, you're just right. like, hey, you know, that's a, that's a black man, you know? But like, and like, okay, you know, you know, like Obama, you know, he pulled off the, he pulled the Michelle and you was like, okay, you know what I mean? But like, all the same, right? The guy clearly messes with a white woman, right? You done failed your child already. First mm-hmm. thing you were supposed to do was hand your child, uh, if you're a man, if you're a black man, first thing you were supposed to do for your child is hand him half of a black woman's DNA. That's it. You know what I'm saying? That's the first thing you're supposed to do if you're a black woman. First thing you're supposed to do for your black child is hand her half of a black man's DNA. You understand? That's the best DNA you could find. Right? And obviously, you know, you could you could go for the, the best quality black person you could find, sure, but you ain't gonna go. You go to a white woman, you already done failed, you you write, write him off. Black folk looking at this guy like, hey, this is a good example. He's pushing his kids to be entertainers or whatever, right? He's pushing his kids to be athletes, whatever, right? Yeah, okay. But but he's pushing these people so that they can go enrich white folk. Yeah. That's what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. He's enriching white people. His kids are going to be enriching white people. And for us as a black community to celebrate a black man enriching white folk, we got to be out of our minds, you know? That's an excellent point. Matron, you want to add to that? Nah, he said it the way I would have said it, except I would have said we are out of our goddamn mind. Uh, that's another L in the words of Azuliism. Where's Azuliism anyway? Let me drop the link again for those Where's who want to hop on. College, uh, <laughs> college educated women. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. We, we got to talk about some PhD educated women. <laughs> and, and then he'll hop on. Yeah, that's right. That's that's the carrot that he needs, right? Uh, um, yeah, I think we tackled this one. I think everyone did a good job with this topic. I, I thank you guys. Let's move on to Shoot the Breeze number five, and then we'll take a break for Station ID after this one. Um, Shoot the Breeze topic number five is putting the cart before the horse. Can we build a nation with no idea of how to fund it? so to speak and um here's a video so i want you guys what hold on oh crap i did the wrong thing my bad um let me find the link again Um, right so here's the link this is a video we're gonna watch for a few minutes and then we'll talk about it. And that, and that our part, part of ADDI, are there, are there any, any other, other Yakota, Yakota wants, wants to know, to know are, there are there any other, other African country leaders that are on board with ADDI? ADDI is apolitical. We are about creating a strong private sector through collaborations with our brothers and sisters in the private sector in Africa. So yes, we were invited by the kingdom of Asebu. The president of Ghana has reached out to the kingdom to say, because Cape Coast, some of you may not be aware that 80% of the Africans who were taken out of West Africa as slaves, they were pulled into Ghana. They left from two main ports. Cape Coast, they called them castles, we called them dungeons. There was the Cape Coast dungeons, and the Elmina dungeons, those who were taken to North America, the US and Canada, they left out of Cape Coast dungeons. Those who were taken to the Caribbean and South South America, they left left out of the Elmina castle. President Nanado felt very strongly that this very same place that our ancestors last set foot on the African soil, there should be a city of return so the children of Africa can come home and complete the journey. So the children of Africa can stand at the dungeons and look across the, the Atlantic and tell the slavers once and for all 
while you may have won for 400 years, ultimately we are the victors for we would have come back home to Ghana, to Cape Coast, where they last set foot on the African soil. So the kingdom of Asebu, having heard about ADDI, they dispatched one of their chiefs to come to, to the United States, met with me and the ADDI team, and officially asked us to partner with them to realize the wishes of the president, which is the establishment of the Wakanda City of Return in Cape Coast, Ghana. Nice. It is a city that is fitting. We have had invitations to various countries. We were supposed to have gone to Zambia before COVID. Before COVID, we had eight countries already lined up. But because of that, we had to just lay low for now. But now that COVID is beginning to look a little better, we are going to be cranking it up. And yes, we are going to go to just about as many African countries as we can. For now, we are having a regional approach. First is Ghana. The next one is going to be either in Zambia or Kenya, whichever one. We already have land in Zambia, but Kenya is coming in strong as well. We have a strong group of Kenyans. We have organized, they've identified a university setting with a hospital and a teaching hospital. We are looking for centers that are already building the capacity. We're looking to partner with them, increase the capacity, and begin to build the centers of excellence regionally and with due course uh, nationally as well. And the goal of the Wakanda One Cities will be to establish a city where pe that li people live and thrive and work and have a strong economic base. But I imagine there's also, there will also be a tourism sector. Am I correct? Oh, big time. In fact, phase one of the Wakanda City of Return is a welcome center. It's going to have a 500-bed hotel, 200 chalets, uh, 1,000 homes. Um, the 1,000 homes are going to be an extension from the 40 acres that are on the beach. Uh, a, a, a short mini uh, shopping center. There's also going to be a museum. The museum is going to be a living museum that we hope that it will take people through a journey of a little girl who left home in Ivory Coast to fetch water and she gets captured and she never comes home again. We will follow her journey through the forest. Some never made it to, to, uh, to the dungeons. Some, they died, with got sick, they got mauled by the lions. We're gonna follow that little girl. And if she makes it, how she stayed in the dungeons, through the feces and the urines where they were packed like sardines, through the entry into the door of no return, the transatlantic journey, the raping, the abuse, the torture, we're gonna show it all. We will take you through the journey of what our ancestors went through. But more importantly, we will show you how evil these people are and why reparations must be paid. Ambassador. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to share your comments below and So earlier in the video too, there's a part that you didn't see where they, they were talking about the brain drain out of Africa and et cetera. But then they go into this conversation of building this Wakanda. By the way, what, what, what kind of shit is that, right? In the words of Only to say, like, what, why would you name this shit Wakanda? Like, it just seems unserious, right? But they were talking about brain drain and stuff like that and how people leave the continent to go to greener pastures elsewhere. Well, if, that, if you understand that and you know that, then how are you going to build this so-called Wakanda nation, right, without being able to keep people around to build it and then to maintain it, right? So this prompt says, are they putting the cart before the horse, right? How can we build this so-called nation? Like Tito District just said, she said, Wakanda 1 sounds like a Disney World resort. Uh, how can we build this nation without any idea on how to fund it? And now Oni has to go, so I'm going to start with Oni on for, um, for this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll stay for the, for, the, for the remainder of this question. But, uh, you know, actually, this is pretty interesting. I'm reading Wealth of Nations right now, and I just reached to the part where 
he talks about wages of labor and basically why or why if why would wages why would wages be high and he was saying that if a nation is growing that's when wages are high so realistically speaking if we are about developing our people right uh, at least if you're going by this this book, which you don't really have to, but right. if you're going by this book, by this, the theory is that realistically, if you're developing your nation, your wages will become higher. You know, uh, and and I mean, I'm not going like I feel like uh, ADDI as well as you know any African who's really looking to to develop our people economically understand, or or I would say that. It's there, like the, the concept is there, that if you're really trying to uh, assist our people, right, that you have, to, you have to develop us economically. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's going to be putting the cart before the horse if you're, if you're focusing on econ economics, you know? Economics is the horse, you know, is the horse. Um. Yeah, but they're not focusing on 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 economics, really, right? They're just talking about building something, and then and again, like I said before, this where the clip picked up here is, is after they were talking about the brain drain from the continent. Uh, Matron, what says you to this prompt? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are they putting the cart before the horse? Um, and how, uh, yes, is the answer to that question. How can we build a nation with no idea how to fund it? We don't understand money as a group, okay? And when I say that, I, I, um, I'll say this. All right now, I want to also say shout out to my favorite nephew, M. Chuck. Uh, he's in the chat. But um, we don't understand money as a group. We don't understand that the only reason their money has value to us is because we say so. Like we talk about fiat money, but we don't really go about and take that next step and assign value to the different things that we do. We don't say, you know what, the only reason money exists is because it made it easier to um, materialize and carry with you the wealth that you had. And we forget things like letters of credit and, you know, letters that establish the fact that you have the ability to be in this area spending this money because somebody would eventually settle out the deal, the, the debt, whether it's with labor or other resources. We don't understand how to barter and how we can translate bartering into a global economic uh on a global economic scale to create an economy that's much more equitable and appreciable for us as black equals African people. We don't understand enough about how money works, but we have knowledge, skills, and ability. But because we're still looking at their dollars and we're still looking at their money, we have taken our eyes off of our gold and off of the value we have on the inside of ourselves. So when, when I look at how can we build a nation with no idea how to fund it, the thing is this, you have to recapture the consciousness of a people's mind so that they understand that they are the money and that their human capital is worth more than any of the tangible things that they think they're going to get and or receive and that they're not building for themselves and for today. They are building for tomorrow. Uh, and Chaka in the chat earlier, uh, he said you can fund uh, via a pan-African focused DAO. That's uh, that DAO has to do with decentralized um, monies, I think. Um, Tito District says only governments can issue money, so how can they be apolitical? Earlier, she said that the fact that she said a the fact that it was stated of, as being apolitical is a red flag. Um, Kevin Carre, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, the matron said it all, <laughs> the matron okay. said it all. Uh, Mr. Untouchable, what say you? Okay, um. Several facets of this 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 scenario, because when I initially sent you this video, I was kind of excited about the idea, but you being a pragmatist, you you put some coal in my stocking, <laughs> and and really considering that. Remember now, this is a city. This is not this is not necessarily a nation. 
But you did have a valid point when you suggested that even a city, there should be a, an economy built around that. See, in 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 cities like let's say a place like Atlanta or or even Detroit. Detroit had their um, automobile industry, mm -hmm. where the city was built around that economy. Right. And and you have places like um, Atlanta, or you have a lot of colleges in Atlanta. You had a lot of um, Coca Cola and things like that. They, that's the economy that kind of keeps that that city really functioning and self sustaining. And for this particular place, I am. Um, here's where I am with this. I don't know what exactly the economy is gonna look like because if you say, see, I live in a leisure economy right now in, in Nassau, Bahamas. Our economy primarily is tourism. Yeah. So if you say that the economy of that's what kind of city is going to be tourism, then I can understand how you're going to sell that idea. You know, we're going to say, but <laughs> the problem with that is the problem with that is then you, you basically saying that all of your dollars is going to come from the diaspora, primarily the United States, the Caribbean and maybe the, the South American countries, if they have that expendable cash, yeah, but really, okay. primarily, really primarily United States. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that if you, because, and I understand why they're doing it. I understand why they would try to do something like that. Because after the, um, what what's the thing for Ghana? They call it the call, when they was trying to call back to all the, what's the name of it? They had a name, a phrase for it. The, um, um, right uh, return. The year of return? Year of return. Yeah. The year of return, the remittances from people from the diaspora was really into the billions of dollars. So I'm saying, I'm thinking that people looked at that idea and said, well, hey, there is a market for this. So these people are going to really, <laughs> really gamble on the fact that there is going to be a continuous market mm -hmm. where people will flow in and fund the idea of slave slavery tourism <laughs> really and truly it's like they be coming back you be coming back to look at the dungeon well, I, I didn't it might it might bring in a whole lot of money that 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 economy might bring in a whole lot of money continuously i don't know i really don't know so i think that they would need as far as the city goes is really to invest in other kinds of industries rather than just slave tourism that's a real risk that you take in because the market that you're looking into, there are many African Americans and people from the diaspora who want to look back and discover their roots and have the monies to, to come back and do that. But they have the majority who might not necessarily look at things in that kind of way. The majority might look at them and themselves as distinct and different from. And for you to have a city built around just that idea, you are taking a big risk. So I would really look at other industries. But if you want to do it as a tourism thing, man, you, you need to come patronize, look at tourism economies and, and try to see what we do here in the Caribbean and other places and build it around that. There's mm -hmm. another thing I want, wanted to talk about, but you didn't go into it. So I'll just leave it alone as far as the brain drain is concerned. But I'll just leave that, that portion of it alone. Well... Yeah, because where where this video picked up from, you know, when you shared it with me, it yeah. picks up at, at this point. But I went back oh. after, oh, I went okay. back after and looked at the whole video. Oh, okay. and that's where the yes. the brain yeah, drain the brain stuff comes. Into, up yeah, from. yeah. I thought, I thought, um, I thought I um, sent the whole video, but no, no worries, man. For time constraints, I understand. Yeah, but here's a question for you guys: Before I let Oni and, and the matron or whoever else wants to. Uh, Want to say something again? Is it a good look for an African country, Ghana in this case, to want to build a city? That's my ice machine making noise in the back, as you know. To want to build a city around around our ancestors' enslavement? No, <laughs> that is. What, I'm sorry. No, it's not. How many and? The propaganda against the idea of a slave uh, tourism economy has already 
started to be talked against, right? Like when uh, you would see members of diaspora saying things like, I don't want to watch another slave movie. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And another thing that we have to look at is the Britons do not reference the lowest point in their history and say, this is who we are. Right. They are always ascending to their high culture. And that's one of the reasons why I, I am trying to focus on us having an opportunity to bring up the lowest swaths and the consciousness um, of the low parts of our culture. Our high culture has to go back and meet that and bring them up so that our average, our bar, our standard is set a little bit higher. Because what's really true is that they look to the people that are a byproduct of a reasonably medium point in our history and in our culture. They look back to the civil rights. They look back to the black middle class. They look back to the black innovators and things like that. And these Negroes want to go back and say, but we slaves, we American descendants of slavery. These Negroes want to go back and say, I want to visit the capital. So I'll Elena or El Camino or whatever. These Negroes go back and say, I want to talk about the tree that I ran around seven times. These Negroes don't even want to go back to the Haitian Revolution and say, no, we fought for our freedom and we came together. They don't want to go back to their maroon heritage. These Negroes want to go back and say, but we, uh, we are American descendants of slavery, which ties you to your lowest point and the time at which the person projecting reality onto you was their most powerful because they controlled everything about you and you let them. And if that's not an asking, uh, if that's not them asking to be recolonized, re-enslaved, re-indebted to people that treated them harshly, I don't know what is. So no, 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 no. All right. Yeah, no. but, but, but I got to present another side to this. You know what I mean? Because the majority of blacks in the West are Christian people and they believe in this idea of this person named Jesus Christ who died in Jerusalem wherever 2,000 years ago. And many of them, blacks in the West, take trips to Jerusalem to go dig, dig around searching for his gravesite and his tomb and all that good stuff. So they, if they could go back 2,000 years looking for their Messiah, why not go back 400 years looking for their ancestors? I'm just asking the question. Honestly, I'm going to say this. I really think that um, this is more of an invention of like the for what you were talking about, that the Hebrew Israelites, if we could trust them, they would be an interesting group of people to partner with economically with uh, the Nation of Islam or the Fruit of Islam and the Hebrew Israelites to facilitate that type of tourism, because then those those two groups together could confess about slavery and the shit that they did to black equals African people, right? Like that would be an inventive way to take this economy and encompass the slave experience and then swirl in their religious, you know, fixation and fetishism and, and for us to make some money. That's an economy. I, yeah. Okay. Let's do that. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I hear you. Uh, it, it, for me, it's just it's a, it's a it's a discussion on both ends, and the person, like I say, Koku, what I was telling you initially, some Black Americans, like my sister Matron, she she does she she probably would not want us to spend her expendable money right. into something like that idea. And these mm -hmm. are the people who they are gonna petition and and ask to come to do see. So it's a big risk. <laughs> yeah, a bit, there are gonna be people who are gonna go anyways. But there are gonna be people with with matrons philosophy and ideas like the hell no. So it's it's for me it's just a very big gamble. If you just build that idea completely around that particular economy, that's a big risk. And I'm I'm a, I'm risk. I, I'm a person who take risk. You know I'm not risk averse. Say well you know I would never take any risk. I believe in risk. But you hear the people you hear people like matron who commented on that idea already, and there are probably many people who think along those lines. So it's a big risk. I, I, I feel you. Oni, what says you? On mute. Yeah, so, yeah, I want to add. Um, yeah, I feel, I'll, I mean, all right, so there's two things. One is that I thought, like, originally I thought ABDI has, like, engineering ambitions, you know? So, so when I thought about them having an economy, I, like I understand they had meetings with engineers, they had meetings with scientists, they had meetings with these kind of things. So, 
I, I'm not too, uh, like, I don't know about this, but as far as this, what, I, what we heard in this clip is concerned, uh, yeah, I feel like, like, I mean, I, you know, that this lady, I, I like this lady, right? But I feel like she's not reading the room. She was not selling that tourism at all. Um, I, like, it sounded like what, like, I, like, for instance, this Afropunk in Brooklyn, right? It used right. to be free. And then it started being paid, and it still got people to show up because, realistically speaking, black folk want a party. You know, black people will spread around, hey, I had this nice party. The idea that she just gave of, like, a little girl being kidnapped and then brutalized as an adult <laughs> is not something that, you know, is going to be pop. Like, I don't think it's going to be popping. Like, it's possible. Like, I don't know. But I feel like like somebody done told her the wrong thing. You know, like, if she... Because I feel like the year of return had a positive vibe. And it right. Was, uh, like, it sounded like a party. Like, you know, you might be there and you're like, hey, let's do this again next year. Right. I don't think anything like that is the same with, hey, I saw this horrific thing where a little girl got mutilated. Um, you know, like, no. I mean... I get that that's a part of our story, and I get that, you know, one of the things she ended with was, we're going to let them know how terrible these other people are, and that's great, but I don't think that's a selling point, you know no. what I mean? Like, you could you could put that in there, you know? But it's kind of it's kind of like, I mean, like, maybe not using Malcolm X as an example, but it's kind of like if you said, you know, hey, the keynote speaker is going to be... Uh, I don't know. Are the keynote singer is going to be Beyonce, right? And then people are like, "Yeah, let's show up." And then Malcolm X speaks right before her. That's like how you would do it, you know. But like the whole idea of you know, and I mean Malcolm X is a good guy, so I'm not going to say that you know Malcolm X couldn't fill a room because he probably could. But like, like the the the, I would just say, yeah, you 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 know, like I like this lady, like she shouldn't have been the first publicist, you know, because uh, because when she when she was describing that scene. I was kind of like, you know, like, I mean, I don't know if I would go to that part. Like, the hotel looked nice, you know, the, the this looked nice, you know, maybe there's a party going on. That sounds like it's something, but, uh, but yeah, like, her selling it on, uh, selling tourism on, you get to watch this documentary that's really brutal and vicious, or no, this play you. that's really brutal and vicious, nah. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, I just want to, ask right because i haven't been to the continent yet but would any of you knowing that this was the core part of the experience that they were highlighting you know these tours and that you got to maybe even walk through um a town pre-colonization and you got to walk through another part of the town like westworld westworld is this thing was a show that my friend introduced me to years ago where they have all these different simulated realities that you can right. experience right would you go to to i'm sorry i don't mean to be yelled would you go <laughs> would you go back to the continent if a part or the predominant part of your experience was to literally walk through and experience the different stages of slavery? Or does that sound to you like something that Eurasians with their fetishes would want to go and experience? And, and would that then make you divest from the continent because it's like, who the hell are these people? What are they talking about? So I just, I, I'm asking that of everybody on the panel. So no. for me, okay. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just say this quickly. For me, it, it's a bad look. And I, I've talked about this on the show before, maybe even during the Shoot the Breeze. I'm not a big fan of these dungeons being, um, being sold out events and ticketed and all that. I'm, just not a fan of it. It's it feels like you're taking advantage of 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 you know this history that happened to my ancestors. So I'm 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 really not big on that stuff. And to build a whole city around that now, uh, no, I'm not I'm I'm not too keen on that. I don't want to go and walk through nothing and see no ancestor, a potential ancestor of mine, or or a representative of an ancestor of mine suffering. You know, Mr. Untouchable, go ahead. No, I, I'm saying I, I would say no, based off of how how um 
Matron framed framed that idea. No. And even if it was an actual idea, I wouldn't want to go. But <laughs> I, I think that the problem is, the problem is Dr. Aracana is trying to be mo too many things at, once. In, at one time. Mm -hmm. There in a, any any organization, you have the CEO, you have the 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 um, CFO, you have people who do specifically have different functions. Dr. Aracana is not a salesperson. She is a Pan-African diplomat. She deals with trying to um, organize around ideas of Pan-Africanism and things like that. She is not a seller. So she, she should not be in a situation where she is trying to sell that idea or some, something even close to that idea. She, should, she, they, she needs to defer to someone else who have the training and the skill to present that idea much better because it might not even necessarily be what she proposed. And that's if, if that's what she proposed, it's terrible. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. They need to go back to the drawing board and re reframe and rephrase and to try to change how you would that sound, sound to different kinds of ears. But she is not a seller and she should not be in a position to be doing something like that. That's what I feel the biggest problem is with that idea. Um, by the way, um, Matron, you're cool, man. Uh, you, you could shout, you could curse, you could swear. This YouTube, they don't, they ain't, they ain't, they ain't tripping on that like that. Uh, who else wants to, yeah. to speak? Uh, what did I want to say about this? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, this is the thing. Here's the most outrageous part. So I'm in Ghana, right? You know that as an African of the diaspora, going to, I can't remember which one I went to. It might have been, but I think it was like a fort. I was kind of see if I was actually went to Elmina or not. But yeah, it was like a fort. And you as an African of the diaspora have to pay more God damn. to go to this site, like more than a Ghanaian citizen. And it's like, damn, first my citizenship was strict, right? And it's like, you know what, I'm cool with that. I get it. You know, the nation came much after I left, right? But then on top of that, I have to pay more, right? Uh, uh, yeah, and then, and then like, 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 like I tell you, because like that experience, like I went to one of these dungeons, and that experience is not at all good, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, I mean, the way how, like, because you're standing behind this person who you're like, you know, you're not on the ADOS side or nothing, but you're still like, why this motherfucker wasn't kidnapped? <laughs> like, you mean I went through all this shit? This guy just walking around and and you know and I don't know if people know this, but like people in Africa, a lot of people in Africa are cool with white folk. And 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 here's the thing: if you you cool with white folk, but you got this whole dungeon there, letting you know these people was no good in the con on the continent. Now, obviously, like 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 my thinking is they didn't go through the things that we went through. Right. When we came, like they don't know that side, they don't know that experience, right? So they they can only relate in the sense of, oh well, somebody, you know, somebody was kidnapped. Okay, that's not that's not even the beginning of it. You know what I mean? Uh, in fact, there was this one uh, an aunt person was like, "How do you make it seem like we don't know? I mean, we lost our brothers." It's like, no, you don't understand. I lost my freaking home for <laughs> four hundred years. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And then I come back. I don't got no citizenship. I'm getting charged more. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like, and then now you talk about, oh, well, well, like, like she should have said, hey, you know what? This is a popping party exclusive for people in the diaspora. Because I'd have been like, yeah, that's what's up. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, that's what's up. You mean, you mean like, 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 you know, you know, uh, we're gonna have all these, you know, these celebrities and blah blah blah. We're gonna have a performance for you guys. We're gonna have a celebration with you guys. Like that makes more sense. You say, hey, man, we're gonna show you how we got dragged, how you got dragged to the dirt. No, well, like, <laughs> we're gonna charge you. You know, we want you know for you to generate this economy, we're gonna charge. Like, no, that was the wrong person. Yeah. She went in there. Like, she a good lady. I like her. You know what I mean? Like, she one of my favorite. But like that video you showed, it was like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not good. Not good. Any last words for this prompt from anyone? Um, as a, a a wise man once said, the wise man called Erzoism more trauma, more L's too. 
Yeah, I, I personally think, because let me try to put a good spin on this. I personally think that the year of return was a very good idea. I think that these people are trying to build on that idea, but they are they, they are going about it in the wrong way because to Western ears is registering in a very horrible way. So I think it would be good to to bring in or possibly try to speak to, you know, people from the diaspora, you know, in particular the places where you're going to try to get solicit the, the amount of your economy from and and try to get some advice, some better advice. That's that's what I would do. If I got that fly in the mail for this shit here, I'm tearing that shit up. Quite frankly. I'm I'm just going to say this like um and this is where uh biblical allegory is useful. There's a story about the prodigal son right? The prodigal son wanted his inheritance. Now he left home, this, this, that, and the other. That's not the part of the story that's important. The part of the story that's important is that when the father saw the prodigal son, and there are many stories in the Bible that have this particular moment. When you see someone that is of your people, even if they have wronged you, when you see them coming and they are coming to be reconciled to you, right? You celebrate them. You do not remind them of the things that happened in a painful way in an attempt to build your economy. You give them gifts. Like you got, like everyone has said, the year of the return, it had a different vibe. There was a different energy. They are talking about, as I understood this brief, uh, clip was it was you know there's going to be a documentary and we're going to show them why they owe us rep everybody knows what these terrorist tyrant cracker ass crackers did we everybody know the story and i see and understand that it could be useful in fact to have this thing documented so that um there's evidence entered in court and all these uh, fine but that should not be the seminal focus of an experience that a diasporan has to pay premium price to. And then you're not even talking about building other economies. It will be great. You know, like I've heard her and I love her too. Like I, I really, she's one of my favorite people. Right. Um, and they're talking about hospitals and they're talking about other things, but like the, the mind share, the knowledge transmission, the communication of what the tourism economy would even be, because this shouldn't even be a central focus of the tourism economy on the continent when there are so many other things and ideas that we can use and have you know whether it's on the Serengeti we can go build some zip line and you go mount it's it's other stuff to do besides trying to highlight this experience as a tourism industry uh hypothetical question to the final what if they you what if they said they wanted to create this slave tourism to infuse capital and that capital will then kickstart an economy and that economy will be used to build, you know, the, you know, will be used towards like nationhood in the future. How would you respond to that? Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, see, that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, that's what I think it's about. But like, again, you have to like you have to like I said, you got to you got to you got to like this. Whenever you go to an event, there's the, the header and there's the other people. You know what I mean? Like, I went to a KRS concert, I believe, and there were other people there. Right. But you don't lead with like you lead with KRS. It was a KRS concert. You could have everybody and anything else. But. If you're asking me, because remember, these trips are not cheap, right? If you're asking me to shell out $3,000, right, mm-hmm. I better be getting $3,000 worth of stuff. And if you're telling me I could, I would fly over to Africa to watch something I could have watched at home that I wouldn't have watched at home anyway, no. You know what I mean? Like, like, like I mean, I, I'm not going to, I, I would still support, you know what I mean? Because I support my people. Right, but I, but I, but if this thing goes under, I know damn why. You know, a lot of times what we do as people is that we we mess up at the drawing board. Right. You know, right. uh, that you know, Dr. Leonard Jeffrey says we mess up at the negotiation table, but like realistically speaking, we mess up at the drawing board. 
you know, this is quote unquote capitalism, you know, capitalism free market. You know, this is a free market idea. You 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 come to the market, you know, you saw the year return, you said, Wow, these black folk really wanted to connect with their continent. Let's let's see. Why do they want to connect? Well, maybe because they want a slave ship. No, that's not why we did that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like we thought it was a bunch of black folk welcoming us, and we were like, Yeah, fuck yeah, like that's what we would pay for. You know what I mean? That's what you pay for. You don't pay more, you know, well shit, you know, you want to know about slavery? Well shit, I got you. Like, no, we don't. We want to connect with our people, right? We want to feel like we're those people. We don't want to be reminded. And I mean, I mean, look, maybe it works. Like I said, it's free market stuff. Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's going to work out. And, you know, it don't mean nothing. But as far as I'm concerned, right now, I'm just like, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a, like I would go just to support, like if I had the money. Uh, but, but otherwise, you know, no, by the way, I want to tell the panel that, uh, you know, it's, it's a pleasure being here, but I, I'm probably going to dip after this, uh, question. Um, Mr. Untouchable, you, um, wanted to discuss the part that wasn't shown the part about the brain drain. What did you want to say about the brain drain part of oh. the conversation? Oh, before I go into that, I, I, in listening to, to, to my brothers in, in America, who are from there? Who are, who are living there right now? I, if I was, if I was the team that was coming up with this idea of building a city, I would try to measure twice and cut once. So I, I would try to go to the people who are actually going to spend the most, the majority of the money, and try to see if they could um, uh, renegotiate this idea. Um, as far as the brain drain, the brain drain that. Um, Doc, Dr. Arakana talked about how many people, doctors in particular, were leaving Africa and coming to the West, you know, particularly because of the economics of it, you know, and I understand that. But my, if, if, and, and what she said was that per capita, there are so little doctors in, in Africa, you know, you, you, you understand why they have so many, um, uh, medical issues of diseases and all these other things. And my 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 solution to that really would be to petition Cuba. I, I don't understand why more, more African countries don't go to Cuba because the doctors are there, they have as just as good a medical education as any Western doctor. The, the only issue is they are they don't have the um the things, the, the 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 modern day things that some of so the Western countries have, but the, the mindset and and the fact that these doctors go all over the world right now, you know, have been for a very long time. I, I would just petition the Cuban government to to um, to try to see whether you could you know possibly bring in either Cuban black Cuban doctors or build the, these medical ideas in the different African countries where you could reproduce the, the, these kinds of doctors within the countries. And the idea of them leaving, you have to remember, Castro was in power for more than 50 years. So generally, generationally, he created a mindset within, within the young people coming up after him. So they don't necessarily have a the buy concept, you know, they, they have this socialized medicine kind of thing. So you got to train these kinds of people, them from very young, you know, and 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 try to introduce these kinds of ideas into your society. And maybe you would have more more doctors stay within your community because these people, the, the Cuban doctors don't have Western tastes. So they wouldn't necessarily want to run to the West to try to get the buy because they don't have the Western taste, you know. But um, that was just my thinking in trying to resolve the issue of the shortage and the brain drain and the fact that so many African doctors from Ghana and Nigeria are living and practicing in in, um, in the West. Yeah, I, I just don't, yeah, I, and I feel you and I hear you on that. I just don't think this idea, this Wakanda one city is the way to generate the economy to get yes, those yes. doctors back or to, to, to retain those doctors in those countries i, I no, just don't i try, think I, try to, I i think that i think that why wakanda is a really a, i think that's a tourism idea and but i was trying to separate because the two ideas i feel like they could be separated 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Because one one idea don't necessarily have nothing to do with another. But but that was just my thinking and, and um, trying to yeah. elicit a response from you because I really wanted to know what you thought about the video and um and, and the rest of the panelists. Right. Um Oni, I know you're leaving. Uh we we're, we're gonna take a station ID in a second and then continue the second half of the show. Oni, what's going on with you tomorrow? Two things. Obviously, we're gonna have worship. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna have a Sunday African worship. Uh, I'm gonna just review a paper that I've written a while back, and it kind of relates to the spaces that we had uh, uh, last week. And so we're also gonna do a spaces. Uh, we're gonna discuss uh, whether or not black, well, whether or not feminism is assisting or harming black women. So definitely, for those of you who are not on Twitter, uh, I think you can still listen to the spaces, even if you don't have a Twitter account. So just uh, follow any one of us on KWAZ Radio. We're all going to be there, and we're going to be discussing some topic. And if the topic grows, it grows. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, if it it changes to another topic, then it changes to another topic. Uh, As well, yeah, and, and it'd be nice to hear from everybody who's listening. Uh, also, like it was pointed out, I got, was it, 901 subscribers. So, you know, if anybody isn't subscribed and wants to see uh, a, a brother make it to 1,000, you know, definitely put your, you know, put your bid in. But other than that, yeah, that's pretty much uh, the entirety of uh, what's going on for tomorrow. All right, we appreciate you. Um, <clears throat> we'll be in the house tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And, of course, Matron and myself, you, and the Hush Valley Podcast will be in that space tomorrow. Well, I would like to see everyone here in tomorrow evening space. I think that space is, what, 7 p.m. tomorrow? Eastern Standard I Time? I think it's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Oh, it's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'd like to see all of you guys in the house. Uh if you have to join Twitter just to be there, that that's fine too. Uh, only thanks for being here. Uh, we'll right. see you in the morning. We'll see you in the uh, and and we'll see you tomorrow evening. All right. All right, man. Thanks. All right. Thanks. All right. Um, any last words on this prompt from anyone else on the panel? All right. So what we're gonna do now? We're going. I'm gonna do a station ID break. We haven't had a break this whole time that we've been on. So we're going to do Station ID break, and when we come back, we'll do the second half and finish off the uh, Saturday night shoot debris. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast, asking you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. Also, by the way, um, we are trying to get more shows on KWAZ Radio uh, starting in this uh, the, in the new Roman year, so to speak. So here's something to listen to as well. Have you ever considered joining KWAZ Radio? Each of our hosts shares their unique perspective with you. You might have a perspective that needs to be shared. If that's true, hit us up at kwaz.radio at gmail.com. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What you going to do? You know, I just want to add something too. Um, you know, there's scrolling on the screen. There's the donate 
um, thing about donating to the show. All proceeds will be used to improve the show, of course. But I also want to say that, you know, those of you who have skills and, and the time, um, um, you could donate some of your abilities as well. Like right now, we're trying to get the KWAZ Radio's webpage going. And if you're if you have experience with designing and building web pages, um, give us a little bit of your time. You know, in lieu of donations, you give us some of your time just to get that going. So there's things you can do in lieu of uh, putting up dollars, right? If you have those skills that you can that you can loan us your your, your time, that'll be appreciated as well. Um, so let's get into. The next Shoot the Breeze topic, I want to thank you guys again for being here. I want to thank Oni Tase from the Pro-Back Perspective for joining us for the first half of the Shoot the Breeze tonight. We are going to Shoot the Breeze topic number six. It's why it's, It says, why do you foster and adopt white kids? You already know this is going to be some bullshit. So let's, um, let's get the link and... We'll watch some of this video. I want to remind you guys that I know Shoot the Breeze, you know, it was a couple of hours long, but at the same time, we ain't got time to sit here and watch a 30-minute video. Yeah. Sorry. We ain't got time to sit here and watch a 30-minute video. So try to, when you put these stories up, add a article, like a newspaper article, you know, like a a web page or whatever link to read the article or if it's a video let's try to keep it to five minutes or so right um you know five seven minutes whatever that's fine but 30 minutes we can't do that um so this topic here um this video says why do you foster and adopt white kids it's a 26 minute video i can't play all of it so i'm just gonna play a bit of it and then we'll have a discussion about it afterwards um, it doesn't matter what, where they, where they come from. That every child needs a home. Every child need, needs a safe place. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never have to miss any of our videos. We love your comments and questions. I always try to answer as many as I can, but sometimes they're too many. So I thought of an idea. I created this episode so I can answer most of the common questions you've asked. Things like, why do your kids wear sunglasses? To, why do you foster and adapt white kids? Well, watch as I answer all your questions. Why do some of your kids wear glasses everywhere? Well, why? So here's the rule. With foster care children, we have to protect their privacy. We have to keep some of who they are to protect them, but also to protect their parents as well. And remember, some of them go to school and sometimes we don't want um, their fellow schoolmates or places they go, YMCA to, Know them. Not like it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to know them. Sometimes they get teased or bullied for being foster kids. So to protect them, we always are required by the state or agencies to protect um, their privacy. So that's why they wear glasses. And by the way, they don't wear glasses all the time. Only when we are taking pictures so we can show the media, or when we're doing vlogs. That's when they wear glasses and masks. But usually they don't. Only if it's an event or we're taking something that we're going to put on the social media. Because we know we want to protect their, their privacy. So that's why they wear glasses. But once, once they're adopted, they don't have to wear glasses. For my 17-year-old, uh, also once he's cleared for adoption, he doesn't have to. It's up to him. But for me as a parent, I'm required to protect their privacy. Why do kids go back to their parents? Why don't they, why don't you adopt them? Why do they have to go back? Here's how I understand force care. To be a force care, basically you're saying, 
while mom and dad cannot take care of their kids, while they are fixing their problem or they are dealing with their issues all day in jail and they are serving their time, while they are away, I will take care of their babies. That's what literally false care means. These kids, well, are protected or are being in the care of the state. So the state is looking for someone to say, hey, while we are trying to work with the parents to deal with whatever they're dealing with, we want someone to be a parent or we want someone to take care of this kid. And so that's why we come in for us as false, as false parents. Fostering means you are standing in the gap when the biological parents cannot. That means that when they get back to where they need to or they are responsible to care of the kids, they take back their kids. That's the whole intention. You know, the whole intention is, on, is not so they can get adapted, but rather that while mom and dad are dealing with whatever they're dealing with and they prove that they can keep the kids safe and loving home, then the kids usually go back, which is the good thing. And also, too, like I, <clears throat> it's easy to judge the parents. It's easy to say, how dare them? Well, we've all gone through diff difficult things. We've all done something. Some of us maybe haven't been caught, or some of you are the loves to make a difference among the kids, the loves the most vulnerable. Yeah, I think I'll say, sure. But for now, I'm content just being a dad. Being a dad, yes, by choice. I chose to be a dad. Being single, hmm. my kids didn't hear that. They, they did not hear that, that I'm searching, looking for, <clears throat> yeah. Will you take in more kids in future? Will I? Do I? Absolutely, yes. I would love to take in kids. At the moment, I'm max up to four. Usually they give you kids by how many bedrooms or how many you can afford in your house. Or not you can afford in your house, but how many can you accommodate in your house? Usually that's how each state, you know, it says different. Each county is different. For me, you know, I have four bedrooms, so that means I can house or I can accommodate four kids. If I had a bigger house, absolutely. I think I would love to take in more teenage boys. I take in girls as well, but there's always a condition. So here's why. I have teenagers. I want to make sure that they have time with that. They have every opportunity to be kids. But at the same time, as a single dad, I also have to be absolutely careful and thoughtful to who I bring in my house or to who I take in. Think about, you got a 14-year-old ranging with hormones and you have another 14 girl in the same house. Mm, no. If they come with sisters and if they are little, if they are younger, uh, it's a little easier for me. For example, like the ones I have today, the five-year-old is a boy and the Six-year-old is, is a girl, and I didn't want to separate them, so I had to take them both because they're little, um, and I wanted to be there for them. What do you do for work? Money. Hmm. Or is fostering your full-time job? Well, what do I do for work? Yes, I am a hustler. I do lots of work. I speak, you know, and that gives me an opportunity to be able to be an advocate for kids. So I speak on behalf of World Vision. You know, that's why I work as a part-time job. But also, when people invite me at churches or <laughs> kids, partner, do their dad want a wife? <clears throat> no, not at all. Not at all. I've had 16 kids. None of them has ever come to me and say, Peter, oh, dad, I wish there was a mom. I wish we had a mom. No, you know, as I said, most kids are looking for a safe place. And most cases... Most of them haven't had a dad in, in their lives. And so to come to me, having a dad, I think they really enjoy that. You know, they enjoy to have a dad. We are all humans, but we are all responsible for taking care of our kids in every bus, in every way possible. You know, being vulnerable, that we can be there. Being tender, that we can be there. Being mean, that we can be there. So my kids have never asked yeah, some days when it comes to meals. I think sometimes when they visit some places, they're like, oh, she cooked a good meal. Dad, you should Google the recipe. I'm like, mm -hmm. sure, I'll text that person where you just had a meal. And then uh, she might teach me how to make it. But most of them, they do it for fun. The two, it also helps me to know what they love to eat. 
and also what I can learn. So I go to these moms and say, my son is crazy about your meals. So could you teach me or could you give me the recipe on how you made that meal? And usually they love it when I try. But it's not like they're asking for a mom, no. They're just asking, some people cook better than you. Yes, I agree, I'm not the best cook. But I try my best to truly do the best I can. Why do you foster white children? Hmm. I'm thinking how to answer this. Let me see. Well, I'll go back. <clears throat> so, as a kid, when I was uh, astray and I didn't have parents and I was on the streets of Kampala, a stranger walked in my life. He didn't ask me where I came from. He didn't ask me uh, what language I spoke. He didn't ask me who, me who my parents were. He didn't ask me why I was on the streets. He just loved me as a kid. He saw a kid that had every potential to be someone. He saw a kid that at his lowest, he was still a special kid. He saw a kid that needed to be loved. He saw a kid that wanted a home. He saw a kid that wanted family. And that's how he took me in. So for me, when I became a foster parent, I, I came with the same mind, you know, that I will love every child no matter who they are. Think of the foster kids. You know, it's not like they come there for holiday. It's not like they are there to have a good time. Every kid that comes in foster care is something tremendous bad that has happened in their lives. They've been neglected. Sometimes they've been sexually abused by their families. Sometimes they've been physically abused. Sometimes they've been neglected that they have not eaten food in days and weeks. So again, I'm not comparing myself to a nurse or a doctor, but think about when, when a doctor or a nurse, when someone walks in, you know, when they are sick, they don't ask, wait, what color are you? You know, where do you come from? They treat the patient, you know? And I think for me, the same attitude I have towards kids, I go in to be there for the kids who have been put in the places that they did not choose to be in, that they are vulnerable, that they need to be cared for, and they need to be loved. That's how I became force right. Also, just like that man did not ask where I came from, I'm just spoke. The same way I want to love every child in the force game. That when I open my house, I open a house for every kid. As I said, they don't come to the force care because it's holiday. They come there because there's a great need and they need to be in a safe place. So you tell me. Social worker on the other end called, hey, say, Peter, do you have a home? There's a kid at the hospital that have nowhere to go. Do you prefer, I would say, Yes, I do have an extra bedroom. Yes, I can take in a child. But wait a minute, what race are they? Oh, no, 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 that one I can't take. Do you see, would that be right? Oh, at three in the morning, I get a phone call saying, Hey, there's a little girl that has been neglected for days. He's not eaten. And he's looking for a place to stay. I mean, should I say, I mean, I have a place. Yes, I have a home. Yes, I have a, an extra bed. But if they don't look like me, I don't think I can help them. Do, could that be right? No. As foster parents, I signed to take care of every vulnerable children. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter what, where they come from. But every child needs a home. Every child need, needs a safe place.
And that's why I'm a foster dad to all kids. When they call me, all I have to ask, what do they mean? All right, enough of that. Um, that guy is touched in the head and obviously was touched in the ass. Um, who's with me here today? Kevin Carre, what says you to this um to this, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, it's a good, I, I, I'm just laughing my ass off. I, I, may, I, I usually don't make notes, but I make a lot of notes on this one, right? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yo, in the beginning, did you notice something that he was like getting like a pet on the head from that white kid? Like, he yeah. looked, looked like a, a, a white man petting his dog. Mm -hmm. And yeah. look how, <clears throat> in, the, in the words of Mr. Nasheed, you know, he was talking at Negro ba Babel and bucking them eyes. Mm -hmm. It's it's like you know what he used to, he looks like to me when I'm watching this thing. He's a goddamn male wet nurse. But I digress. I I I, I hear you, Mister Untouchable. What say you? First of all, this nigga <laughs> in the United States of America. I know that for a fact. He can't be. No way. No self-respected white adoption agency <laughs> gonna let a single black man. Adopt their white kids. That's not gonna happen. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Probably um, Europe. Uh first of all, and if he did, if he if he adopting kids in, in some Western country, I'm wondering how what kind of papers did he have to prove like he had a eunuch surgery where they take out all his <laughs> balls and penis? I, I really and truly, you know, because there's no way I'm seeing that this single man. Is gonna just be adopting girls and guys and white girls and white guys free without them questioning that completely. I don't see that. So mm -hmm. there's some dynamics to the situation. I don't know. I sure he you see say he married because I'm thinking well maybe he, he was a white girl a white woman and how to go into the white adoption agency and show it. But he's a single man. So I just, I don't buy that bullshit. You know what I mean? There's some aspects or dynamics to this situation. I don't know. So I can't speak on it, brother. Uh, before I go to the matron, let me just read some of the comments in the chat. First of all, um, M. Chaco said the dude is uh, mad sus energy from dude. Uh, KW Don 7 says, let your Rugu take care of their own. What happened to race first? Question mark, question mark, question mark. The pro-black perspective is in the chat. He said, this dude got issues. He said he's searching for cops. I don't know what that means. Um, um, the pro-black perspective mentions the fact that he, he likes to take in teenage boys. Uh, the learning curve, that's the matron in the chat, said sus AF. Uh, the pro-black perspective makes a good point. I'm not even mad this creep is adopting white kids. Whites can have them. Um, Matron said he's alphabet soup. On that note, Matron, what says you about this uh, prompt? Okay. Um, so when I see black-looking people parenting white looking people. I think about all those portraits we have of the Moors and wet nurses and um, black people that were protecting white people and teaching them how to live and how to exist. And it's, it goes back to what are they really trying to prove? What are they really trying to do? I have a lot of resentment, Loki, um, for this because you know, he's talking about he's not picking these kids. And I, I haven't investigated his channel, but obviously he's found a market for it. It sounded like he has some type of part-time job when he went into talking about the fact that he's a hustler and this, this, that, and the other. So there's that element of it. Maybe he's doing this for money, right? And maybe he recognizes that a YouTube channel that totally makes, a that projects the image of a, of a totally uh unicized or eunuch styled black man taking care of white people specifically white kids is something that people want to see it's more likely to go viral and perhaps this is what he's doing to to create an economy but he styles himself as their pet 
and their caretaker and their wet nurse. And, um, you know, it sounds like he has a lot of unresolved psychological trauma and issues. It seems like he did not go deal with the rapist in an appropriate way to stare them down man to man and address the issue. And um, he's actually doing community harm because he's going to raise two white kids to be empowered and powerful, right? And they're going to assimilate into a structure that is going to train them to be tyrants because slave owners had interracial children that they treated no better than chattel. So that's that's all I have to say. The Hush Alley podcast is in the chat. He said, as D-Web, D-Web says, I wouldn't let this dude foster my dog, let alone teenage boys. Definitely sus. And the elephant in the room here is this Negro is some kind of Caribbean too, by the way. Uh, Mr. Untouchable, you have any last words about this prompt? No, no, say it ain't so. Say it ain't so. Don't say that. No, man. No, he said he from. No, no, no. <laughs> he said he mentioned Kampala. That's Uganda. So, I mean, he oh, said okay, he grew up okay. in. Yeah, he grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> don't set him over here. Don't set him. We don't want him. We don't want him. Keep him. Keep him. <laughs> Hey, uh, as, as the great Urzulism will say, another L. Right. Uh, the Hot Ready Podcast says, good point, maybe a grift. It, it could be a little bit of a grift in there, too. Um, Because, you know, if you take them white kids, they're going to give you some set-asides now, as opposed to black kids. And like Tito District said to Learning Curve earlier, she said, exactly, our kids don't get fostered or adopted at the rates of other races. Right. And I think that I think a lot of that, if I remember correctly, when I first came to the States, I remember hearing there's a profitability margin there. So when f- black folks take these white kids, it's more profitable for them to adopt um, these white kids versus black kids. Is that what you guys understand as well? On the panel? Yes. My aunt is a foster mother here in Michigan. And, um, when processing children through the foster care system on average she gets about 18 dollars a day plus medical care and you know like if they have any type of specialty services that they need for black children but like when it's these arab kids or these white kids that have to process through her home it's Mm -hmm. like 43 83 113 dollars a day so it is significantly different because you know they pay you to foster children right like Mm -hmm. that that's a hustle too and they have significant differences in the stratification of economics when what they pay you to care for these children. And then they attach labels to these black children more often than not at a higher proportion, a higher rate. So now you're in a position where as a foster parent or uh, a potentially adoptive parent that's uh, housing kids, you are administering drugs and medication to these black equals African babies because they're already a part of the system and they make them do blood draws and they make them make sure that certain levels of these chemicals are in their system. So yes, it is different. And and we don't even become foster care parents. Y'all know that's one of my pet projects. One of the things, you know, I, I be working on a lot of stuff in the background, be asking questions and trying to see how I can to do something different. But anyway, um, we don't even become foster parents because we don't want to be bothered or we got other stuff going on or this, this, that, and the other. And, and this is what these other babies are going through. There have been three kids in the past 18 months that were black equals African babies that wound up in foster care, not because they were actually criminals, but because their parents were fucked up and that put them in foster care that have died and we're doing nothing about it, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a go sit down. Hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of the book um, by Malcolm X when he said, when he was put into foster care, um, he was called nigger so much. He thought that was his first hmm. name. Yeah. You know, so it's uh, foster cares, and I'm saying to myself, this I don't, he is this guy is from um is from the east, so but he I don't understand that with so many children who don't have black fathers, black kids who don't have black fathers, he would just say, well I don't see color, it doesn't matter who comes in, 
I'm going to just be a father to everyone. I just feel like that is a tragedy. But this man obviously has no knowledge of self, and it is what it is. So speaking of knowledge of self, though, we got to tackle this at some point, too. There's this sister on Twitter named Lero, if I, I think I pronounced the name correctly. And she was talking about, recently she was talking about adopting children and stuff like that. Um, for some of the reasons that we mentioned before. Why is it that there's not a consciousness in Black society to go and save Black children? Now, you mean to tell me it all comes down to that dollar? And then that, that goes back to what Azuli talks about, where, you know, because you're not Black first, anything can disrupt what it is you're supposed to be on. So is it just a, you know, the matron talked about the the menu, the dollar menu of how much kids can earn you. Is it that? Is it just because it doesn't make sense economically to go take a black kid? Is that, what, is that where we are as a people, really? Anyone can answer that. I don't know. I, I think within our communities, we've always had big mama and them, these women, these women who would always take on children who are not theirs because even if it was in difficult situation it was a it's a prolific black speaker his name is les brown yeah I know and that. i think that um i think that his mother was uh, was taking on a bunch of kids i mean you always have segments within our community where women and even men too that's an unsaid thing mm -hmm. but women see that that there's a need you know that, that there's a need to you know to take care of kids who are unwanted you know, some women can have kids of their own, so they take on that that position. But these are the unsung heroes; they're not necessarily talked about. But they've been doing the work, so I don't I don't necessarily I wouldn't say even if they, it, it, the fact that it's not publicized, it does not necessarily mean that it doesn't happen because I think it happens in in a whole lot of cases. But I, I would I would leave it there. Okay, so from my perspective. Mr. Untouchable is 100% correct. It has always happened in our community, but in these last two generations, it happens a lot less because we were divested from our wealth. So we don't have Big Mama's house because somebody took out a mortgage or worse yet, somebody lost it to taxes. And we were divorced from a stable housing situation for ourselves. So we can no longer be and present and provide a place for these kids to be because we're living in a studio apartment or we didn't move back into our mama's house or we're in a house share situation, right? So that stability that once used to exist by owning a home and by having some place that's just like, oh, that's the neighborhood lady. She always got cookies, a blanket, a hot meal. She always got something for the neighborhood. That's gone because we lost that during in this most recent housing crisis under Barack Obama with George Bush. Man, 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 man. That's something. I mean, if you can't protect kids, which is what fostering essentially is, like my grandmother, from what I understood uh, in Nassau, when I was a kid, I, I, I would meet these adults who would be like, yeah, you know your Grammy. Um, we used to come and stay and sleep in the kitchen floor and all that kind of stuff. So what Mr. Untouchable and them is, is saying is absolutely true. Uh, but that's a, that's a bygone era now. Mm, mm, that, mm. That's not the case now. Uh, mm. it, it, uh, Mr. Untouchable, you still in now. So do you see people in our age group doing that stuff now? No, not, not to the, well, you know what? Not, uh, I can't, I can't say that, for, but what Matron said is, is true. Mm. Home, having a home facilitates things like that. Yeah. But I find that because of the economy, many of us are becoming renters, mm -hmm. especially some of our women. So they can't necessarily do the things that they used to do. But because I was I was a child of a, a person who benefited from that experience. It was always my my um friend's mom, you know, she used to cook. You know, I used to benefit from that meal sometimes because you used to get hairy. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I, I I remember that very very well. She she took on the position of almost being like my mom outside of my own personal mom. Mm. You know, but you know, having a home 
is is a necessary thing to facilitate that kind of thing. If you're a renter, you may not necessarily be in a position to do those kinds of things. So I think that that's, that's the issue that's that's um, creating an environment where you don't see that as much anymore. You don't even qualify a lot of times to be a foster parent if you um, are not in a co-op housing or ownership type situation with the property where you live because the system is trying to establish stability for these children. And if you could be evicted at any point in time, if you could be put in a position and a situation where you yourself are homeless because you're dependent upon your job and other things to maintain your space and, and a landlord to maintain your space, you don't even qualify. But at the same time, you also cannot um, apply for Section 8 if you don't have biological children. So you can't say, I want to be a foster parent. Prioritize me and the and these kids that you want to assign to me and give us housing at a discounted rate so that we can have, quote unquote, stable housing, right? You, so it's a very prohibitive system and divorcing us from the land and ownership interest and property is just another way for them to continue to victimize us and our children. So final thoughts on this. Is this guy, you know, I said I, I thought he was touching the head and ass, but is this guy, was he, in your, in your opinions, was he abused by this white man who he doesn't refer to affectionately, at least not in my recollection, as father or daddy or anything like that is just his man right was this was this man is it possible that this black man here was abused by this white man and this is why he takes in these apparently teenage white kids is that what's going on here or as the harsh alley podcast put it is it just a grift kevin carrey we'll start with you it it can go both ways, man. You you never know people's um history. But in your opinion, just just what resonates with you? Is it a grift or this guy was touched and so he just has this affinity for white boys himself? I I uh I think it's a grift. Okay. That money. Okay. Look, look how good he's living. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um Miss Untouchable, what say you? I, if I'm being honest, I think that he is sincere, but in his sincerity, I think he's misguided. Mm. I think that from the place he's coming from, I think that his his wherewithal, his potential, is his the things that he had learned as an adult person could be used within his community better. I understand he doesn't see he's, he's a, probably a brother who doesn't see color, right? But I think that we are the most affected. In, in these Western societies. And I think that to to turn a blind eye to that and say, well, I'm a just a dog, a bunch of white male kids who are probably gonna eventually oppress a bunch of black male kids. Yep. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. But mm -hmm. you know, it's, that's a matter for him, man. It's a matter for him. Matron, I give you the last word before we go on to the next prompt. I feel like he has Stockholm syndrome. Mm -hmm. I feel like he might have been uh, you know, when 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 you are a child, as a child that was abused in interesting ways, when you're a child and someone touches you in that way, but they're giving you attention, it the mind fog of being able to unpack that takes a lifetime, okay? So even if this person expressed compassion, it was an inappropriate relationship and power dynamic, right? And so now he feels like this debt to this whole situation because he was a powerless person that receive some type of benevolence from someone. And I really think that he's trying to pay it forward because his mind and his consciousness was co-opted by that experience. Amen to that. I agree with that right there. Uh, we're going to move on to shoot the breeze topic number seven. Uh, the person who submitted this last story is not here right now, which is always good. If you submit a topic, it's good to be around to kind of Give what you, you know your initial thoughts that led you to post it as a shoot the breeze topic. But I hope I hope people got something out of it all the same. The next topic is an interesting one. I honestly didn't know what to do with this topic, but it was put up there, and uh, I said I'll 
I said I'll, <laughs> I'll discuss it. Uh, the next topic is turkey thugs. How come the police aren't dealing with this? So there's this article in The Guardian, I guess. Um, it says, how wild turkeys, rough and rowdy ways are creating havoc in U.S. cities. That's a turkey. Um, it says, a wild, it says, uh, there's a violent gang stalking urban America. In New Hampshire, a motorcyclist crashed after being assaulted. In New Jersey, a terrified postman rang 9-11 after a dozen members attacked after a dozen members attacked at once. And in Michigan, one town armed public workers with pepper spray. In September, the Daily Messenger in upstate New York had had enough and published a tongue-in-cheek call to arms. Quote, we need to call out the militia, folks. This could be the greatest threat against humans and their civilization since Krakatau erupted. Wild Turkey all over America are rioting, rising up in rebellion against the influx of people into their habitat, end of quote. The wild turkey has lived in what is now North America for more than 10,000 years and was branded a bird of courage by founding father Benjamin Franklin in 1784. It's deeply symbolic for some of Thanksgiving as the animal pardoned by the U.S. president each year before 46 million commercially raised turkeys are eaten by an estimated 88% of the population. It's also one of the greatest conservation success stories in modern America going from all but extinct in large parts of the country as recently as the 1970s to so numerous that the four foot tall, 20 to 30 pound, highly adaptable animals have successfully overrun hundreds of US cities, trashing homes, in intimidating people and holding up traffic, earning their reputation as one of the most bad tempered neighbors on the block, or a scientific American put it, ugly hooligan nuisance birds. Every year they grow astronomically, population is absolutely huge. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, the 49 year old who dresses in head to toe camouflage and hangs the heads of favorite kills in his living room added in one way, it's a miracle. I don't think anyone anticipated that it would be this successful. I'm not going to read the rest of that article. Uh, Kevin Carey, what's the significance of this prompt? Remember last week we were discussing, you know, that the that uh, peasant that lives in Buckingham Palace with with Wait. the animals, you know. But what what it is, you know, these 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 and tongue in cheek, these animals are getting tired of these people's shit. You know, the animals are pushing back. Yeah, they they are. <laughs> Mister Untouchable, based on what you heard here, what do you have to say to this problem? I what I have to say is Teller Zuli. When he's hungry, stop creating these crazy questions. I tell him, leave that ganja, leave that marijuana alone. That Haitian marijuana is a hell of a drug. <laughs> I'll tell him, but it wasn't Arzuli who was, who was doing that, uh, who put this up. Matron, what say you about this? You know, we there's a lot that we can learn from studying nature, and we, we need to learn the lesson and get it. Right. Uh, and, you know, uh, I piggyback off of what uh, Harsh Reality Podcast actually said in the chat, which is real talk, though, wild turkeys, geese and roosters will mess you up. Right. Mm -hmm. And and we have I live in I, I live in an area where wild turkeys in gangs of 50 to 100 will just cross the road and you can't pass in traffic. I live in an area where those five and a uh, five and a half foot tall geese with them long necks, right, will just walk up to you and will will honk at you and will 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 stick their neck out and bite you like we think about emus and ostriches doing that to people. Mm -hmm. I live in an area where. I might wake up and find a deer or a moose in my window and I'm not too far from Detroit, right? Because I live in an area that has all of these different things and it's been urbanized for a while. So as other people go further into uh, nature preserves and natural habitat areas trying to create housing or trying to excavate the land or investigate something, these animals are getting angry and they are fighting back. And I think that we need to learn the lesson from nature and act accordingly as, as, as a Black equals African people. 
You know, one of the funny things I'll say about New York, um, and it's not it's not hard to see. If you look at New York City, for example, you don't see wild animals too much like that. But as soon as you step foot towards upstate New York, it's on. I mean, skunk could 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 squirt at you. You'll see moose. You'll see dares running through the street. You might knock one down. They might mash up your car. All that kind of stuff. So it's it's a thing of like industrialization push these animals, you know, to the to the to the fringes. But at some point, if those populations can can um, increase, like be untouched and increase, there's a point where those things, and they've made movies about this too, where those things, animals and plant species and stuff, will start to come back into the cities. You know, there's just a matter of time. Um, speaking of wild animals, when I was in, when I was growing up in Nassau, you know, I used to raise chickens and goats and all that kind of stuff. And I can tell you a chicken with a hen with biddies, uh, is one of the most vicious. I know Mr. Untouchable probably know what I'm talking about too. It's one of the most vicious things around when they think you're harming one of their little chicks, you know? So, uh, so yeah, uh, I don't, again, I don't know why this topic was brought up to be honest, but it's an interesting topic, uh, a tongue-in-cheek topic as well. Does anyone have any last words on this topic? Yeah, actually, if you go to Staten Island, they have deers. The deers will swim over. From, they'll swim over from New Jersey and go into Staten Island. And also, they have a lot of wild. Tur- if you go to CSI, mm-hmm. they have a lot of wild turkeys there actually on campus. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. I can't so, eat them there, you know, but yeah, it is what it is. Right. So we'll go on to shoot the breeze topic number eight tonight. We're almost at the end here. Um, this topic is about one Dr. David Imonidi, uh talking about a fake college in the ATL. Now, again, let me see if, uh, if this is one of those long videos. Again, I don't remember. Uh, I can only play parts of it if it's long. And uh, let's do this. So here's the video coming up. Give, give, give me now, give me now doctor doctor degrees, degrees, like degree like, samples at the mall, and you will never guess where it is. I'm just joking. <laughs> it's Atlanta. Of course it's Atlanta. Scam capital of the world. Let's go. Welcome to Pocket Watching with JT. Re- Good question. Here, I'm going to show you guys the picture that I was sent in the email. Right here, this guy. If you don't know who this is, I've done a video on this gentleman in the past. This is David Emonte. I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. If I'm wrong, put it in the comments, but I think it's David Emonte. And he is a multi-level marketing guru. He's one of these guys that get you into those pyramid schemes. All right. My opinion, multi-level marketing is a pyramid scheme. Now, he used to get you into a pyramid scheme based in coffee. Now he promotes a pyramid scheme based on teaching you how to trade the foreign exchange market. Now, when I saw this picture, I initially my mindset was like, hey, good for him. He went back to school. He got a doctor's degree. But the pocket watcher who sent me this picture in the email said, check out the school. Check out the school. What? Why do I need to check? Okay. All right. Here we go. Let me go and check out this school. And this is what I found. Here we go. The name of the school is Higher Place Christian University. Pretty nice looking website. Looks like everybody here is having fun. Says, Education that prepares you for success. Sounds great. Sounds great. You can see the different programs that they have here. All right. It says quality Christian education. Higher Place Christian University is a world class private Christian university with a passion to develop leaders who will glorify Christ and take their world to a higher place. Seems good. Seems good. Everything's seeming real good. Says HPCU success stories. 
Got some people giving some good testimonials. I like that. Testimonials is always a big plus. But something happened when I scrolled down to the bottom of the page and I looked at some of the alumni. Now, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you so you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. But if you look here, you will see that some of these alumni look a little bit different than the others. Right. These three have a particular look to them. But this one right here, Jason Waters, seems a little bit odd. Just a little bit odd. So, of course, the pocket watcher that I am, I figured, why not just right click on the image and do a simple Google image search? Here's what I found. Okay, now real quick, I got to give a shout out to the big homie, Spencer Cornelia. He showed me this trick, all right? Spencer showed me this trick. Whenever you're on a website and you see recommendations and reviews and the picture seems a little sketchy, all you have to do is right click on the image and do a very simple Google image search. That way, you can see if this image is legit or not. You can see if this is a stock photo or if it's a real photo. So this is what I found for Mr. Jason Waters. Apparently, it's a stock photo. <laughs> Jason Waters does not exist. Here he is right here. This is the picture. Look at him. Coffee cup in hand. Laptop in his hand, having the time of his life, it's a stock photo. But let's see what he says about the actual college on the website. On the website, he says that Higher Place Christian University prepared me for steps I needed to take to start a business as well as to lead one. Through courses and classes, I have been developed into a better person. Sounds like this copy was written by someone whose English is not their first language, which most likely it was. All right, what else does Jason have to say? He says, I can honestly say that I would not be who I am today <laughs> if I didn't attend HPCU and graduate with a Christian business degree. I have no idea what that is, but okay. HPCU professors and mentors are readily available to students at all times, apparently even for students who don't exist because Jason Waters is not a real person, apparently. <laughs> Lastly, he says, the blessings I received at HPCU are beyond anything I ever imagined. Coming from, once again, a stock photo. Okay, so after seeing this, my scam meter was on high. But I wasn't done yet. I decided I'm going to press my luck. So I wanted to see one more person. So I went back to the website, and I wanted to see about Miss Rashida Evans. Rashida Evans also says that she is a very, very proud alumni of this college. Says, if you are considering a career in teaching or ministry, consider preparing at HPCU. Rashida Evans alumni. So I decided to take a look and see if Rashida is real or a stock photo. Here we go. Drum roll, please. Is Rashida real or is Rashida fake? Here we go. Bam! <laughs> Rashida also is a stock photo. All right, that's enough for that. Uh, again, when you guys post these videos, give me a timestamp or make, give me a shorter video or something. I can't play the whole video. Um, so Azuliism is here in the chat. He's the one who sent these last two, this, this, this topic, by the way. He says they can make fake Christian college, but they don't make institutions, I guess, to help us out of this shit. The biomaker is not the problem anymore. 
Visualism goes on to say this man can take all his energy to create, I guess he means create a fake Jesus college, but can't build an African-centered educational system. What do you guys on the panel make of this topic? Mr. Untouchable, we'll start with you. Um, <clears throat> the, the reason why most scams are successful, well, these kinds of scams is they work on three things, greed, laziness, and ignorance. The, the reason why the Nigerian, my Nigerian brothers is do that, pull that 419 scams is, you know, they tell people, well, you won the lottery. You know, you know, you won't, you know, you won't sign up for no goddamn lottery. But they say if you if you send us twenty dollars, we gonna give you five thousand dollars. Come on, that's greed. Mm-hmm. You know, um, brother, polite them and and Ben Carson them. They know about talking and using big words to play on the ignorance ignorances of their audience, and they know that they're they're so lazy they're not gonna do the research. As far as this guy, as far as laziness goes, he talks about the cost and the money markets. And I'm in the money markets a bit, you know, and the things that he's suggesting that could be learned in a, in a very short amount of time, it takes people years, you know, years. So you're and familiar I, with this guy? No, no, no. I'm oh, familiar okay. with what he mentioned. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, oh, it's just like this. You know what I mean? I could, nah. When mm-hmm. you're talking about um, as far as trading and the money market, these are things that people learn over years. These ain't a... Uh, I, I could do this within a week and I'll just, no, 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 no. It doesn't go like that. You know, you have to invest a whole lot of time and energy. But he, he'll he sell you the dream of because he know the people are so lazy, they're going to they gonna try to, you know, opt for the shortcut. You know what I mean? And that's where he makes his money. So mm-hmm. greed, um, laziness, and ignorance. Lastly, the, 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 the most important thing is usually, not always, but usually, when it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's that's an old, old, old adage. Mm-hmm. And if you just was to apply that idea, you know, when you sh- scrutinize a little bit more, man, just a little bit more, mm-hmm. and you, you you know get to the understanding, boy, I tell you, boy, it's a trip to to really think because people don't like to think, eh? Right. People right. don't like to think, man. But anyways, mm-hmm. that's what I get from that that um that brother. Kevin Carey, what says you to this story? <clears throat> Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Get what you deserve. Matron? I have a dissenting opinion. Okay. Okay. So um, I criticize them because, like, even if they use pe- – because you – I can go have stock photos up and become a stock – image and picture Mm -hmm. but if you use these stock images or um things like that then let it be real people so like i have those types of criticisms but let me say what it is that i see in this opportunity or in what they're doing you first build an economy by saying i have relationships with business entities and I'm going to establish a qualification process by which people can get passes to enter into that economy through this institution. And this is the, even though it's rudimentary, even though they're not doing it right, even though they, we don't know the inner and outer workings of their entity or any of those things, they started something right? They began the process. Maybe they don't have a group of thinkers, right? Maybe they are just some hustlers and some hucksters and some people that just want to make a quick buck. But this is a start. And that's more than a lot of people have done. Now, if they're criminalizing it and they're, you know, doing it in a shameful way, that's their problem. But uh, my problem is, okay, like I see this and I, this is a, this is a failure, right? But I can see this idea and this is something that I'm currently working towards refining because we talk about building institutions and things like that. But we got to recognize that there's a balance that's needed because we need the entrepreneurs or the business owners or the entities that are going to agree to hire the people that we send through this process. The second thing I wanted to say is that every single week, I get an email from an institution called Hillsdale College here in Hillsdale, racist ass, 
Hillsdale's, Mi Michigan, right? They're a part of the 1776 Project. They're an educational entity, so they say, and they're always offering me classes, coursework, and opportunities and information if I pay them anywhere from $285 to $13,000, which they'll help me figure out uh, financing to get so that I can get one of their passes. Now, they don't have an economy backing them up, but white people do this shit too. Right. And then the last thing that I'll say is that we know a lot of entertainers and people in popular society that have PhDs and doctorate degrees and things like that. Right. But we forget those are honorary doctorate degrees from other institutions. So what should register in our minds is that because they kept singing for their summer supper or they became some type of social or cultural icon, then those entities and institutions wanted that celebrity star power. So they gave them a high level pass to get into these particular entities. Greek organizations do this exact same thing somebody that dropped out of school in the sixth damn grade is a whole ass Omega or, or Kappa or whatever with a doctorate degree from Howard or Yale or wherever. So mm -hmm. what we got to recognize is that they looked at a strategy and an idea and they just need to refine it. What I'll say behind the matron before we welcome her Zuli to the panel what I'll say behind the matron is that a lot of people don't realize something about business. Business is a facsimile of war also. A lot of the same concepts you use in war, you use that in business, right? You identify your enemy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what, this, what these people did here is really what you do in business, is, to be honest. Now, it could be a scam behind the scenes and all that. And if it is, you know, to hell with them. But like stock photos, like let me tell you something. I have a business webpage that's that that has all kinds of stock photos of all kinds of different types of people, because that's what you do. It's deception. Business is deception as well. You gotta make it seem like you're doing something that you're not quite doing. As a matter of fact, if you're new in the game of being like a consultant or something like that, right? You gotta act like you've been doing this thing and you you've had quite a few clients under your belt so that this person who you're trying to get to hire you can say, okay, well, you have, okay, I see you have some testimonials on your webpage. And meanwhile, that's your friends and then wrote that shit. You know, so I agree with the matron there that, um, I agree with the matron in that, you know, with business, a lot of the techniques in business is warfare techniques and you got to play the game sometimes. If they are scamming, Black people, black equals African people out of monies for degrees that, they, that they're never going to get or something like that. That's another story. But we got Azuliism who sent this in. Uh, Azuliism, when you send these stories in, give me a timestamp of what to play. I can't play a whole 15 or 30 minute video. Azuli, welcome to the panel. What say you to this topic? Yo, what I was going to say, you didn't let the whole thing play, right? So my not. boy... When they do the, when they did the the, 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 when that guy did the research on him, he said he has doctorates. Guess what? Guess who gave him the doctorates? Oh, the same school he's trying to start. start. <laughs> the guy said the, the principal, the guy, they said, oh, he, he he has doctorate degrees and all of that. So when he did the research to find out where did he get the doctorate? So if you got the doctorate from different school, it's not a problem. The same school he's starting. That's who he said gave him the doctorate credits. Mm -hmm. So I was, I'm was, i saying this. The same energy it takes your people to do all of this. I agree it with could this. Be, Go ahead. You could do something, a system. Positive. Positive. Yeah. Yeah. Something to open the people's mind. Something to do that. But again, it's it's the scamming that's in you. And this is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not going to blame the barrel maker no more, son. The barrel maker is just a reflection of some of these people from real. Because why would you? It's a fake accredited school. Some some jobs don't re, don't don't recognize your school if you're not really accredited. Right. So how could you? How is that not a scam? If you're trying to get people to come to your school, bro, and you're doing this to your own people, because the barrels makers' children is not gonna come to your shit. Why would they come to your thing? They have other th school they could go to. So I'm saying this is like. 
people could have all this energy to create scam to get their own people but to create something that is so like meaningful because this if you could do that that's a smart thing but why don't you do that too like rejuvenate your people I, like you I, I agree with that like because they all scamming, like you said. Everybody's just, like, if you're creating a business, you have to do that to, to, to give the people who are looking at your stuff to be like, okay, he knows a couple of people. But dude, <laughs> you created a whole BS school. You don't even have no doctorate. He doesn't even, at least if he had a doctorate from, let's say, from one of those, um, let's say from NYU or something, the people, the person who gave him his doctorate is the same school he's trying to create, bro. <laughs> that that's crazy. I but I, would you I, but would you go to Kelly Price's school? Because Kelly Price has a doctorate degree. Would you go to Steve Harvey's school? Steve Harvey has a doctorate degree. They're both honorary, but they're doctorates. I would go to the, I would go to that school if if I'm going to Steve Harvey school to teaching me about comedy, how to be a, a good comedian, how to be how to go on the stage. I would go to a Kelly Price University. If, if she's teaching me how to sing, these are things that they specialize in. I ain't getting to know Steve Harvey School of Engineering, and I ain't getting to know Kelly Price School of of uh of finance because I don't know them for that. Let me say this too: I be, I am a believer of ground up business. You yeah. know what I mean? Because many people I know have built it from the ground up. What mm. what um what Koku was basically saying as far as. Um, getting testimonials and and having stuff for I've done that shit too. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But you you know, I to. had a paradigm shift. I had a paradigm shift. And not ain't for everybody. But mm -hmm. I said this: if I believe in the product that I sell in to to where, whoever to my particular market, right? Then I should stand behind my product. Hey, that means if I sell it, if I give it to my friends for them to experience the product, I have to I have to believe in my product enough to say well. They these people use my product, and they these are the testimonies from using my product. I don't if my shit is good, I don't have to falsify. It. You know what I mean? That's a, that's my that's my paradigm shift. I mean, it's a time thing, you know, to cut time out. You have to sometimes you have to do what you gotta do. You have to do that Brooklyn magic, like some one of my friends is saying. But um, but uh, <laughs> but the reality <laughs> is, if my product is good. I should stand behind my product. I don't need to manipulate it. I don't need to do it if I really believe in it. But I believe in ground up building. You don't have to, to, to do these little creepy side shit if you stand behind what you say is true, is right, and is, is, is um, something that can benefit someone else. Why the manipulation? Why, why do that? That's just me. So I, I talk about African-centered curriculum and education all the time. If I were... Upon finishing this curriculum, if I were to open a school, a lot of the tactics this guy used, I would actually use. There'll be stock photos of children. There would be testimonials from people like Mr. Untouchable and them, right? Uh, the matron and them and stuff like that. But like Mr. Untouchable is saying, ultimately, I stand behind my product. And ultimately, the work behind behind the bullshit, the work behind that will be to, to legitimize everything. And I think Ozuli has a good point here that all that effort you put into some bullshit, you could have put into a serious, let's say, an African-centered school or something like that. Like all that website stuff. Let me tell you something. I just paid for a website the other day for a couple of years hosting. That shit is expensive to a poor man. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You went and did all of that stuff there when you really could go and go and get some scholars or something like that to create an African-centered uh, high school or something or, or grade school or whatever, you know? Uh, or, or, or wait, or if you're going to use that scamming, at least don't scam your own people. Go right. scam non-black people right. and bring the money back in. Right. Oh, if, you you really wanna, if you really want to get it up quick, man, go to Fiverr.com and have the Indians do it. <laughs> right. Oh, no, that's Africa. a big scam right there, too. That's probably yeah. what they did with that website. Like, it costs, like, 25 to 35 US dollars plus whatever your hosting fees are yeah. to have them set your stuff up. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, rupees and dollars are two different things. So. Okay. <laughs> two different things. Yep. Yep. Let me tell you something. Them Afghanis and stuff like that, they 
they are happy to get that $25, $35. Trust me. They're happy on Fiverr. They're happy to get that 15 bucks. Don't let no one front, right? But again, the reason why black folks do these scams amongst black folks is because they figure well, amongst black folks, you're going to get caught no time soon. You go around these white folks doing the same bullshit, you'll be done. No, 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 no. We got Everest, we got Everest, Dorsey College, Baker College, all these unaccredited schools and universities, people going around talking about they got degrees and certificates from these places and they can't get a job nowhere. That's why I said are they black this is these are white schools. Right. These are but what I'm saying is that no, but they said the white people not gonna go there. White people fall for it too. Trump Trump University. Well, that's what I'm saying. The game is the game. Yeah, white folks you die. White folks fall white folks fall for it. The point I was making was the people who perpetrate that in white society, they don't get gaffled up quick. And what I'm saying is a black person doing this and scamming white folks out their money. You get gaffled up. Ain't gonna last quick. long. Ain't gonna, gonna last long. long. Uh uh-uh. uh yeah. The only yeah, people, the only people who I see who's who who's do that shit with with any community that lasts long is is the televangelists. The black or white, yeah. <laughs> trust me, they create, gonna last long. <laughs> create a flow of dollars. <laughs> oh man, oh man. When I see them selling that uh that uh, what do you call it um. Snake oil, prayer meeting oil, or some prayer rug, prayer shawls, and holy water, and the little the little crosses on the card that either the kids can put together or they didn't got a billion of them from Asia for thirty dollars, or the little communal cups that they sell that cost twelve dollars for fifty, and you sell them each for five dollars. Thought this was prayed over by this pastor. You going to the store to get a bottle of olive oil, and you selling it back to people and half yes, a gram yes, dram yes, uh i yes. know all the scams yes, about that i didn't see them yes, all okay that's the, so, that's the only people who get away that's the only, what i know about black, when I was, black all way. You know when, I mean? they when, get away. when i was a kid i remember there was a guy named all roberts um and all roberts was on tv even home they had shown him on tv um uh, he was sick or something he was begging for a million dollars for some sickness and all roberts ain't died he ain't going to no hospital or nothing, but he got his million dollars. You see how? I mean? Hey, oh, look at that's, that's, that's small money to them. If that's Miles Monroe money. had done some shit like that, where white folks had given money and come to find out Miles wasn't sick, he would he, oh, he, he, he he have been finished. a problem. Oh finished. yes, yes. You had to been squeaky clean, but but he could but he get away. Listen, he sell to white audiences too now. I mean, he, because <laughs> of Billy Graham, yeah, because of his association with Billy Graham, he uh, sold he had a co to white He had a co signer though. He, he had, had a co signer. Yeah, Billy Graham was his co signer. Right, and who was the Indian when it was one? He didn't have an Indian name, but you uh, looked at. Him. But uh, y'all know who I'm talking. Benny Hinn. Yeah, yeah Benny he Hinn. was another one that, you know, he would have never got away. You know, the only people that really got caught up were those 700 club people, right? Uh, Drusilla with all the makeup. She looked like a fake Tammy Faye. But the 700 club people, uh, them was the only ones that really seriously got caught up in Creflo Dollar. And that was because they had too much mass appeal. Right. That's, that's too greedy. Well, Jim what about Bacon Jessica, and, Jessica Hans in the, in the, in the 80s? Yeah, Jim Bacon, but, but, Jim Baker, but Creflo yeah. Dollar, them, they they make some dollars, man. I mean, they and they never got not seriously investigate. I mean, because they would be in jail, you know, for the mm -hmm. shit they, they get away with, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Erzuli, you get the last word on this prompt. What what's the last thing you want to say about this? Prompt? You know, the last thing I'm saying is that yo, is there's a time that we need to stop. It's like I believe that you know when they say as above, as below, or as within, as without. These these people are a reflection of our deep, deep subconscious. Because there's no way out of anything you could do. And they know that a lot of black people are into that religious stuff. That's why he started. He know it's easier to fool people with yeah. the religious shit. Mm -hmm. I agree with and that. now, like, we need to stop blaming the barrel maker. The barrel maker is supposed to do whatever he's doing. Like, this is this is ridiculous now. So for those you took who, all this time to create a fake joint, and then you you don't even know how many people he got. 
So for those who are not aware with your slogan, the biomaker, I, I know most of us on the panel probably are, for, are familiar. What's the biomaker for um, for those who don't know, for those who are, who, who, who are coming to this episode not knowing? What's what do you mean when you say the biomaker? You actually mean the people who built the system, the op this oppressive system. Right. So we it, it's derived from the crabs in the barrel um, analogy, right? That black folks are like crabs in a barrel. But a lot of people don't ask the question, who put the crabs in the barrel? Who built the barrel, right? And it's, it's our opponent who built the barrel, right? So they are the barrel makers. So c continue with that knowledge now. Continue with what you were saying. The barrel maker, you're saying you're not blaming the barrel maker anymore. Uh, you know, there's a time, there's a point. It's like, if I keep telling you, stop going down this this street. There's a bunch of people there. And then you keep going. You keep, Every day you keep doing, you keep doing. Dude, when does it become your responsibility to, to not get yourself bust in the head by going down that street? Yeah. Consequences. You know, I got a question, though, here, Azuliism, because, like, when we talk about the barrel maker, it, it goes back to, like, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark's thing about who betray the African. And at the end of the day, we betray ourselves and we've been betraying ourselves for hundreds yep. of years. Yep. And, and that is a part of coming out of the paradigm where we're consistently saying, you know, oh, it's white supremacy and it's this and it's this and this. It's like, stop giving that power. They're projecting a reality onto us. It's our job to project a new reality. And that's why I had a dissenting opinion about this whole situation. Because if you got somebody like a Mr. Untouchable who can get a room full of black capitalists together and make them agree that 30% of the jobs in their industry will be set aside for people that process through your educational institution, right? Like this uh, Hope Christian College, whatever it's called. And they say, all right, yeah. And it's just like, no, and these are not just the lowest rung of your jobs. Like this is 30% of your workforce at all levels. And they agree to that. And then you create this educational institution and process and they are Africanized in that process and they come out why is that doctorate degree or that skill, if they're being trained and taught by people or by resources that have the skills, right? Why is that weighed less than any other institution if you also have an economy to give those graduates? Is that a question for the last part of that? The last part. Go ahead. Is that a question for Azuli? No, that's a question for anybody on the panel. Everybody right. on the panel. The, the last part of your statement is very important. One of the, it's as far as the statement goes. If you have an economy, you know what I mean. That's that's very important. If your economy is based off for of someone, well, if you if you going into someone else's economy with the same things that you are mentioning, the things that they have learned or whatever, then the whole scenario changes a bit. You know what I mean? It changes a bit because I could learn from all these African-centered experiences, whatever, but that is to remedy uh, a situation within a particular community. But if I'm using that in that in, all that information that I'm gathering as far as African business, African-centered business, whatever, and I'm taking that information to someone else's uh, um, economy, then it, it can be rendered as useless. You know what I mean? It's like, well, me as an African centered person going into a white, white or European or Eurocentric centered establishment, then I'm working against, I'm working against their purpose. Their purpose is <laughs> completely different from my, what mine is. You know what I mean? And mine is to remedy a different kind of solution, a completely different kind of solution. You know what I mean? So like you say, you have to have an economy, you know, within and of yourself as opposed to an economy of someone else's, you know what I mean? To, to be able to thrive, like you say, and, and produce and do all the things that you are suggesting. That's what I believe. And I believe that I believe that when we when we as a as a community cut out the middleman and go to the source directly, you know what I mean? And what I what do I mean by that? Um in hip hop, in hip hop, you know, when we let's talk about hip hop or reggae, whatever you want to say. When we create the music, when we um, produce the music, and when we distribute the music too to people who are willing to buy the music, 
then we cut out the middleman of going to someone else's economy to have them distribute our own music and then we completely control so then now you could produce or you could teach people you know you could create a system where you teach people to come and decide at our community and be able to produce for that community you understand what i'm saying or i, I mean you're absolutely right. I started with we get a groom, we get Mr. Untouchable, who is a salesman, into a room <laughs> full of black capitalists, and we demand a 30% set aside. Did you hear? Yeah. Oh, you you missed that part. Oh, that's that's okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, no, you demand, okay. You, who are you going to demand to set 30% aside of the job for you? Who? Right. I said we start we're starting with the premise of black capitalists. Black capitalists understand power and yeah. they understand power dynamics. Yeah. And so you can appeal to the person to the black equals African person inside of them, no matter how small and infinitesimal that is. Yeah. And you can appeal to them yeah. with the ability for them to be powerful and demand that set aside with that leverage because you now represent a potential economy and resource for them to tap into so that they will exchange the economy that they have built with you. And you say, listen, you know how them Koch brothers, you know, they demand and their employees do this, this, that, and the other, and they vote yeah. their interests. They vote, yeah. vote the interests of their. I got thirty percent of your workforce right here, having processed through my institution with appropriate skills. I mean, this is not no bullshit, right? With appropriate skills, and they are going to now vote your interest because they now have an alliance with you. You could be powerful. They gonna look at you, and you are gonna say just thirty percent. Yeah, you know, we'll even test it. We'll even run a test. You know, like on a midterm election, you could run that test, and you could say in the midterm election, if you hire my people out of this city, and they represent a significant portion of your particular area of choice that you want to impact, because I have people everywhere, right? And you tell them, look. I am going, these people are going to swing the votes in your favor and you will then be able to assist in the control of a politician and you can be powerful because the people are not, they going to vote, they going to do whatever they going to do. Like they've been running disinformation campaigns and this is and the other, but that black capitalist is going to recognize this is an opportunity for me to be powerful. This is an opportunity for my interests to be represented. This is something that I can go to the politician with and be like, you know, you like how you got in office last time, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know that that was my, those were my employees and my people that swung that election your way. And then you say, you want to stay there, don't you? I'm going to need you to do this, 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 and that. No, I understand that. I understand. I understand that. Okay. All right, I don't know, man. It sounds it sounds sexy, but okay. <laughs> no, no, no. She, um, it sounds great, but she is. No. Again, are these people? This is the thing. That person you're gonna go to, that black capitalist, is he a capitalist first or is he a African first? He he is self interest first. <laughs> he just happened to be black, <laughs> and and when you when you appeal to people who are self interest first. Basically, basically, I want to be able to see where's my personal benefit first. Unfortunately, that's the language when you're talking to a capitalist. Not it's me, not, but when you're talking to a capitalist, he going to look at what his personal benefit is first before he look at his community. So you have to appeal to him on that level. Mm, you know what I mean? So mm. when if, if you're trying to sell something to any business person or whatever, don't sell him a what are you, this and that or whatever. Tell him about his personal benefit first. That's how you sell to capitalists or people who think along those lines. How I can make you the most amount of money. Or how I could beat the person who been making you money. How I could beat them out in what I do. That's what you sell, too. But that's a whole nother matter. <laughs> we, we talking about something else right now. Interesting. I like it. I like it. I, I, uh, I like it. I like it. I, it's, it's, I like it, Mishra. I guess who, 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 who's... The, it sounds great. It does sound good, though. I ain't gonna lie. Uh, Tito District is in the chat. She says black capitalists are capitalists first, like all capitalists. Um, so yeah, I think uh, this is a topic we could uh, actually extend to future shoot the breeze. So keep it in mind, guys, if you cover follow up to this topic in the future, post it on the Discord. You can join the Discord by clicking the link at the top of the chat, it's pinned there, it's down in the description of the video as well. Join the Discord and find where you can post up. 
uh, your Shoot the Breeze topics. We're going to post Shoot the Breeze topic number nine for the night. And Mr. Untouchable was talking about hip hop for a second there. Um, our last topic tonight is going to be about hip hop, actually. So we all stay tuned for that. Um, this topic, Shoot the Breeze topic number nine, says thoughts on the African Union and its utility as an institution able to deal with crises. The travel bans various European countries have put in place against African nations in the region of this new variant of South Africa, and the commentary made by Dr. Ayodi Alakia. Um, I'm going to play this video that that prompt um, references. Just give me a second. And then on the other side, we'll have a discussion about it before we have our final topic tonight where we talk about a little something hip hop. So hold on. Well, I'm pleased to say that joining me now live from Abuja is a co-chair of the African Union's Vaccine Delivery Alliance, Dr. Ayoade Alakija. Uh, Dr. Alakija, thank you for your time. Do you feel that this was inevitable in some way? Thank you, Philippa. It was absolutely inevitable. And may I say firstly, that had the first SARS-CoV virus, the one that was first identified in China last year, originated in Africa, it is now clear that the world would have locked us away and thrown away the key. There would have been no urgency to develop vaccines because we would have been, it would have been expendable. Africa would have become known as a co the continent of COVID. What is going on right now is in inevitable. It's as a result of the world's failure to vaccinate in an equitable, urgent, and, 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 and speedy manner. It is as a result of hoarding by, by high-income countries of the world. And quite frankly, it is unacceptable. These travel bans are based in politics and not in science. It is wrong. I hear your anger about the immediate reaction and about the lack of action beforehand. Absolutely. I mean, let, let's just hope this is a dress hit rehearsal that we're seeing right now with the Omicron um, variant and, and not the main event. The science, we don't know yet. What we can say about COVID, what we can say about this current variant is that we, what, the best thing that we know is that we don't know. So this is hopefully a, a, a dress rehearsal. But uh, because until everyone is vaccinated, no one is safe. But what exactly is the global playbook on this? What are we planning to do? Are we just planning to act politically, knee-jerk reaction, so that we can we can satisfy those people within our countries that we're keeping those you know the, 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 those unvaccinated Africans out? Why are the Africans unvaccinated? This is, it's an outrage because we knew we were going to get here. We knew this is where the hoarding, the lack of, of IP, IP waivers, the lack of cooperation on sharing tech and, sh and, and sharing know-how. We knew this is a crossroads that it was going to bring us to. It was going to bring us to a more, to, to a variant. It was going to bring us to more dangerous variants. Why are we acting surprised? Why are we locking away Africa when this, con this virus is already on three continents? Continents. Nobody's locking away Belgium. Nobody's locking away Israel. Why are we locking away Africa? It is wrong. And it is also time that our African leaders stand up and they find their voice. African leadership needs to sit up in this moment. Our presidents need to wake up in this moment and realize that this is not business as usual. Their continent is at stake. Our lives are at stake. And we cannot allow the world to do this to us. You compared the situation now to the situation when the virus came out of Wuhan, came out of China. And if there'd been an instant lockdown and a travel lockdown, we'd be talking about a different pandemic. So I, I you know, the instant reaction is surely um, something has to be done in the very short term to try to stop the spread of the virus, this variant. Absolutely, Philippa, but something needs to be done to everywhere. Let there be, my recommendation is, have a coordinated global shutdown of travel for the next month, if you want, but don't single out Africa. Don't single out South Africa. Botswana, actually, is where the virus was first identified. But do you know what was what was going on with Botswana a few months ago? The Botswana government ordered um, 500,000 Moderna vaccines at $29 per dose, much higher than the rest of the world paid. They did not get the 
those vaccines because other people jumped ahead in the queue. Moderna supplied to other countries and did not supply to, to Botswana. And so now we have a variant. Do we know where this variant um, originated? No, we don't even know that yet. It could possibly be that the excellent science in South Africa has shown it up, but it could very well have come from anywhere else. This is discriminatory, it is xenophobia, and it is wrong. Let us follow the science, let us not follow politics. Let us share the, the, the know-how. Let us allow African countries and others to, 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 to produce their own vaccines so that we do not get to an omega variant, which we cannot absolutely control. Dr. Alakiju, we have to leave it there. Really important to hear your voice and what you're saying. Thank you. There's nothing worse than a white Brit or whatever saying, I hear your, uh, I hear your frustrations because uh, you don't, you could tell they don't care, right? But the prompt in particular, I think Tito District posted this prompt. The prompt in particular is asking, in light of what we just listened to and, and watched in that video, what is the African Union really doing? Are they helpful at all in this? Uh, let's start with Mr. Untouchable. Um, I need to do some more research on this. This um, what the African Union is actually doing. Um, as far as this lady, um, I tend to to take a different view than than the sister, and and here's why. You know, she says that, you know, why isolate us? Why lock us away? And 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 some would see that as a bad thing. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. I think that Afri Africans always being fucked with from the outside. Yep. You know, you always have outsiders coming in with the ideas, the germs, the diseases. We have not had the time to be able to to just sit down and meditate on our own personal issues and problems and mm -hmm. learn how to figure it out on our own. Mm -hmm. And really, when you have that time to do that, it, it really makes you a strong, stronger group of people. Now, I may be crazy in saying this, but I really believe that we always being fucked with. If yeah, they okay. want to if they want to isolate us and lock us away, maybe we need that for a time. Yes. And coming out, we are so ingenious and inventive. Coming out from that experience may be something that is original, authentic, and unique to the, to the world that we'll have to offer rather than this lady who probably was educated. She sounds like a British black lady. You know what I mean? So that's the her greatest fear is to be locked away from and separated from from her, her zaddy, her zaddy. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. Yep. I, I just take a different view from from her. You know. I I I uh, I'm with you on this one too. Uh, like Tito District says, we can't recognize blessings when we see them. Sometimes you got to sit back and say, wait a minute, this is a good thing in it. Y'all stay away, get up out of the paint. We'll handle it. And we'll be better for it on the other side. Kevin Cairo, you have anything to add to this? Mr. Untouchable, you've you been hitting you've been hitting that hot fire tonight, man. Um yeah, I, I had a I have a, a problem with she's asking, oh, why are you locking us away? You know, why are you not giving us the vaccine? Remember, Koku, you said this months ago in your podcast. What are we doing? You know, we're talking about Elon Musk building all this stuff. What are Africans doing? Why are we why are we dependent on outsiders medicine? Mm -hmm. Africa have everything there to to make their own vaccine. They have those great minds there. And, and you said this is a this is, this is a blessing in disguise. What they should do too? Hey, you put a Trump just like uh what three years ago with Trump? He 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 started a trade war with China. Go tit for tat. Yeah. You know you can, we can't come to your country. You can't come here either. Yeah. Yeah. You want own resources, especially Congo. Congo should say, "Listen, you you're messing up with, with our brothers. You know what? You're not what, what's that thing they use for cell phone that they get from Cong Congo? What's that? Cold time. Yeah, we'll we, we're gonna with, with we're gonna withhold that. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine all the African countries say the same thing? Okay, you know China, whoever Europe, you you guys gotta go. You gotta go. We can't travel. You can't stay here. Africa likes to play gentlemanly." in the midst of savagery and that that ain't gonna get us no place yeah L listen i learned my lesson with that and I, and I said being in this media industry i learned a long time ago and i, and I say this all the time you know what africa should do go tit for tat you fire me listen okay i'm going now you can't use any, any more of my work that's it put that short squeeze on them man 
Yeah. But I digress. Uh, I thought Azuliaism was still with us, but I guess not. Matron, what say you? You know, Mr. Untouchable said it very succinctly. I also don't think that they necessarily have the power to make these types of requests. They're looked at as the redheaded stepchild metaphorically anyway, like, you know, the one that don't nobody listen to, ain't nobody paying attention to. Um, and when they go into these media spaces and talk to, like you said, these white Brits, and Brits in general have a level of uh, ambivalence, contemptuousness, and uh, superiority that is um, communicated in their language and their body language and in their tone. It's just like, why are you going to beg a white bear for your daily bread? Go do something productive, like put a team of scientists and black minds on this problem. Yes, let's look at this as the blessing that it is. We won't be around the white people for once. Cut the cord. Stop it. So let's get down to the brass tacks of it. Is the African Union, which should be handling this type of stuff, is the African Union a help or hurt? I'll start with uh, Mr. Untouchable. Um, the African Union, as it stands right now, um, for me, for me, it, it seemed to they be they seem to be a, a very like a puppet or um, um, organization. I kind of tend to lean towards the Pan African Union, mm -hmm. you know, with um with Julius Malema. Them, you know, mm -hmm. I, I I tend to lean towards them. Yeah, I, I don't I don't necessarily I think the African Union is really just I don't know. I don't think that they have the, the teeth that they need and they mm -hmm. just really pirating the ideas and views of their Western counterparts. That's what I believe about the African. I may be wrong, but I said I trust they fire Dr. Aracado and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know I mean that speaks for itself for me mm -hmm. personally, but mm -hmm. you know that, they have issues for me, you know. Uh matron, you get the last word. Nope, I'm done. That's just what it is. They they can just go and they are not useful and they are not exceptionally helpful. They've they've lost their way. Tito District in the chat says they're so detached and cold. And then she puts up the symbol of a scissors. You know, we gotta cut them, we gotta cut them off. Um the House Rally podcast just earlier said the variant is the equivalent of a head cold. Very mild symptoms, according to the scientists who discovered it. This is a punishment to Africa for largely rejecting the job. You know, the thing, uh, Hashi Ali Podcast brings up a, a good point, too. They are trying very hard, and they've been trying very hard to make this an African thing. They, you know, if you say China virus, they'll say you're racist, but they have no problem saying the South African variant. Right, and like the lady said, if this thing had come out of the Congo, Africa would be in a whole heap of trouble right now. They've been wondering how come Africans ain't dying from this thing the way Europeans are dying from this thing, right? I mean, they've literally had like newspaper and magazine articles where the headline is like something along the lines of "Why ain't more Africans dying?" You know, so that's that's true. That you know what the Harsh Reality Podcast brought up, and he also says, "Hey, yep." Uh, number one export of Ghana is gold. How about they hold on to that resource since they are banning Africans? If you're banning Africans, ban the shit under our feet. And and Koku, you heard that this thing was brought in from Europe. It didn't right. it, it didn't originate there. Mm -hmm. It was a diplomat that brought it in. A, a fully vaccinated diplomat. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that part just today. You know. So that, that's something we have to keep an eye on as well and be mindful of as well. The games, again, it's war. These games that they play, man, it's it's interesting. Tito District in the chat says they were praying so hard for Africans to suffer from C-19. They're upset that they are, the, the Europeans are, the epicenter. Oh, there's another thing they were saying. I know it's a, it's, it, it, it's a pandemic, but in their community, like recently I, I did a search on Google you know about the you know I love reading about the opioid addicts, right? It's mostly white people that's dying from it. Yeah. Now they're trying to put it as a face, of, as black people as the face of it. I'm like, I'm I don't see black people dying from opioids. All I still see is white junkies when, when I go to Staten Island. Right. You go by the the ferry coming out from the mall, 
All you see is them, them, them junkies there begging for money to get high. Yeah, so, I mean, I think we covered this prompt pretty well. Let's go to the final prompt of tonight. Before we go to the final prompt of the night, though, let me just remind you guys that uh, there is a merch store. Uh, you can go to tshirtepiphanies.com and access all the merch that's there for all the shows. You can support any and all the shows on the network. Uh, the size being updated, you'll see that there's different colors, there's different designs now, there's different items like mugs and whatnot. So you guys, again, if you want to support small channels like these that are trying to be a media outlet for our people, just do things like that. Donate or uh, purchase uh, merch, etc. Um, the uh, the last thing I want to mention too before we tackle the last prompt is that we do have that spaces coming up tomorrow on Twitter, um, Eastern Standard Time. I think it's ho- it's going to be hosted by the Pro Black Perspective, so you could go and follow Onitase. I think it's at Onitase fifty six. I think it is on Twitter. Uh, but if you look up the Pro Black Perspective, you'll find it as well. If you follow me, you're probably following him as well, and the Matron, Kevin Carre, et cetera. But make sure you you guys come through, man. Let's try to get this space to be 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 popping. Let's get people in there, and also let's get people talking while in there. Uh, Matron, is there anything you want to add about the space coming up tomorrow? No, I just um, hope we en- I hope you guys enjoy it. It's going to be good. Come talk to us about it. (laughs) Absolutely. So let me put up prompt number 10. This is the final prompt of the night. Uh, Mr. Bobby, Dr. Bobby, right in the chat is saying that the African Union is funded by the EU. Well, you know, if you're, if you're, who funds you controls you, right? So that tells you all about the bite and the backbone that you would find coming from the African Union. So prompt number 10 is up. Uh, prompt number 10 says this nonsense, and you're going to see what the nonsense is in a second, has over 1 million views and is the most emasculating shit I've ever seen. They are coming for our boys full speed now. This must be addressed. So let me just hit you all with this video. And just for YouTube before they try to mess with me or something. This is uh this is fair use commentary of this uh this piece of music, I guess you could call it, that I'm gonna play. So this is fair use, right? So you guys check this out. Let me know what you think. MC, make another hit. Yeah. Project, project, X, X, X. Hey, turn me up. Hey, turn me up. 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 Turn me up
Shake that ass. 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 Shake that ass.
You know, they're like experimenting and different things like that. Where are the adults in their life? And this is just a failure because they're doing this, trying to gain some type of popularity, notoriety, trying to get some exposure and trying to generate uh, money, right? Using what the only thing that they may think that they have. And it's just really sad because... Uh, one of the things that I looked at is that the main kid that's doing the uh, performing has on short pants. And it reminds me of how I was taught to think that white people think about short pants and knickerbockers and that transcendence into manhood where you no longer have to wear short pants. And now the main performer, the feature of this experience is the one wearing the short pants. So what hope do any of the others that even though they might have all long pants, what hope do they have to ever ascend into masculinity and manhood if their leader is a child? One of the things I remember about getting out of primary school back home was I was happy to get out them short pants when I was going to go to CI. Uh, Mr. Untouchable, what say you to this? Here's where I am with this. And forgive me. Y'all forgive me. Because, because just consider this. Just consider. Because oh, I boy. understand I understand who is watching this. We are, as older people are watching these teeny boppers doing what they're doing. And it seems very crazy and insane. But they're kids. You know what I mean? And I think the one million views are probably from other kids too. And it seems like they're having fun and just being very expressive and animated. And I think that that's the draw. They are, we could go over the lyrics of what they are saying, but remember now, remember now when it was our time or uh, Ice Cube and, and, and Biggie and, and Tupac and the shit that was coming out of their mouth, you know, but they wasn't talking about they wasn't talking about sucking dick though. No, but I think that that reference really was not to suggest that he wanted to suck dick, but he wanted a girl to suck. I'm thinking, I sure, I I'm thinking, but Wait, I I would just say, <laughs> hold on, though. hold on, now. just consider, just hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. But just consider that if you really look a little bit deeper, he played. Um, Ray Charles hit the road, Jack. He referenced that. He referenced Lauren Hill. He went back almost two and three generations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to to he obviously doing some research into his musical past, and he adjoining that on to the, the lyrics that he trying to create right now for himself. I, I just, I understand the audience. And it's not necessarily music that I would want my kids to listen to because it's garbage. It's gobbly good. <laughs> but 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 consider when we was listening to like, like a Buster Rhymes, you know what I mean? Back in the day, it sounded like, to our parents and me, it sounded like gobbly goo too. You know what I mean? But it was there was some bopping shit for us from back in the day. So I just think that we are looking at it with adult eyes and eyes that are very literate and, in, and very critical in our analysis of things. And you just these guys are very young and they seem to be just having fun. I don't I don't want to get into that big stick and beat them up too bad. That's where I am with it. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, I I I I agree with that. I'm stuttering here. I agree with what you're saying, Mr. Untouchable. And yeah, there is some of that going back to into our musical cultural history to get beats and different things like that, just like rappers did back in the day. But I think that we have to bring in a level of lyrical consciousness, Absolutely. right? Because what happens is that because nobody came back to reset like a loop beat or a Tupac beat to something even more conscious because they didn't reclaim hip hop for what some mm -hmm. of the elders of hip hop say hip hop was meant for because they stopped teaching while rhyming and being lyrical. We have this horror culture situation right now. And so what I'm saying 
from my perspective is that I absolutely agree and understand what you're saying. You know, as kids being kids, as kids having fun, but like most of us loved hip hop too. Most of us loved Eric B and Rakim. Most of us loved KRS one. Most of us love, um, Africa Bombada. Most of us love Queen Latifah, whether she was, you know, UNITY or, you know, she was whatever, you know what I'm saying? But then we also got to liking the MC Light, who's a lesbian talking about she want a roughneck. And so, you know, we, we have to go back and reclaim our low culture and challenge them to be elevated and give them a, a, a lyrical consciousness and, and show them the true responsibility of a bard instead of just letting, letting it go and letting it slide and oh they're let the kids be kids and oh they'll grow out of it no you cultivate the kids that you want and you 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 can't just let that ride like you know all these uh homoerotic references all of this emasculation all of this you know all of these different things that's all i'm saying i hear you i hear your system yeah i that, that i think um i think the matron centered it back where it needed to be centered in that it's one thing to be young and dumb and talking stupid, loopy, Looney Tunes type shit, right? Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to kind of normalize this agenda against us, bringing the LGBTQ stuff to us, uh, the incarceration and what they allow to occur in the prisons and all this kind of stuff. You know, I think we have to we have to cut this shit out now. And I think Matron made a great point which I hadn't even considered, and I'm into making music, is like, if you think about everyone who's come along and rocked a popular, like a big Tupac beat, they've always come and talked more and more stupid shit. No one ever came back and grabbed it, like the, like the, like the, like the famous diss record, um, this for big, I forget the name. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name. No one ever came back and po made that something positive and made it bump in and put it out there. So we we definitely have to see these messages and be like, nah, you, nah, nah, nah. We can't let that slide. You know, uh, Tito District says, didn't Biggie have some lyrics about raping a child? Yeah, and that was some bullshit too. But because that was some bullshit don't mean we must let this bullshit slide either. And, and by the way, Biggie was criticized for that too. Right, um, the Harsh Reality podcast says Kare is tripping. I, I think he meant Mr. Untouchable because Kare didn't talk. Mr. Untouchable tripping. This yeah, I'm, I'm just sitting in the cut, man. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I said nothing. This part of a bigger agenda, Billy Porter on Sesame Street. Now, this, nah, bro, this ain't comparable to gangster rap. I'm 36. Okay. Well, one okay. second, he says, yeah. I'm 36, and the youth aren't that foreign to me yet. This is the continuing of the rainbow and buck breaking agenda. Mr. Untouchable, you wanted to add something. I, like I say, I think the reference was really to, was, I mean, it looked kind of suspicious, but it was really just referencing what possibly a girl would do to him. I, I personally believe that that was, that was his intent behind the reference. But I would say this. Yeah. It, it, remember now, now we are, um, living in a, in a culture where it's over overly sexualized you know i'm overly sexualized back then it was it was some overly gangster business you know everything was gangster 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 and that played out in a very bad way now it's just over emasculation over sexualization of young kids and it's playing out. but i just i don't know man i have a <laughs> i don't know i don't want us to become the, um, the expression police or the word police, even though we, we probably have to because we are in a position of, of responsibility. You know what I mean? Uh, but to suggest uh, you are telling children what they could say and what they can't say, they're going to rebel against that. You know what I mean? They're going to say cr more crazy shit, probably. Think of more contrived bullshit to say. But I, I believe in the education. I believe in the proper instruction. I believe that children should be presented with another idea in their head. You know, they could be outrageous and ridiculous, but they should also be presented with another side to it. That's what I think. I I I, I will say this. Um, um I, I get the notion of you know, if you start to police them, so to speak, they're they're just gonna rebel even more. The thing about it is this 
there's always been, I talked about this on a shoot the breeze several weeks ago when I played that uh, Bessie Smith uh, song where she was talking about sucking dick and a nipple long as a thumb and all that old shit back in the 30s or the 20s or something like that. The thing is that that music was not mainstream. What 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 the Hot Shotty podcast who 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 posted this prompt is trying to get at is like this kid already has like a million views, right? Other kids think it's the hot shit, so it's gonna go up even from there, right? And this kind of music, it, it wasn't until I want to say it wasn't really till maybe Luke hit. Uncle Luke hit with that song back in the day, Doodle Brown and all that stuff. You didn't really have that as like the, and I think that's why Luke got so much shit too, by the way. That, that, that music, you have to go down in certain places to go hear that type of shit, to hear this type of music here, to see that kind of imagery. It wasn't mainstream. Like in, in, in like in the Caribbean, what's the main, what's, until, until Jamaica started doing this dance hall that they've been doing the last, just last generation or so. All the Caribbean music was really about having a good time, juicing some gals, drinking rum, right, and, and and dancing or something, things of that nature. But there were people who was doing outrageous music too. We just didn't really know about it because no one would ever dare make that mainstream to make that the inspiration for young generations coming up. And I think that's the thing that's changed now. And I think that's the concern here that this is going mainstream now, you know? I'm sure there's kids this kid's age who's doing positive music. Maybe it might be even somewhat religious. Ain't no one checking for that shit. But this shit where he talking about sucking dick, 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 that, that shit is what's out there. And that's, we can't allow that to be popular. They could do it if they want to. I'm not saying no. But the taste of the people who who make this stuff get big needs to change. I think is what ultimately needs to happen. Well, I would say this until, until we control the algorithms right. and, and, um, like, like this, this, these, these shows that we've been doing, um, as far as the, um, the shoot the breeze, I think that the, the views or the eyes on these shows should be a whole lot more, but I know in some way we are getting shadow banned and the people who control the algorithms let certain ideas get out into the world and restrict other ideas i really believe that me too you know so so these these kinds and like i say man i could be completely wrong um with this particular perspective yeah you know I mean? but i just i remember me being young once too and listening to, to doggy style and, and mm -hmm. you know I mean? get castigated for that shit mm -hmm. so i mean i don't want to be too judgmental on the on the young brothers but I understand what what um what your guys are saying. Like I said, I could be completely wrong and, and misread the whole scenario, but I just put myself in the shoes of these young guys when I was young. That's that's what I'm doing, I guess. Yeah, and I, I like I said, I absolutely agree with that. But there's no one to come back and and reclaim those beats for a more positive message to get through because, uh. Even like what Biggie, Biggie says some about, you know, raping a kid and some about some homosexual gay stuff. He had dropped some type of bar in one of his songs. Like all of them have that. Right. And we find ourselves because we know the beat and then the lyrics have sank into our subconscious. And when we hear it and things like that, we sit in there bobbing our heads and we're meditating on that. And it gets into the subconscious. And so we really have to incentivize or find some mechanism where artists that are conscious and aware that can rewrite those lyrics you know even if you just sit there and you just like okay what did they say let me find some better words to put in this space so that there are new words going on to and over these tracks and broadcasting that because the ear will tune to it and ear will hear it you know and these these people and these particular communities have gotten to the point where the industry, the algorithm, and even the masses at this point will incentivize these types of behaviors. And it's just like, hold on, wait a minute. You already sitting there reconstructing their tracks, reconstruct their lyrics and, and put something better and more conscious and more relevant and more useful over this music. I, I, Go. 
I think that, and I just want to quickly say this before someone else goes. Um, I think the difference between that time and now is, is the um, one-sidedness of the music. Because yes, there was a Snoop Dogg out there, but it was a Lauren Hill. It was a Fuji's. Yeah, you know I mean, it, it was, it was, it was a, a duality in the music. But right now, it, it's to me, it's an imbalance because you still have your conscious rappers out there. But there's such an imbalance with me growing up. Yes, I would listen to the, to the, to the rap music, but I also had Barris. I also had the reggae yeah. and something to balance that off. You know what I mean? It's like it's adding cut to the mix, not to make the, the product so strong because it's like, okay, I, I'm being influenced by this particular these particular ideas, but I'm also being influenced by these ideas over here. And sometimes these, these ideas... Um, coincide with one another some ideas defeat some ideas it, we, we are in a battle for ideas you know what i mean and and ultimately the person who is able to um control the distribution of a particular idea to a mass to the, a mass public they win at the end of the day whatever that idea may be you know what i mean whatever that idea may be in the chat, the Hash Ali podcast says, exactly, we weren't constantly flooded with the imagery. It wasn't on demand. You had to either get cable, late night music shows, go to clubs to hit a raunchy, 10-year-olds freely watching this. And that's the thing that we don't consider. We're in an age where young children, like I, I have a kid who's 11, and he, he has a phone. Young kids have a phone. I'm not sitting there all day monitoring because I know that I teach them, you know, what I teach them will cover them. Um, but a lot of these kids out here aren't, aren't in the same situation. They they have these phones, tablets, computers, this, that, and the other, TV. They got everything. And you're not there every second. And as a matter of fact, the worst part of it is when they go to school and or, or go to church or something and deal with these other kids out there who who are worldly so to speak. Uh, Kevin Kyra, you have anything to add to the conversation? Just one thing. Mm -hmm. When I was still in college, you know, I took a, a jazz history class. At one point, our grandparents, their parents didn't like jazz because it had a so-called negative influence. But now jazz is, you know, no one cares. It's 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 it's, an, it's a great American uh, mu music genre. Yeah, we've lost that now. We That genre, which is ours originally, we've kind of lost that now. Exactly. Um, and, and the other thing that we've got to think about is that when our genres get infiltrated by people that pretend to be black or people that pretend to have our best interests at heart, they are only bringing it down. Right. They are only bringing in the very worst of their culture to vilify and demonize <clears throat> and make a born and make a uh, excuse me, and make reprehensible aspects of our culture that should be reclaimed. I have a question. Uh, right. uh, do, do uh, as parents, do we, are we introducing our kids to other genres of music, other forms of music? Because if you think that the hip, some of the hip hop is toxic music, the child is, the ch really the child is a student, not only of their friends, but the child is a big student of their parents, what they sure. watch, what they listen to, what they hear. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that, I mean, as 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 adults, we should also introduce our children to other genres of music so they could appreciate it, so they could have an an, an out. You know, yes. if if you guys, uh, if some of us believe that that this brand of music is completely toxic, I think that if if they have an out, they will. Okay, I like hip hop, but I like country too. I like jazz too. I like soca. I like I like uh, zouk. I like um, uh, compa. You know what yeah. I mean? I I I can be very diverse in my understanding of music, so I ain't gonna just be caught up with one particular idea <laughs> of what music is supposed to be. I think that that's important as well. I was listening to, cause I, like I said, I'm a big music file person. I was listening to some heavy D the other night. And I was scrolling through the comments while listening to the song on YouTube. And um, I saw some young women, like women who were born like in 97 or something like that. 
And they were talking about how, yo, like when I was growing up, my parents used to play this music. And so I have this, you know, real strong appreciation for it. And I pity those, me, not me speaking personally, I pity those folks who never had that roundedness when it comes to like music and art and stuff like that. Like <clears throat> in the Caribbean, when I was growing up, you had kind of like seasons for music to a certain extent. Like, and, um, you know, like I mentioned, um, Luke earlier, like that, he had a, he had a, a small little season. And then when I was done, he was back to some roots reggae or some Calypso break and scrape or something like that. Um, but these kids, a lot of these kids, they get one thing and one thing only. If it's drill music that's out, that's what they get. And I think if I if I went through the lineup here in the chat and here on the panel, most of you, when you were growing up through your parents, you heard a mix of stuff. Your church music, your you know, gospel and all that stuff. You heard some, depending on where you're from, you heard something akin to berries or Sam Cook or you know, something of that nature. Um, in fact, Kari, I'll ask you, what was your musical experiences coming up? Uh, you know, I was in the 80s. One of the first things I saw was that song, you know, I was dating myself. It's, remember We Are The World? Yeah. That, I was listening to, we had variety back then. Even yeah. in Jamaica, then when I came to New York, the same thing. You had a country music station. You had, you know, Kiss FM, Hot 97. At one point, Kiss used to play a lot of a lot of um, gangster rap, but they stopped that and mm. went went to a more R and B thing. But now I think Kiss FM is uh, ESP or something got bought out. Yeah. Lib, remember Lib? Yeah. You know, you should listen to that on on, on Saturday all day from morning till from five a.m. till like midnight. You know, yeah. reggae, just Caribbean music. You yeah. know, David, David Levy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in when I got to high school, I had a love. I said, I, my, my high school is in the Lower East Side. I love house music. You know, b b before house, I, I liked um, which is disco transformed into house technically, and I like techno. All, so I, I had variety. But I said, right now, what? And I was talking to someone that that's been living that lived in Brooklyn for quite a while. In the eighties and nineties, Brooklyn had like a beat, like a drum. You know, that that was like the energy, mm -hmm. and. As soon as you start seeing more and more gentrification, that beat kind of died. The energy died. And I said, I remember late 80s, they used to have block parties, right? No one got shot. There was no violence. And those block parties went to like five in the morning. No one's calling the police. Right. You know, now it's just a different time. It's like they, you know, they, they do this precision surgery where they cut out certain things what was that? There was an FBI study in the '60s. They were saying they were studying music. They were like, if we keep this music going, these black people are going to turn on us. J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover um, funded that study. I forgot what it was. You, you know what? Matron, you, you might know what this is about, right? Yeah, I don't remember the name of the study, but they're always yes, I do remember that. Yeah. So as I said back then, different kids had different genres of music. You know, now it's just like most of the stations now. It's just it's just this version of hip hop, you know? And, and at least back then, even even the gangster rap, they all had a moral to the story. You know, now it's just about, oh, materialism, Gucci, Gucci, you know, and it's like a, a, a drone. It's a constant drone. And from what I'm not, I'm not a musicologist. What I'm seeing is it's like a different frequency they, they're playing the music at now than, than what it was in the 80s and 90s. Possible, um, possible. Mr. Untouchable, what say you to that same question? Well, well, well me and you are from the same place, but what was your experience? Uh, you know, you know what it is. Um, <laughs> Ray, uh, then uh, Buju, Barris, um, um, Sanchez, Sanchez um, Soka Artist. Um, I used to even I used to even hear once in a blue moon. I hear some some Haitian music once in yep. a blue moon because that that da, 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 is a funny thing. Christian music. Yeah. A lot of religious music, um, some rap, because I used to, you know, we had a satellite dish. Mm. We had a satellite dish in our, back in the day. So we would catch MTV raps. So I was, you know, I used to listen to a lot of the, a lot of the New York based music coming yeah. <laughs> coming out of that, that area. Okay. So we used to catch like, you know, I, I, I used to listen to special ed and 
and um, uh, Slick Rick and, and all these KRS, all I, mm. I was introduced to these heavy D, these New York artists very early. Mm -hmm. So so it's just a mix of cultures, you know, and and um and it wasn't as as violent as it well. Let me say violent, but the music it did has changed very much. Let me put it like that. Even even uh, Caribbean music has changed, uh, especially the dancehall reggae. But um, um, I, I just think that the influence is important, and I think that we should diversify the things that we listen to and don't all don't get pigeon. And you know, another thing too, we also used to catch a, a country music. Uh, predominant country music station. So I grew up listening to a lot of country music too as well. So I think that diversity even you know, on ZNS, uh which was the one channel we had, you know, radio yes. station and TV. Yes. Even on ZNS, you had times where you could tune in and hear like country music. Absolutely. Like early in the morning or late at night or something like that. Yes, sir. Yeah, Kenny um, Rogers was big enough behind was big, big, big. <laughs> yes. Um this fella <laughs> who became a good actor? What's his name? Travis. Uh, you know, he had a song forever and ever. Oh, I know Travis. His name. I know who you're talking about. I forget his name. Ronnie yeah, Travis. Was Ronnie big Travis. Artist, Ronnie <laughs> that was big, right? Yes. So, yes, so we used yes. to get Don't forget that. Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Yes. Yeah. It was so we used to get that huge music. Huge artists in the Caribbean. Yeah. Huge, we used to and get you wouldn't all think it. Stuff. Yeah. You um, wouldn't think it. But the, not to just call off these white guys, but also we used to get like. Like Sam Cooke, I it's one of the like yes, earliest yes, songs I can remember yes, hearing. Yes, yes, a lot of the um the the Sam Cooke and uh, Smokey Robinson and you know it's just it was just a a melange of different kinds of music and I think that that's the difference between you know back then and now the music is just just one form and one fucking one part of the music and it's just the same consistent thing over and over again sold to a particular audience a very yes, young. Yeah young black male between the ages is maybe 16 and 35 and what is the outcome of that <laughs> yeah like essentially like, if you ask me like oh. the hot reality podcast is saying now he said it's mantras combined with the low bass he's correct frequencies coupled with the lyrics and drug culture creating zombies go ahead uh, Kari. yeah there was another thing in new york city i, I don't know if I, I think other markets got it too but a lot of kids i said my generation late 80s into the, in, so, in so much of the mid 90s you you had uh, something called video music box right with ralph mcdaniels you know right. they play all that stuff but you know times change you know t and also taste change that's true taste change that's true yeah uh azuliism is back on the panel what say you azuliism yo i didn't i didn't really see the video but the thing with music I used to blame this new generation. I'm not anymore. Let me tell you. When I was in Haiti, you know what I listened to? Michael Jackson was big. And one guy that was big in Haiti at the time was Lionel fucking Richie. Yeah. This he nigga cool. song, Hello? Yeah, man. Yo, him, Stevie Wonder, yeah. these guys were big in Haiti. And I'm not going to lie. The first hip-hop song I heard in Haiti was Salt and Pepper. Push it. Oh, push it. Uh, yeah, that's the song that broke the barrier that came here. And when I came to America, I started being cognizant of hip hop when I was in like when uh what was that song by Onyx um Slam the da da yeah, da -da. yeah but if you listen to that that album, bro, we were, yo they had a song called Me and Jack the Black Vagina Finder, yo. Let's not blame these kids. Yo, you know how they say we stand on everybody's shoulder? Yeah, the no music... one's blaming the kids, though. They're just, no, 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 no. I'm not no telling blaming. you. I'm just yeah. saying the way the music came, the way it came now, let's not say, oh, like, oh, hip-hop was all good. It was all about protecting the family. This is... Son, I listened to Onyx. It's just me and Jack, the Black Vagina Finder. My man, I was 13. When I'm listening to the words now, it's disturbing. Music has gone down totally. I agree with you. There was some time, like, I used to go to Ditmas. Yo, you know that rap group that used to dress up? Yo, they used to be all around Dit, around court, tell you, oh, the X-Clan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The X-Clan used to come around the schools. Yo, after that gangster rap took over, bro, well, it I, was over. I was waiting for you to finish to tell you that 
the, the, the problem with what you're saying is that you're acting like hip hop started with Onyx and those guys. No, hip hop hip hop started on a more positive slant. And by the time we came around to, you know, coming from the Caribbean and, and coming to America, by the time we came around to really getting ensconced in hip hop, it was Onyx. It was um what's these dudes from downtown from, from, from Brooklyn here? Uh Annie Up. Uh what's that? what's some dudes again? M O B. MO, yeah, right? Like that's who was doing they shit at the time when we came up. So they were we it was already fucked. You you you, you see this, what I'm but saying? This, but this is what I'm saying. We, like I used to like we want to blame these kids or it's drugs, this and that and the third, but these kids would not come and play that music unless there was a ladder for it from before. You understand what I'm saying? It's yeah. like we want to blame Nicki Minaj for being disrespectful. So have you heard of Little Kim song? Yeah. Yo, let's go even into hip hop, uh, and into dance hall. But, but but hold on, side note, side note. Kim was never as big and as pushed as the Meg Thee Stallions, the Cardi B's. I don't know. Kim was big. Kim, the only she person big. I think she was big, but she wasn't pushed like these women are pushed today. Well, well, it all started with Little Kim. Did you see? You remember that poster? Yeah. The Remember that poster? And I'm gonna push back even on dance hall. They got, yo, I loved in dance hall, the old dance hall. There's a song called "By Far." Get out of the bully point. What the? What is he talking about, bro? <laughs> Come no, I, on! I, I remember. Black Pat people Trump. have a de- black I people have Pat affinity Trump. for 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 sexual deviant songs. Like it's crazy. <laughs> You want to talk about these people? I say, yo, go <laughs> listen back to that song. By far, yelling on it. What? But but Gunner, if you, you think about, about this body rider, Gu- yeah, Gunner, what's what you talk about? <laughs> no, it goes. I can, um, I, can't, I, I can't sing it right, but it goes by far. Yelling on the pony pointer. I beat the yelling on the body rider. Yeah, yeah. What? But that was about making money, though. Like that was about what would actually sell. There are distribution deals, right? That they say they are not going to put you in their spin cycle if you don't have this type of appeal right. to it. There are specific things that they incentivize. And so if we look at the fact that they always try to create a concubine perspective and position for us, then of course that's what the music is going to reflect. So why can't of they course, do that? Of course they- that's what's going to be pushed. But what happens is that we don't hold the line. I'm not saying that it's not our fault because I saw a black woman fuck up a little boy and a little girl just in the fact that she decided to expose her kids to all different kinds of music and she didn't gatekeep what their experiences were. And then when I had an opportunity to impact young people from the very beginning and they were prepared in a different environment, they had very different results because even though they knew all these other things existed, they weren't intrigued by it. They had already established a pattern and they had a different presence. It's like, oh yeah, that's cool. I know what that is. I'm not interested in that. I want to listen to this gospel music. I want to listen to this chamber music. I want to listen to this classical music. I want to listen to this Stevie Wonder. I want to listen to this, this, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you create the children that exist in the world. And when you got a mama, that's blowing weed in her children's faces, that's twerking with her children, that's sitting up there exposing them to all this low frequency crap and you don't have nobody sitting there letting them know no listen that's not the way you're supposed to do this then you fuck up a generation and that's what we're dealing with which is why I say that us, that, that the high culture has to go back and lift up the low culture if we want any type of collective progress what I'm, I understand what you're saying. They can't sell that music to, to the, to the, to. They can't go to Ben, um, to Benson Hurst and be like, "Yo, give this music to this to, to their white kids." The, this certain type of music. Um, or, the, or, or, or yeah. so they, they've been buying that music for years. They they outbuy us in the in that music. Yeah. Yo, they outbuy us to be cool. Money on it. They outbuy us to be cool, but they don't buy it like we. My man, if you play a DMX music, 
when DMX was fire, when DMX was hard, right? Was bang 98, 99. Just say fire. Just say fire. Fire. Pause. Yeah. That music, DMX, DMX is a such a carry. Yo, that music moves you. Music moves you. Yes, they, they listen to that music, but they don't take that music on, on. It's entertainment for them. Well, the thing is, the music is tied to the, the <clears throat> music. The music is the cultural product, right? So they, they don't vibe with it because they're not a part of the culture. So it will influence those kids who are in and from the culture. Yo, you men, the mafia, the mafia, Italian mafia who are into all this killing, killing, into, don't let these kids listen to those type of music. But they can't stop them. That's a new generation. They can not like it, but there's nothing they can do about it. As you, what as, do you mean they cannot? As, yo, wait, wait, yo, wait, wait. As, I don't understand what you mean. As, the music is not listen, affecting listen. them like it's affecting us. As um, Koku said, yeah, you, you, you can, you know, you, you can try and stop it, but you can't watch your kid twenty four seven. Even with me, my mother, she hated Snoop Doggy Dog, but when she wasn't around, I play that shit. When when she when I, when she was in the house, I went to my friend's house to go listen to it. You can't stop it. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay, and then so then we f. So that's what you're saying. I'm Let not saying we have to do. Listen, nobody we were, could we were, stop them. They were, they were saying we we were the we the generation X. We're the screwed up generation. Look where we are now. We're not screwed up. What are we? We, we, we grew. We grew up. Are, are we self? Okay. Not all of us, but you know, some of us are self destruct. But not all of us are. We came of age. A lot of that stuff got burned out of us. So then, why are we? So so why are we mad about this new thing that we posted? Let it rock then. It's no it don't affect. So, so why are we, why are we even, about why are we even talking about, about that then? Because it's um, it's piggybacking on the cultural. It, it's piggybacking on the culture to infuse something foreign once again. Like you wouldn't see no no black no young black man doing the gog gog three thousand in a music video like that like you know what i mean twerking and all it's this for entertainment kind of... purposes bro they're not taking it on they're not gonna do that who who's so why, why are we who's why they? are we fighting this just let it rock who's they who's they is not taking it on our culture the kids the kids are not taking it on in our Cause, culture because 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 in, in, Kyrie in our just culture? Said, yeah he just said that he listened to it and we didn't take it on nobody takes it on like that so i'm saying if it's not the case, so why we even worry about all of this? Let them do their Gog Gog 3000 because they're going to wake up one day. It was just for entertainment. If music don't have that effect on us, especially on, uh, on it the, does the have youth. That on us. What you said? It, music absolutely does have an effect on us. Us especially. It's us especially that music has an effect. They know that too. We are we are rhythm people. They know this shit, and like um, D Web said about the mantras on top of on top of beats, and all, they they know that's our shit. Kanye West said something. He had an interview on on I don't know if anybody watched it, um, and he also was talking about the eight hundred eight beats is a very low yes. frequency beat low maker or something, yeah. right? And he was he, the same thing that uh, I, the same thing you said, Goku. He was dropping the science on there. He said that the 808 is a low vibration music. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that which, I agree. Which matches up with that drug culture that they've also pushed on us now too. It matches. So that so this is what they're doing. So if they if they can match that and then match that with their foreign bullshit, what you think they're gonna be doing with the sexuality through the same music and music imagery? Once, once they, I'm, I'm, yo, if 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 they're gonna listen to it regardless and not listening to us, yo, what can what can we do? We can limit the we can limit the proliferation of other artists that cause that's how this stuff works, right? All it takes is for one dude to hit, right? This is what the hope was with um uh old country road fella, right? Nas X, little Nas X. Right, if they could get that one person to really hit and really resonate to the point where you become mindless behind the music, you don't even pay attention to what it is they're 
they're pushing. You don't even pay attention to the imagery. What I'm yo, we're done. Goku, Goku, what I'm saying is it sounds harsh. The reason why they are able to sell us that music, because deep down, we vibe with that. Because anybody know the the, the, the group name um Metallica? They, they made us vibe with that, but go ahead. Yes. You, you ever heard of Metallica? Yes, absolutely. Enter most, Sandman. Black, most black people don't listen to Metallica. They can't sell Metallica to you. I like because I we don't... Metallica. That's a good okay. I like that band actually. Yes, I understand what you're saying, um, Kyrie. But what I'm saying is that most black people don't listen to Metallica. Most black people don't listen to Nirvana. Nirvana bands don't cater to black people. Why don't they try to sell us that music? I mean, yeah, what can, what can you do? What I'm saying is that they can, yes, we could say, oh, they sponsoring that type of music, but I, this is what I'm saying. We cannot blame the bear maker. Maybe there's that type of music. We resonate with that type of music on some low level frequency that we need to self, self introspect and look in the mirror because it, it's not, it's not hip hop. Yo, Haitian music is trash now. Like the compa is so vulgar. You are out of your freaking mind with that statement. Haitian music. No, 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 no. Okay, listen to Mr. Mr. Untouchable. The instrumentals fire, but I'm listening to the words. I'm listening to what they say. Okay, okay. There's a there's there's a new type of Haitian music called Lab or Die. It's like the way they speak in there is very vulgar, bro. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, because that shit is patient music is freaking fire. <laughs> Look, but, I'm not what I'm saying is we I'm not only labeling hip hop or even dance hall or even so, all the you know, black music has gone down vibrationally. The music yeah. is trash. We, we, yeah, I think we all understand that. Brazilianism, also, you, you gotta understand something too. I used to go to a lot of after school programs where they taught music and art. Remember that matron too? Your school used to do the same thing too, right? Remember those times? I was in a choir from the time I was nine until I was 27. Different community choirs and different things like that. Yes, music yeah. was a part of our life. And in the, um, I think in like 97, between 97 and 2001, they completely defunded community exactly. art programs. And this is our fault too, though, because when they began to defund community art programs, the people with the time, talent, and ability did not go back and say, bump it, I'll do it for free. Bump it, this is my community, because we were taught to run and we continue to run. Now, I don't necessarily agree with what ER Zulism is saying about the fact that maybe we at this um, low vibrational debasing behavior resonates with the mass of us. Right. I think that our beats and our vibrations and our tones are being weaponized against us because just like I use this voice that I've been given to talk to you guys here on the radio station as often as I do. I could also be girl six. Okay. And what's true is that I make a choice as to how to use that and be, and being girl six is more profitable. Uh, let me add that to, to that mix. He's being like, girl I, I, six, being girl six would be super duper freaking profitable, but I am turning away from that economy because I've decided that there is something more important and more prescient regarding my continued existence and survival that's necessary and we need to be able to convince and inspire other people to make that decision because again we are only representative over the long haul of the lowest people in our culture and if we continue to let them just fall by the wayside down the deep dark hole of despair debasement and destruction we will all be destroyed amen um, Nathan, you do have a girl six voice by the way <laughs> no comment um any last comments on this prompt or anything we did tonight before we shut it out? I really enjoyed this. It's like every week it gets better and better and better. 
it's like we're we're maturing like a fine wine. This this crew, I'm I'm just proud to be part of your 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 podcast and having all you guys as colleagues, man. It's it's always fun, always. Likewise, Yo, I'm a, I want I want to say something. I'm not done with the thing. If we compare, it's not even music. Let's compare how many people saw Nat Turner's um, Breath of a Nation versus a Medea a Medea soap opera movie. Most black people saw that. Why would you go see more of Tyler Perry's movie than go see a movie like um uh, um even yeah, the movie that Coco, Coco just spoke about? They've been the, trained the, that way. Huh? They've been trained to to choose that option. That's no, nah, like, Coco. We can't say that. We gotta be. How come me and you don't do it? Because we broke free of it. We change our education. You see. We change the people we were around. Most of our folks are stuck like a fit. We a lot of us are on a fixed cast. And we're stuck in this area. And these folks, our opponents, know they have us stuck. And so we just gotta we just gotta wade through whatever shit they pour inside our community. Yeah. Some of us, some of us will, I'm sorry, some of us will 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 wade a little bit better, stay on top, stay above waters better. Some of uh, many of us will sink. Kari, go ahead. Yeah, our community is not more than the dumping ground for every other group. And you so know, we soak and, that up. And and we have to stop that. We we have yes. to, as they call it in in in, in the pol in political terms, we have to have a stop gap measure. We have to have this. We have to stop all these foreigners from coming in here and telling us what to do. You know, oh, we're we're your brothers. No, you're not my brother. You're not my people. Like the matron yeah, said, like the matron said, some of these guys who want to get on, like this Ice Speedway, whatever his name is here, these guys who want to get on, to get on, they're going to have to sign a contract that makes sure, legally, that they have to put out certain shit music. Low vibrational energy stuff. This is where the game is now. This is where, this is where they've taken that war now. I want to say this thing, which is, I was listening to matron the other day, Matron mentioned something about, and it's not only Matron. A lot of people want to attack NWA, saying NWA was very ratchet, was calling women the B word bitches and that, right? I think NWA was very revolutionary. The music, Ice Cube, I think Ice Cube is top five rapper. Listen to his shit lyrically. He doesn't only talk about the low vibration. He talks a lot of politics in his stuff. So a lot of people say, listen to NWA and say NWA was the starter of the destruction of hip hop. I don't think so. They like they, NW. Go ahead, sorry. They they were in the sense that the songs that that vibrated a little bit higher. I gotta mute that. Shit. God damn. The songs that vibrated a little bit higher, say on their first album. I can't. I knew I had the album. I can't remember the whole album now. But the songs that might have had a little bit more something to them. That's not what the what the what the labels got the uh, uh, stations, the radio stations to play. That's not what they pumped to our kids, and we, because we don't control this shit, our kids just soak that up. It's not something innate in us. It's what they've created. They've created this shit that you see out here now. It's untouched by thing. You want to say something? No, I I, I kind of tend to to side with Azuli in one particular thing. Remember the um, supply and demand. Yeah. And I, I think that no one is holding a gun to no one's head and forcing them to listen to any form of music. I, I think that that we have a degree of agency and we can't just say that that we being um, indoctrinated and instructed with the degree we are, but I believe that we also have agency and a responsibility and there's something that is a draw to certain kinds of music that we like to listen to. Maybe it's a society that we live in. Maybe it's just how we've been trained. I don't know. You know, no, they, they 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 piggyback off of the stuff that they know we like innately. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right. Like when I was, uh, and by the way, thank you for the girl six compliment. I appreciate that. Okay, it's one I get often. Uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> Dust your but, off there. Okay. <laughs> but 
that's that's what I was talking about when I said we never went to go put new lyrics, our messages over those tracks. Like Medea is popular because first and foremost, we have been trained to laugh at our pain. We've been traumatized. Every black person suffers from a version of Stockholm syndrome. And you have to first recognize that you are ill in order to come get the bitter medicine, in order to be healed, right? But we, when, when D Webb talks about the fact that the mass majority of our people are not going to wake up, he's talking about the adults, and that's why we all focus on on saying things like we have to start programs and institutions for the young people. Yes, we do have to have institutions for the adults and things like that. That would be great, but we're not going to get most of them. We might get some of their consciousness reclaimed, but guess what? We just got to wait for that energy to transcend and come back to us because get, they are gone. There are lots of ideas that they have out there. They studied us for hundreds of years. And then after studying us, they minimized our societies and cultures to the very least of us. And then they bred us and killed the very strongest of us. 118 years ago, do you think any of us would be alive? I would probably be lynched. OK, let's just be honest here with what we're dealing with. And we need to stop. I, saying, I'm a little light. I'm a little light. I might have been in the house. So <laughs> you. So, so I just want you all to understand what we're really dealing with in regards to the population that we're even beginning to start with. You know, and, and I do agree. We do have some level of agency. Right. But that woman that's getting welfare or that's able to cycle through different classes of men and get some of her needs met sometimes and then go over to white zaddy and fulfill some other little task or go sell her sexual wares and become an ig model we know what that is or whatever or sell debasing ideas and music to somebody or sell hope to a fat chick thinking that she gonna suck down the weight by drinking the weight loss tea and buying and wearing a waist trainer or whatever Right. As long as those types of economies are allowed to thrive and be popular in our culture, then we're not going to be able to capture those adults. But people will always, always, always turn over their non adult or age of majority children to what has been deemed qualified as a responsible adult. And if you provide programs for those people, you can build a new people because white people do that every day. What do you think they're doing over there in them orphanages outside of molesting those kids? What do you think they're doing? Why do you think neocolonialism is so prolific? Why do you think we have so many people that are educated that work against us? And I'm sorry, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now, but thank you. Matron, you said something about when things going down, the high, the high part of uh, of our social society goes down, and the low part remains. And you said, "How?" Okay, has anybody watched that movie? It's it, it was by Spike Lee. It's it's called um, "She's Got to Have It," right? Yeah. They made a, a TV series on it. Mm -hmm. She's got to have it. Right? Have any? Has anybody seen that? That that, that the movie and the yeah. um the TV the, show. The movie was very good. The, the the season one was good. I didn't watch season two. The movie was excellent, though. My thing, I I, I and you see, okay, I, this is how we get the children that we have today. Spike Lee created a character where all the woman wanted to do was be a hoe. And let's be honest, the movie was better because was a little bit this the season. This is what I'm seeing. The people who are in charge, who are supposed to help the lower people with their frequency, are the one permeating the, the society with this type of I agree. Of of, of characters. I agree. So what, what, what makes so let me finish. Five, please. Okay. Let me finish. And the and the and the season and the TV show. The Nola Darlings goes into a school and becomes a, a, a art teacher. One of the girls 
draws something, draws herself with a bathing suit on, squatting over like little Kim. And stuff like that. And if you watch that, the, 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 the principal is telling Nola Darling, we can't have the kids do that. But at the end of the day, the movie's pro the little girl expressing herself that way. So I'm saying that we're talking about like Bill Cosby, for example. If you ask the majority of people which one they prefer, the Cosby show or the Wayne Brothers show? Most black people would say the Wayne the Wayne's Brothers show is better than Bill Cosby show. I, I agree. But so, that's due to the indoctrination. That's not due to some defect in their genetics. No, I okay, okay I get so so it, yes, Goku. So now let's say this. Don't you think Spike Lee did the people a disservice? The way he brought out that story with the with the sexual deviancy that was going on in that whole season. I agree. So how could we blame like who who's responsible for who? Who's responsible to build uh 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 the 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 the, the we social are. we are the, the the educated people or the people who are, who are not the ones who know better do better but but the knowns but Goku the one who knows better are not even doing that now and that's our problem so we done man and that's why I agree sure. with you that I, I agree with you Mister Untouchable in that we have personal responsibility in this I agree with that a hundred percent. But I want to make it clear that it's not, we don't have responsibility in this because of some genetic defect. It's not a genetic defect. It's what they've been pumping. It's the bullshit that they're pumping into the culture. They're hitting you in your culture. Your culture is based on their, is based on their economy. I want us to be very careful because we throw in around words. Very careful because I hear the word the educated, what's that mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's where I am with that bullshit. You know, because because this guy goes to a so-called black university that makes him educated, because he understands how to make movies, that's what makes him educated. I don't know. I would say no, I don't saying, know about that. No, I okay. no, that doesn't make him educated. Not at not at all. And and also let me let me just say this, Azuli, you you could go. When the Cosby show was on. The Cosby Show was, I think it was the number one rated show in the United States of America. That's a fact. So when you say that black people would prefer the Wayans Brothers, I don't know about that. I don't know yeah. about that. That's not true either. Um, it's not? Because when, okay. Well, no, no, let me say this. I'm saying what E.R. Zulism said, right? Okay. That is not a true statement because kids are no longer introduced to the Cosby Show because when you get kids together and you just turn it on right the beat for the intro music was catchy and they played usually at the end classical music and they had some jazz and things like that it had relatable messages and I've done this right even when he was going through his legal problems and it wasn't the kids that turned their backs on the Cosby show it was parents calling me to say why was I showing this to their kids because that man was a this or that man was a that when it's like no we don't know yet and it doesn't negate the message did you stop watching and I really asked them this question did you stop watching Little House on the Prairie or did you stop watching Seventh? Um, what was it called the other show Stairway to Heaven Seventh Heaven or Seventh Heaven some, something heaven. something with uh right and then there was another show that had Michael Landon on it right where he was like an angel or something yeah. but none of none of these other shows that have these horrible reprehensible white people do you do you want to stop and take your social capital and your eyeballs away from but bill cosby who has a message that's relatable that work through problems in the dynamic of a actual functioning black family you want to take your capital away from that so you just like what i had to do because they are available on amazon for free most of the seasons and, and most of the stories and what i would do is i would just put that on a loop cycle in the environment that i was in so that the kids would get some exposure to it and they will watch that and yeah homie the clown was funny and this this that and the other but homie the clown did not directly compete with the cosby show those were two totally different eras no i'm when i'm seeing this um patron matron i'm not talking about the kids i'm talking about the adults like the, the people that yo. Know, if you ask people now they will tell you 
they, their favorite show is the Wayne Brothers and shit like that. Depends I'm on seeing, who you're around, bro. <laughs> Depends on who you're around. <laughs> Depends, all right. We should make change a poll. The circle. Change the circle, bro. <laughs> it's not about changing the circles. It's about, yo, my dude, they got educated people that talk about Megan the Stallion. It's you a saying, good rapper. Saying it's, you like you, like, again, it's really, you're using a word very loosely. Word no, I mean, educated mean, I mean, bro. No, I mean, people, okay, I'll put it on quotation. So called educated people. Okay. Okay. So whenever I say educated people, I don't mean like people you like you can us say or... degree people. You can say people All with right, pastors. You know what? You know yep. what? Degree people. <laughs> oh, yes. Degree having okay. people. That's good. That's fine. Matron, that's, that's fine. the best thing. You know what? From now on, degrees having people. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. I could I could get with that. That's what I, I mean. Really I don't need mean... some mad crazy so called degree degree people who are perceived as educated and they madder than the mad hatter. You know what I mean? So yeah. that don't mean jack shit for me personally. That don't mean jack shit for me. You know what I mean? An educated person is for me is someone who uh, understands certain things and can execute them and show and prove and it is productive or has some productive value. But that's just my interpretation. You know what I mean? But um, that educated word, we got to be very careful of that one. Very careful. Don't don't tell me because you have a doctor in front of your name that you have that that you have a right to speak on behalf of anyone but yourself. Right, Mister Untouchable. The OGs used to call that you're educated, not educated. I, I agree with you, Gary. That's true. Educated. At the end of the day, I feel like, um, based on this prompt, I feel like us. I'm not saying just us, us, but I'm saying that. Edu uh, not education, that the music, the, the art scene, the entertainment scene is very powerful, especially when you deal with, with social programming. Social programming is through the arts. It's through the arts. And it seems that a lot of us didn't understand that. Our parents didn't understand that. That propaganda with the social arts is crazy. So then, Gunnar, I mean, Azulism, we can't then say when we see this type of video here, we can't say just let it be. I'm not saying that. It's because because I was talking and people saying that. Oh, they, I, I was saying that. What I was saying is that how come they don't advertise those type of music to the kids in Bensonhurst, even though they listen to it, they don't take it on. Some that's what I'm saying. I be, I believe that it, it it has an effect on this. But but Kyrie said. He, when his mother told him not to listen to it, he was listening to it, and he turned out great. So then I have to say, okay, then then if music don't, some of us, it doesn't affect us that way, then what am I supposed to say? What? Am, why am I fighting oh, this? Also, you got to you gotta put in other factors, too. The food. You know, also, what we spoke about early. The, okay, I, I'll give you a good example. You know, I, I, I smoke the weed in, in New York. It's it, it's it, it it feels funny when you when you smoke it, like you, you feel dead. But when I went back to my country, the weed that was grown naturally, it, it, it just felt real it smelled different and it hit you different. Mm hmm That. Remember also something that, that little little Wendy got he, he almost got killed drinking that thing called scissor, something like that, drinking cough medicine and all it's like all these weird things that the rappers in the nineties never drank. Like rappers in '90s drank like Alize and all them, you know, Hennessy and all all them other stuff. But now you have all these. It's like a, how can I say this? It's like they're trying to outdo the next person. What can I do better? You know, what can I do more of? Let let me pop some Molly. You know, let, oh, well I'm taking some Molly. Let me, let me take some LSD. Let me drink some shroom. You know, all, all that stuff. It 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 of after taking that stuff for years, it affects the way you think. It it sometimes it warps your sense of reality. Like I like my project I did, you know, I used to hang around the Lower East Side. So I saw how a lot of these young people, it's like they were walking zombies. It's not just the music, it's it's a lot of other things we, we, we gotta put in there. The drugs, the food, all that stuff, the liquor. But I digress. No, I, I, I agree with you, dude. It's 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 a combination. <sighs> like when I came to America, all this dancing backwards with women, when I was in Haiti, that should never happen. You dance face to face with a girl. 
when I come to America, th that culture where you're winding up behind somebody and then daggering, and then that's the soca. Like, I've never seen that in my life. I would, so, I would, I would suggest everyone on this panel go to a Haitian party. <laughs> Just one time in their life. <laughs> yo, like, like I've that's never been Yo, yo, Mr. Untouchable, I, I, and I'm not trying to say Haitian people are better or nothing like that. Music wise, when I was in my country, I've never seen people dance like that with women. In a way, it's a respectable thing. I'm dancing face to face with you. Like when you dance in Compa, it's like a love dance, son. If you don't like that woman, mm -hmm, when yeah. I came to America, I went, as I got, I seen whining. I was like, what? I've never met that. I've never seen that in my life. Face down, butt up. That's the way we like to. <laughs> Freak Nick, we're gonna blame Freak your matron. We're gonna blame Freak Nick on 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 the white man too, on the barrel maker too. Freak Nick, that whole deck we're, is here. Here's the we're not sense, we're not blaming Freak Nick on the barrel maker, but if you've ever been to what was it called, hentaiism or hen, it was like something they had a Eurasian equivalent to that. But you also have to look at Carnival and how. They took Carnival from African people, right, in other areas, and then they celebrated it. And as they began to celebrate it, it became more debaucherous. And then they gave it back to us. And then we took the bastardized culture because they killed these elders that understood some of the rituals and processes and the reasons for the celebration, which has been lost to our memory. Yes, which is yes. why we have to go back to reclaim. OK, yes, yes, yes. so you, you have to understand that, yes, some of these things existed this way in our culture, but much of it yes. is just using our names and yes. not going back to use our technology, our processes and our meanings. Yes, and yes. until we go back and decide to redefine these things, <clears throat> excuse me, and lay new tracks over the lyrics and, and give new meaning to these different experiences people are having so that they are respectful, appropriate, and culturally relevant, then we are con going to continue to be lost. And until we define it, yeah. and then we begin to propagate and teach it to the masses, the least of our people will be who we are. You don't see Jewish culture going through the things that we go through. You know why? Because they hold each other accountable. I was um, riding through a Hasidic Jewish community Friday night and they were the men were walking around in groups at like 10 30 11 o'clock at night because they were doing their nightly patrols after synagogue right and we don't do things like that we don't go back and reclaim and redefine the things that are important to us we bitch and complain about them what are you gonna do what you gonna do <laughs> you, you know I wouldn't want to add to that because we do have a gut uh, in the Caribbean we do have a completely gutter culture but um uh, what I, and I, I appreciate every moment of that but yeah. what I would say is this I think that in you riding to the Jewish community one of the things that Jews have done effectively is they have but they have really rejected Americanism yep they don't buy into the idea of Americanism. They live in America. They participate in American markets. But as far as Americanism, as far as the culture goes, they reject. They have divested themselves from it. And I think that that's something that we have not necessarily done yet. Even in the West, you know, black black men and women in the West. I think that we need to divest from Western culture completely. And that's a difficult thing to to achieve. But I, I, some people have done it, like the Rastafarians, and and you have some some different, you know, groups in the Caribbean and and even in America, they have divested the, uh, the nation of Islam, you know, more or less. They have divested themselves from Americanism because they found that it is not workable for their their pe people, their group of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something we should take a second look at because it, this does not work for us, you know, in mass. It does not work for us. Excellent point. Uh, last words. This is your chance to get in your last words. Those of you at home listening, those of you in the chat, uh, if you have any last words you want to have said or have read, this is your chance. Uh, we'll start with Azuliism. What's your last words for tonight, my man? 
Well, my last word is take full accountability. I know me and Goku, there's there are something, there are something, there has to be something with us for them to keep selling us that shit. And we and we and we they are dancing to it. I saw a TED talk. Well, I'm gonna send it to you, Goku. Where this this man is talking about that they purposely sell that to us. That low vibration music. I'm trying to say why? Because you can't sell me something that I'm that I'm not willing to. You can't make me eat. You can't make me eat dog shit. No, I will not eat it. But some, if you, pe if you, some people, some people will eat the dog shit though. So why? Why? That's what I'm saying. I'm not, I, I'm not saying this. I'm just saying let's look within. Why are they able to sell us that garbage? From generation to generation to generation. That's what I'm saying. Kevin Kyrie. Um <clears throat> B1, black first. Uh Miss Untouchable. Um, quickly, quickly. Um, we are uh, we would eat the dog shit if someone have, has learned the art of masking the scent of that dog shit, um, masking the taste of that dog shit. Mm -hmm. presenting it in a way that he may not call it dog shit. He may call it another name, like le shit, le, le chien. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> Chitlins <laughs> you know I mean? are an example of this. Ex exactly. So you may not know that you're eating dog shit, but because it's being presented in a way that it doesn't appear to be dog shit when it actually is. But that need needless, needless, needless to say, I appreciate the conversation tonight. It's very thought-provoking. You know, and it always is. You know, you guys are very insightful in your in your thoughts. You know, and I appreciate the time that that you allow me to give my own ideas. And um, Erzuli for Haitian president, by the way. <laughs> oh, I forgot to ask you guys something. I know I'm, not totally to, I'm not trying to get shot. Yeah, this is totally off topic. But yo, you guys heard about what happened in Hawaii? Uh, no. There was a blizzard there, twelve inches. Okay. That's crazy, but yeah. Blizzard like a like a snow blizzard. Yeah, look it up. Yo, it's over. Yo, the men, they coming back for us. <laughs> um, uh, did I go to the matron yet? I got thrown off now. Did, I, I talked to Azuli. Missing. Okay, so matron, what say you? What's the what's the last word tonight? The last word tonight is that they need us to make anything real. Right. And we have to decide to stop getting tricked and to better advertise our positive images and make that real. All right. Thanks to everyone who was here tonight, who gave their comments, gave their time, etc., gave their energy. I appreciate everyone who's on the panel tonight. Mr. Untouchable was here. Kevin Carre, 42 was here. Erzuliism was here on Last but not least, the Revolutionary Matron from the Learning Curve podcast, also on KWAZ Radio, was here. In the chat, we had the Harsh Reality podcast. Oh, we had uh, the Pro Black Perspective on the panel uh, earlier tonight as well. We had Dr. Bobby E. Wright, KW Don Seven, Tito District, Joe Nell, Daily Affirmations by Pauline. Um, I think I got everyone there. We had all those folks here tonight making this another good, a great um episode of the shoot the breeze i'll be back on tuesday i don't know yet what i'm doing i'll be back on tuesday you know the schedule tuesday thursday saturday all 8 p.m eastern standard time so i'll see you guys on tuesday and then we will be back here again for shoot the breeze next saturday as the harsh reality podcast said in the chat great discussion appreciate the insights and I appreciate all you guys. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for listening to the Beta Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, betamedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ Radio production. 
Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, Instagram, Beta Medicine. <laughs>